Hello and welcome everyone to the 2023 IFAD Innovation Day. I'm really excited to welcome you all here today to uh, explore how we can make innovation work for the poor rural people. Today we have a stellar lineup of uh, speakers and sessions. So I would like to really welcome all of you to uh, follow us throughout the day. And for those of you that are here with us in person at IFAD, uh, don't forget to visit the Marketplace of Ideas where our innovators will be showcasing all the work that they have been doing um, in the, as part of the innovation challenges. So nine months of preparations for today so that they can showcase their, their ideas. Um, before we start, I would like to remind you that today's event is being streamed and recorded, and that by joining the event, you are agreeing for the event to be recorded and to be shared in our platforms. I would, like you to I would like to invite you also to visit our event page and to check the speaker profiles, the agenda, and the concept note. John is sharing with you right now in the chat the link to the event page. The chat box will also be open uh, during the event, so please feel free if you're joining us from home to let us know uh, where you're joining us from and uh, please share also the name of the organization that um, you're representing. During today's opening remarks, we have the great honor to welcome Dr. Alvaro Lario, president of IFAD. He has more than 20 years of experience working uh, for international financial institutions, specifically for the World Bank Group and um, in the United Nations system. As he also has experience uh, as associate vice president of our financial department, where he led the stewardship of IFAD becoming a credit rated uh, fund and uh, having access to capital markets. And what that means for IFAT is that we can mobilize resources much more effectively so that we can scale up innovation. So without much further ado, I would like to invite President Alvaro Lario to please join us. Well, good morning, everybody, distinguished guests, uh, friends, uh, partners. I'm very happy to have you here and also everybody who is online, which I'm sure will be following very much the, the entire day. Welcome to the IFAD Innovation Day. Today, we have an opportunity to discuss how to identify, test and scale up innovations to transform the lives of the rural people. We really need new ways of thinking so that we make agriculture and rural development more equitable, resilient, and inclusive. As all of you know, the world population will be hitting 10 billion by 2050. And if nothing changes, the gap between people and available food calories is expected to grow up to 56%. We also have the challenge of climate change, which is already affecting farming and especially small farmers all over the world. We also know that food prices have been rising and might, it might be expected to continue rising in the future. So the question is, how will the vulnerable rural people and small scale producers who are already struggling be able to keep providing for themselves and their families while they also produce food for other communities and other regions? If we don't change the course of action, it is estimated that climate change may drive nearly 2% of people into additional people into extreme poverty by 2030. We're talking about 100 million more of women and men. Many of them actually will be living in the 46 least developed countries and are already experiencing the negative impacts of climate change in their livelihoods. Rural people live on the front lines of drought, flood and other extreme weather events. And we also know that many of these small scale producers receive very little of the global climate finance. While there's no simple answer to these challenges, it is clear to me and to everyone here in IFA that innovation is part of the answer. Let me share some of our approach to innovation at IFA. IFA's mandate is transforming rural economies and food systems by making them more inclusive, productive, resilient, and sustainable. To that end, we invest in the millions of rural people and we embrace many kinds of innovations that deliver development impacts in a quicker, better and smarter way. First, we invest in idea testing. Game-changing technology doesn't come out of thin air. It's the result of taking risks, allowing ideas to germinate, and then cultivating them to meet the real needs in the field. 
That's why for us, Innovation Challenge is a safe space to test many of these ideas. The winning ideas of this year's challenge, for example, will be reaching an average of 61% women and around 2.6 thousand smallholder farmers. Let me share some of them. In Peru, we are testing a behavioral science toolkit to overcome barriers like gender bias. In Sudan, an app called Digi Climate Risk is helping us manage climate risk so that we can make better, more resilient investments in small farmers. Or in the Philippines, where the Land Monitor tool is generating land tenure data by women, with women and for women. Second, we also support corporate innovation. Innovation cannot be limited to delivering results in the field. IFAD also improves in in and invest in efficiency and effectiveness tools. For example, the GeoScan database. It provides accurate and timely geospatial data for evidence-based decision-making. Or the OmniData, that is a new platform that provides seamless access to data and analytics within IFAD and provides timely information for better decision-making. Apart from our own investments in innovation, IFAD also engages in co-funding opportunities. In fact, we believe it's essential to work with partners to develop knowledge and expertise. To that end, we collaborate with other institutions and agencies under the Moonshots for Development Alliance. And we also work with counterparts in the private sector, such as the European Institute for Innovation and Sustainability. Last but not least, we're building a culture of innovation inside IFAD. Our new innovation labs encourage staff to ask tough questions about our processes and our systems. And if they have ideas for improvement, we want to hear from them. That's why we are also rolling IFAD Innovation Talks and the IFAD Innovation Network. These are excellent opportunities to scale up good practices. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an exciting day planned. I wish you a very insightful, fruitful, and inspirational day. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Mr. President. So innovation is a combination of factors. And uh, what IFAD is successful at is combining these factors so that our decisions can be based on evidence and data. I, I would like to really highlight that because that's what one of the emphasis that uh, we put in the teams uh, throughout the innovation challenges that we focus also on making sure that the, pro the products, the ideas that we invest in are really delivering results and impact for, for rural people. So um, now I have the great honor to introduce a message from Her Excellency Anne Beat Christiansen Tivinareim Minister for International Development of the Kingdom of Norway. Her Excellency, the floor is yours. Dear all, one month ago, I visited Mozambique. I observed the tough challenges and hardships that people must deal with because of internal conflicts, extreme weather conditions, droughts and floods. When investing in the most vulnerable areas in developing countries, we must plan for and adapt to harsher weather conditions. We need more innovative solutions to assist the most vulnerable areas in tackling climate change. They need more information, better risk analysis, more digital technologies, weather and climate forecast services, financial assistance and knowledge. To us, IFAD is a key partner in that work. It was a great inspiration to visit IFAD's projects in Mozambique, observing your support to a number of initiatives that will make Mozambique better prepared and equipped for what is to come. Climate adaptation must be integrated in all investments. I have noticed that IFAD spends 18 times more on adaptation than on mitigation, and that is a significant contribution to achieve a better balance between adaptation and mitigation in global climate finance. However, it is a paradox that only about 1.7% of the money invested globally in climate finance is targeted to small-scale producers. We must work to increase that share. We must integrate development and climate in projects and programs on the ground. That is a major objective in Norway's development cooperation. 
IFAD has the competence to achieve that. You walk the extra mile to tailor your assistance to the conditions in every single rural community. IFAD is an important partner to Norway because you deliver results and because food security is a top priority in our development cooperation. Investments in food is now more important than ever. It is the most efficient way to create jobs and reduce poverty. Our strategy on food security has the title Combining Forces Against Hunger a policy to improve food self-sufficiency. The main goal is to promote climate-robust, small-scale food production and stimulate local value chains and markets. When donors like Norway, partners like IFAD and authorities in developing countries combine their forces, we make a real difference to people on the ground. There is no commercial farming without investment. I'm therefore very supportive of IFAD's increased focus on private sector. Estimates show that there are around 33 million smallholders in Africa. A large part of those are women. I therefore appreciate the emphasis on your gender transformative approach in IFAD 13. Norway increased our support to the ongoing IFAD 12 by 80%. We intend to give a significant contribution to IFA 13. A generous replenishment to IFA this year will support the realization of our common goal to establish sustainable food systems that leaves no one hungry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Her Excellency, and to the Kingdom of Norway. That was a truly inspirational uh, speech, but also in great support of IFAD's mandate and IFAD's resource mobilization campaign so that we can continue working for the poor rural people. So now um, in the agenda, we have Her Excellency Yesenia Olaya Requene, the Minister of Innovation of the Republic of, of Colombia. However, the minister um, is not uh, with us today because she's in a state visit with the president of Colombia in a remote region um, in the north of Colombia where uh, we are working, the, the government is working uh, with uh, the indigenous people and in, in pursuing innovation. So in representation of uh, the minister and very last minute and my, my uh, gratitude to the government of Colombia for uh, providing the, the message uh, for this session, we have his Excellency, Josef Ariza Araujo, Vice Minister of Talent and Social Appropriation of Knowledge of the Minister of Technology, Science and Innovation of Colombia. His Excellency, the floor is yours. Buenos días. Quisiera empezar por extender mi saludo cordial al presidente del Fondo Internacional de Desarrollo Agrícola, Álvaro Lario, a los integrantes de esta organización y a los distinguidos invitados que nos acompañan en esta nueva edición del Día de la Innovación. Como viceministro de Talento y Apropiación Social del Conocimiento, me es grato poder participar en este espacio, pues nuestro país ha hecho unos grandes esfuerzos por posicionarse en nuestra región como líder en materia de innovación. Este esfuerzo ha incluido la definición de cinco misiones estratégicas conocidas como políticas orientadas por misiones, que se enmarcan en el Plan Nacional de Desarrollo del gobierno de nuestro presidente Gustavo Petro Urrego y que buscan convertir a Colombia en una potencia mundial de la vida. Desde nuestro ministerio buscamos emprender acciones de la mano de la integración de los territorios del país en los procesos de construcción de una sociedad basada en el conocimiento que permitan impulsar soluciones desde la ciencia y la innovación a estas cinco misiones bioeconomía y territorio, hambre cero, transición energética, autonomía sanitaria y ciencia para la paz. Hoy quisiera resaltar nuestro compromiso para poder alcanzar la seguridad y soberanía alimentaria para todos los colombianos a partir de la misión que enfocará todos nuestros esfuerzos por promover y fortalecer el derecho a la alimentación, alineándonos así con el objetivo de desarrollo sostenible de hambre cero. Somos conscientes del reto que enfrenta la productividad del sector agropecuario, pues es baja, 15% por debajo del promedio latinoamericano. Esto debido a los bajos niveles de adopción tecnológica en las unidades productivas, las limitaciones en los procesos de agregación de valor, la dificultad al acceso y uso eficiente de los factores de producción y las falencias en conectividad en materia de infraestructura y de comunicación. 
De igual manera, con la reforma rural integral pactada en el Acuerdo Final de Paz, Colombia asumió el compromiso de producir más alimentos de manera eficiente e incluyente, con los pequeños productores y utilizando ciencia, tecnología e innovación en concordancia con criterios de sostenibilidad ambiental. Ante estos desafíos, desde el Ministerio estamos promoviendo la generación de modelos productivos agropecuarios a partir de procesos de investigación y desarrollo, que tengan en cuenta las necesidades de los territorios, sus poblaciones, sus necesidades logísticas y sus cadenas productivas priorizadas. Lo anterior será en línea con la implementación de la misión de investigación e innovación Hambre Cero, que buscará el impulso a procesos de industrialización y al aumento de la productividad agropecuaria de la mano del desarrollo, adaptación y adopción de nuevas tecnologías que tengan en cuenta los saberes locales con respecto a los sistemas alimentarios de los diversos territorios de Colombia. Actualmente estamos fortaleciendo los programas de actividades de transferencia tecnológica agroindustrial con ayuda del uso intensivo de datos a través del monitoreo y seguimiento de cosechas y de producción, lo cual fue resultado de la adopción de tecnologías y cumplimiento de estándares. Esto permitirá transitar hacia una economía agraria e industrial intensiva en conocimiento que facilite procesos de reconversión productiva local y de trazabilidad del desempeño de las pequeñas unidades productivas. También vemos la demanda de insumos de base biológica como una oportunidad económica de mercado y por ello una industria nacional de bioinsumos y de bioproductos es de vital importancia para lograr una mayor y mejor producción agropecuaria. En este sentido, se han impulsado varias iniciativas desde nuestro programa Colombia Vivo. En cuanto a la articulación con el sector privado para promover la misión de hambre cero, nos encontramos trabajando en el diseño de una convocatoria dirigida a micro, pequeñas y medianas empresas y organizaciones productivas rurales para apoyar proyectos de desarrollo tecnológico e innovación y así contribuir al desarrollo de tecnologías e innovaciones en las áreas de seguridad y soberanía alimentaria con un enfoque comunitario y sostenible así como el fortalecimiento de capacidades en materia de ciencia, tecnología e innovación en las regiones. Colombia ha hecho contribuciones sustanciales en materia de innovación y cooperación internacional en materia de seguridad y soberanía alimentaria. Ejemplo de esto es la representación que tenemos como país el día de hoy en el Día de la Innovación y el compromiso que hemos demostrado ante las diferentes acciones que se han realizado, producto de la agenda que tenemos con FIDA. Somos un miembro sólido de FIDA. Es por esto que quiero finalizar señalando que nuestro gobierno apoya el mandato de FIDA en focalizar los esfuerzos en trabajar e invertir para promover el bienestar de las personas que se encuentran en zonas rurales, en particular mujeres, jóvenes, comunidades indígenas y afrodescendientes. Y muestra de esto también son las acciones que hemos llevado a cabo como Ministerio de Ciencia, Tecnología e Innovación desde la misión de Hambre Cero. Muchas gracias. Colombia, potencia de la vida. Thank you so much to the government of Colombia. We have the representation of uh, Her Excellency, the Ambassador of Colombia here in the room with us. Thank you again for uh, the message from uh, the government of Colombia. Um, as, the vice, as the vice minister mentioned, it's really important not only use and adoption, but also to show results. And as uh, we heard from President Lario, in our innovation challenges, we demonstrate that with evidence, with numbers, and by uh, working with women by for, to collect data uh, with women by women and for women 61 percent engagement on women of women in our innovations that's uh i think that that's a significant result uh, of our innovation challenges so uh, i would like to move on now to our round table and i'm really privileged to, to be welcoming you um tita maya luoto director general of the Department for Development Policy at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of the Republic of, fin of Finland. Before I introduce the other speakers, could I ask you a question so that you share some uh, insights with you? Innovation and development are long-term priorities in Finnish development policy. Could you please share with us Finland's view on innovation and your government's strategy? Well, I wonder if this is working. It seems to be working. Well, it's first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today uh, and also with my fellow panelists. I'm very happy to see that there seems to be also a private sector present because if you don't have private sector present, well, then what are we doing in this room? When we talk about innovation, 
we need to be talking about digitalization in the context of Finland. Those two sort of go together um, in, in our development policy. So I would say that the first thing what we do is that we try to combine different models that would bring together the private sector and, and then the, uh, uh, see what the uh, government can be of assistance to them. And I would say that this is perfectly combined in the work of IFAD. Uh, you are doing exactly the kind of innovative work in, in terms of uh, taking into account the uh, uh, small farmers and agriculture businesses that then kind of like support their communities. Uh, what we are especially keen on when we are hearing, uh, as we have heard this morning, is the role of women and youth in your programs. This is certainly something that we are also emphasizing in our innovative work. Um, so whatever um, we sort of uh, try to achieve, we need to take into account that uh, those uh, that are often marginalized uh, will also benefit or from innovation. And this is easier said than done. And I would say that IFAD has found a perfect model uh, as how to do it. And we are very happy to support this work and continuing to support this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director General. Now I have the pleasure to uh... Welcome, a long-standing partner of uh, IFAD and particularly of innovation. Now, uh, Caroline Legrand, Deputy Director of the Division of Knowledge and Innovation at the World Food Programme. Thanks, Gladys. It's a pleasure to be here. Shall I give my remarks now? Okay, great. Thanks so much to IFAD for organizing this event. It is so, so timely, as the president stated already in his opening remarks. We are now experiencing the largest food crisis in modern history. The number of people facing acute malnutrition has soared since uh, to almost 350 million since 2019. That's more than double the number in 2019. As many as 828 million people worldwide are unsure of where the next meal is coming from. That's one in 10 people. So we are not on track to meet the sustainable development goal of a world with zero hunger by 2030. And that's why it's so, so important that we're coming together and talking about innovation because business as usual will not get us there. We really need to be bold, be ambitious, and move the needle in order to make progress on this goal. So this is a huge priority of WFP's new executive director, Cindy McCain. Partnerships and innovation is one of her top three priorities for the organization. Um, so we're really excited to be here and partner with IFAD um, in delivering results. I'm here with my colleagues today from the Innovation Accelerator, and WFP prioritizes innovation and technology as enablers of change. They're written into our strategic plan. Established in 2015, WFP's Innovation Accelerator sources, supports, and scales innovations. For example, how to optimize our supply chains so that we can deliver food faster, more cheaply, and more efficiently. Uh, growing food in impossible places with hydroponics. Um, Low-tech solutions, working with local startups for things like um, uh, processing crop waste uh, into fertilizer. Very simple, but very effective. And the high-tech solutions such as using blockchain to deliver cash transfers, um, that therefore decreasing transaction costs. But we can't do it alone. These are just a few examples. Um, and that's why we're very happy to be partnering with 
uh, EFAT since your establishment of EFAT's change delivery and innovation unit. We've been working hand in hand, sharing practical experiences, lessons learned, and good practices in a very collegial and transparent way. Um, you know, embracing failure, adopting a test, learn, and adapt approach to innovation, and sharing. And that's why we're also so proud to have been a founding member of the UN Innovation Network, which now comprises over 7,000, oh, sorry, over 3,000 um, members from across the whole, whole UN system. So it's great that you've brought everyone here together. It's an honor to, and pleasure to be here with this esteemed panel. Um, I wish you all the best of luck with the uh, innovation day ahead. And I think my message from WFP is there's so much work to be do. Let's be bold, let's be ambitious, work together. Thank you so much, uh, Caroline. I would like to invite all of you later today, we're going to have a special session with uh, the partnerships that we are announcing uh, today with uh, our um, UN Rome based agencies, but also with the private sector and with academia. Hila Cohen, the deputy head of the WF Innovation Accelerator, will be there with us. So now I'm going, I'm really honored to introduce a true trailblazer of innovation, Rikin Gandhi, Chief Executive Officer of Digital Green. You like to share with us the unique value proposition and the value added that uh, your idea, your innovations are bringing to rural um, smallholders. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here with my fellow pan panelists. Uh, let me take you f first to uh, the state of Bihar in Northeast India. Imagine you're an agricultural extension worker tasked with training farmers on a climate robust agricultural practice. There are thousands of these agents across the state rural livelihood mission called Jivika, who we work with in Bihar doing just that. Farmers there grow rice and wheat on remote small patches of land that they often lease. Most of the male population migrates to uh, domestic and construction jobs in other parts of the country, leaving women and their families in their villages. Unpredictable periods of dry weather alternating with unusually heavy rainfall has caused increasing crop losses and accompanying uh, lower incomes. While there are well-documented practices for growing rice in a climate-friendly way, there are two challenges. Number one, how to identify what practices are relevant for whom, given growing variability in soil, weather, and demographic conditions. And number two, how to do so in a way that farmers actually trust and apply on their farms for themselves. Trust between farmers who see an extension agent coming into their community from the outside and for agents themselves toiling along uh, for hours in the field where the government's own surveys have found that less than 2% of farmers are willing to engage with them serve as a, a daunting reminder of the challenge. To solve this, we partnered with Simit and Cornell University to landscape global models and create climate smart practices have found that they weren't relevant for the rice wheat system farmers of Bihar. Instead, researchers worked with us and the government system called Jivika to build a model to optimize yields and reduce emissions and water use from the bottom up. Then government, government extension agents produced videos featuring local farmers screened among women's self-help groups, capturing data and feedback to inform the production of new videos. Now we're building an AI voice-based assistant for government extension agents to increase their cost effectiveness and boost climate resilience in a gender inclusive uh, way for farmers across India, Ethiopia, and Kenya. What we're trying to build is essentially a ChatGPT for agricultural extension workers. At Digital Green, we work with public extension systems to produce and screen videos that are by farmers and for farmers, ensuring that it's their voices and feedback that improves the relevance of advisory content and informs policymakers and researchers. As the mantra of extension goes, seeing is believing. Often the farmers' first questions that they ask when they watch these videos is, what's the name of the farmer in the video? And which village is he or she from? Some farmers even compete to be featured in these videos to be seen as role models in their respective communities. Over the past 15 years, we've scaled this approach to more than 4.1 million farmers, 70% of whom are women, with 54,000 public extension workers. We've done so in partnership with ministries of agriculture in Ethiopia, India, Kenya, 
working with World Bank programs such as the Nat National Rural Livelihood Mission in India and the Agricultural Growth Program in Ethiopia. Our government counterparts have made this possible with more than $24 million worth of co-investment to institutionalize this approach by procuring the necessary hardware and software to engage their existing field force of extension agents. Randomized control trials have shown that this approach can reduce the cost per farmer to adopt and improve practice from 35 US dollars down to three and a half, and at the same time increase farmer incomes up to 24%. With the remarkable advances in large language models, we're developing a generative AI chatbot for, gen uh, for extension agents. Extension agents can ask questions in their local language as voice notes on WhatsApp and Telegram, which are so popular as connectivity expands. And unlike ChatGBT, whose trillion parameters were trained on internet sources like Wikipedia, this AI model is trained on our existing library of 7,000 videos in 40 languages, which have been automatically transcribed and translated. We're finding that the chatbot can reduce the cost of, to reach farmers down to 10 cents per farmer, an exponential decrease. And we're working with CGIR centers like SIAT in Ethiopia to show how this can increase farmer productivity by 38%. What makes this chatbot so effective is that it doesn't just operate in a one-way direction. It enables extension agents and farmers to also share feedback and adoption data back. That's when farmers' own ground truth insights paired with remote sensing can be valuable not just for public extension, but also for commercial markets, financiers, researchers, and policymakers. Of course, technology is no silver bullet, and that's why I'm so excited to be here at IFAD and with other UN Rome-based agencies to see how we can pair technology with the necessary investments in physical infrastructure, human capital, political institutions, and finance that so many of you are laying the foundations for. That's when technology then can enable uh, farmers to take their one small step toward improving their lives and those around them using videos or a chatbot and putting small scale producers back at the center of our food and agricultural system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rikin. Thank you for um, sharing with us that model. In fact, artificial intelligence is a great resource, but it has to be also used ethically. And it's great how you have emphasized the value of the storytelling, the value of giving farmers a voice and ensuring that they, they are themselves telling the story, which is very much aligned to IFAT's communications and advocacy strategy. So uh, with that, we are uh, closing the opening and welcome session. And I would like to invite everyone to uh, join us at the uh, following sessions of today's 2023 IFAD Innovation Day. We're going for a short break. If you're at IFAD, again, go and visit the Marketplace Ideas. If you're not at IFAD, do join us for the pitch event so that you can learn about our innovations and get to engage also with uh, our innovators. See you soon.
Hello and welcome everyone to our first panel at ESAD Innovation Day 2023 on financing innovation for rural and agricultural development. My name is Vaina Vitell and I'm Communication Officer for Partnership and Innovation here at ESAD. Before we get started, I would like to invite everyone to visit our event page to check the speaker profiles in today's agenda. John is sharing now in the chat box the links where we will upload everything, including the recording of this session. The chat box will also be open throughout the session, so please let us know where you're joining us from and add your questions to the chat as we're ongoing. Today, we're going to be talking about lessons and good practices on how to support and finance innovations that have potential to deliver results and impact for sustainable, equitable, and inclusive rural and agricultural development. Our speakers will also share experiences on running prize competitions to originate, test, and scale up new solutions, prioritize investments in solutions that demonstrate potential to deliver impact, as well as curate partnerships that can contribute to resource optimization and higher levels of support and financing. At our session today, we're going to be hearing from representatives of the Offices of Innovation and Digital Transformation of the Asian Development Bank, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and the World Food Program Innovation Accelerator. The session will be concluded by our esteemed director of the East and Southern Africa Division of EFAD. So joining us at the roundtable, I'm honored to introduce Hilla Cohen, Deputy Head of the EFAD Innovation Accelerator. So Hilla, based on your demand-driven approach, taking into account local problems and subsequent matchmaking between startups and local WFP teams to de develop solutions that address challenges that WFP currently experiences. Could you share with us the strategic vision of the Innovation Accelerator? And how do you intend to scale up innovations in the coming years? If you can give us a couple examples of partnerships that helped you along the way, that'd be great. Sure, and hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is Hila Cohen, and I'm from the World Food Program Innovation Accelerator. We are part of the World Food Program, yet our team is actually based in uh, Munich, Germany, and we are the global function for innovation uh, for the World Food Program. Uh, we have been, uh, we were set up in 2015, um, a small team of five, and um, the goal was to source support and scale innovation um, to address global hunger. And some of the statistics were uh, just shared in the panel um, before. And our goal really was to set up an innovation function that fits the DNA and culture of WFP. So um, what we do is support our field offices uh, by finding startups that are relevant for them that solve problems on the ground. And we support innovators from within WFP because in some locations, let's say South Sudan, there's not so many startups out there solving problems there, but our colleagues are on the ground and they see the realities. So why not give them the same tools like human-centered design and the lean startup approach uh, mindset for them to solve um, innovations there. Um, our strategy will, is ongoing and um, our, our focus really is on scalability, but also understanding the global, the global and local realities on the ground because um, really we really believe in human-centered design. I think it's something that we always repeat. Um, it's an ongoing mantra in our team because we can assume certain things on a need of another person. But the, the person themselves, the female small the farmer will tell her what she needs. She will inform you of her access to finance and she will let you know, does she have equitable access to technology like a male farmer? So those are things that are um, very important to us. Um, and uh, in terms of also our strategy right now, as was shared, we do have a new executive director, a great champion of innovation. And for her, a priority is innovation and partnership. So we are going now to uh, further um, uh, work on our strategy to make it up to date because we've been working uh, for the last eight years. And today, just to give you numbers, um, today to our innovation accelerator, we've had more than 10,000 applications from around the world. Um, we have uh, reviewed them. We have run 25 innovation programs for the uh, World Food Program, which means boot camps and uh, pitch events. And we have funded more than 100 innovations with internal and external ticket sizes of $100,000 at minimum, because we believe that we need to give substantial uh, funding for innovations. And we have 16 
um, innovations in our scale up portfolio. We in 2018 set up a scale up enablement function as part of our strategy because we realize that in the realities where we operate, scaling needs specific support. So that was part of our ongoing journey. Now we also have a function focusing on innovative finance and great conversations with IFAD um, on this topic. Um, and we are looking into um, frontier innovations. How does AI and blockchain translate into our work? And another thing, again, gradual, and I think that's also always my message because we are, uh, let's say, one of the veterans. We did things gradually. Rome was not built in a day and not in our function as well. So now we also have a robust innovation community and we have hubs, innovation hubs, an extension of our work um, in locations such as Kenya, Colombia, um, uh, um, Jordan, and soon in Egypt as well. And in terms of partnerships, um, we are real believers in partnerships. WFP will not address hunger on its own. So we need the private sector. And to me, the private sector is the startups because they are an active part of the private sector. And that's why we have um, adapted our processes to work with them. The private sector is, uh, um, is also the big corporates. We've worked with companies like Google, uh, like John Deere, like Cargill. Um, and partnerships is also the Rome-based agencies and other um, like FAO and EFAD um, because we need to be complementary and we need to bring the best of the expertise of each of the teams because our goal is to serve um, the people that are suffering these days. And it's an important cause and we should really put the best minds there, whether they come from our organizations or where they come from externally, because as my uh, deputy director said, we have to be bold and the time is now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Hilla. Um, I love the comment that Rome wasn't built in a day and also the importance of Rome-based agency collaboration. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Mark LePage, the Technology Innovation Specialist with the Asian Development Bank. He advises and supports ADB with its 2030 digital agenda by designing and implementing their digital sandboxes program, an initiative aimed at using, and let me get this right, digital technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, and robotics to future-proof ADB and support its transformation into an agile organization. Mark, the ADB plays an important role on digital transformation through its open platform in the region. Can you share with us a little bit the experience of ADB's work on innovative procurement and that impact and what synergies you could leverage specifically through partnerships? Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, Mark with the Asian Development Bank, uh, really want to thank uh, IFAD for inviting us here to this uh, great innovation day um, to share the work we've been doing together with IFAD and other agencies and, and learn from each other's. Um, so maybe let me backtrack a little bit. Um, ADB's um, sandbox program was formed about four or five years ago. And the original ambition was really to experiment with those emerging digital technologies. So pick your favorite AI, blockchain, mixed reality, etc., for the institution. And very quickly, when we were presenting the work that we were doing for our institutional department, think of AI for budget, AI for uh, HR, et cetera, et cetera, our colleagues working in the uh, 60 plus uh, Asian uh, member countries at, the, at ADB, at the Asian Development Bank, reached out to us and said, look what you're doing for ADB as an institution. Could you also support member countries that are interested to experiment with those technology? So from an internal uh, mandate, we sort of pivoted to something that is uh, much more external, which also speaks to our overall digital transformation at ADB uh, that started some years ago that initially was very internal, but also more broadly pivoted to something that is more uh, external now. And I think many organizations are experimenting and, and COVID, of course, accelerated this, but the sort of inside, outside digital transformation. Uh, one of the key elements towards this is, and, and colleagues talked about it briefly earlier, is uh, the ability to uh, sort of acquire innovation from outside. So whether you call them uh, competition, uh, challenges, or other terms, the idea is basically to crowdsource uh, innovative solutions, because I think many of us would agree uh, our organization do not necessarily have within their uh, own shop the, the required um, competencies, uh, skill set, et cetera, 
to push innovation and even more so digital innovation. There's the crowdsourcing uh, approach. Um, we've set up an open innovation platform uh, as early as, as 2018. Uh, and of course, during the COVID period, it was heavily used not only uh, by the digital teams within ADB, but also for colleagues working uh, around resettlement uh, because we couldn't travel anymore, uh, about uh, design of roads and different infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, from that, um, 50 different individual challenges during the, the COVID period were launched, which resulted in really interesting uh, pilots that were implemented uh, since then. Um, this is only working where you've got the necessary sort of back office, and this is where innovation in procurement comes in. Um, pretty quickly, like other agencies, we realized that our sort of default uh, procurement modalities were not suitable when it came to engaging with startups, which is what we, together with other agencies, are, are doing very often. Um, so we've worked with our procurement department to design something that is more flexible. So today we have an innovation uh, framework procurement that allows ADB to uh, quickly uh, procure uh, services from startup uh, in a way that allows to quickly test whether their solution is suitable. And if it is, then we go into broader procurement. The, the sort of principle of procurements are not changed. It's the very concrete modalities that are changed. So typically, ADB engage in very large procurement for our uh, metro, um, train, you know, hydro, et cetera, uh, project. And so there's a lot of due diligence. Um, you know, companies are asked for 10 years of certified account, which, of course, if you're a startup, you don't have. Um, but the amounts that are at stake are much less. So we basically looked at a sort of lower risk guardrails that allow faster procurement. Um, the last piece that is sort of linked to this is, of course, like Hila mentioned, and I'm sure others will also, is around partnerships. So we do a lot of co-design. We have different types of partnerships. Some are very formal, the MOU types of, with the large um, Microsoft, uh, Oracle, uh, of this world, but also a lot of smaller, more nimble partnerships that I'll, I'll allow us to, to co-design. Um, so I think all in all, this has been a, an approach that has worked at ADB and that is now being sort of mainstream with a broader innovation trajectory that including uh, innovation in financing and, and other aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I really appreciated the comment about the balance between due diligence and innovation. I think that's one that uh, we forget about. It's important that ADB mentioned it, so thank you. I'd next like to introduce Courtney Price, who is the lead behavioral scientist in the Office of Innovation at the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. And Courtney, um, can you tell us how is the Office of Innovation uh, approaching uh, Sorry, my apologies. How is OIN approaching innovation and what methodologies are you implementing to enhance the impact? And again, I keep bringing this up, but how are partnerships helping you achieve this goal? Thanks, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. And uh, thanks to EFED for this invitation. I think I'll be echoing a lot of the sentiment that uh, esteemed colleagues have, have mentioned, but I, I would say that taking first, the second part of that question first, I would say, this is a physical example of the importance of partnership. Uh, we're all gathered here today because we have a common goal and innovation from FAO's perspective, and I believe uh, many of us would agree, happens when we all, when you gather very different diverse uh, stakeholders with different uh, skills together in the same room with a common challenge. And this is when really great ideas are, are, are uh, spark and, and opportunities to test them uh, the surface. So, um, so in all humility, I mean, it's important to mention that F innovation is not new to FAO. It's an enormous organization with full of innovators that also is tapping into innovation that's happening at all levels, upstream and downstream, uh, in far, far as the agri-food systems transformation is concerned. But with all humility, it's important also also mention that coalescing and consolidating this innovation expertise is relatively new to the organization. So we are benefiting from so many partners have, who have ventured out before the veterans, including the BFP's Innovation Accelerator, the experienced digital tech, 
uh, testing and, and, and innovations happening in ADB uh, and across the board with EFAD's innovative financing and, and, and application of behavioral science and many other approaches. So we're while late to the party, we're glad the lights are still on and the music's still playing. Um, the way these, this partnership, you know, these partnerships are influencing how we're looking at innovation at many levels. Uh, the first uh, the kind of one of the most obvious I'm mentioning in terms of Rome based agencies and the UN innovation system, innovation network, how we're really coalescing and getting new good ideas from all those partners. Also, I think, as Mark mentioned, and others, you know, and, and Gila as well, creating partnerships at the implementation level with service providers, seeking out that dynamic and interesting uh, expertise, whether it be cutting edge AI tech, uh, or behavioral science uh, and, and other activ activities that enable FAO to really catalyze innovation uh, at, the, at the grassroots level. And, fi and finally, you know, partnerships are also really working with stakeholders themselves and realizing innovation is happening with or without all of us. And actually much of our job is really shining a light on where innovation happens, helping highlight where innovation already exists or helping provide financing support methodologies at ground level. So. One ex concrete example of this is where we're really focusing also on co-design, grassroots co-design and participatory application of behavioral science and design thinking with communities uh, in rural, uh, rural uh, and smallholder farmer communities using FAO's flagship approach of the farmer field school, but injecting it also with a design thinking or behavioral science opportunities to test and, and, uh, and, and innovate and co-design and test behavioral change innovations at ground level. So. I guess summing up partnerships has really been the key word that has informed how we are learning about and, and scaling up our approach to innovation, which really focuses on anticipating and planning through horizon scanning, foresight, futures thinking, um, catalyzing innovation on the ground at the ground level uh, through partnership, through network, through, through grassroots movement uh, and research uh, connections. Um, uh, the uh, the um, leveraging collective intelligence and knowledge sharing as a, cre a critical factor for bringing these diverse points of view together. And finally, underlying foundation is about empowering innovation. And this is where behavioral science, design thinking approaches and tools, leveraging them to unlock the power of innovation mindsets, fail fast thinking. How do we bring that into both the amazing incubator projects that we have going on in our first pilot this year that are really about unlocking the potential of learning by doing and failing and, and iterating as well as externally in these co-design uh, grassroots movements that we're trying to create, uh, including around food waste, around uh, antimicrobial resistance and many other approaches. So it's really partnership is the key word and these connections are enabling us to uh, stand on the shoulders of giants in terms of our, our partners and, uh, and uh, contribute to this, uh, to this innovation movement together. Great, thank you, Courtney. And I, first of all, you're not too late to the party. And second, I think sometimes the innovation is in the way we think about innovation. And you mentioned different points in the process where we can bring that mindset in and the importance of implementing partners, which I thought was a great one. So finally, last but certainly not least, I'm thrilled to introduce my colleague, Gladys Morales, Senior Innovation Officer for the Change Delivery and Innovation Unit here at EFAD, where she leads our efforts to support origination, testing, and scaling up of ideas with potential to deliver transformative um, uh, results and impact for the poorest rural people in the world. So Gladys, based on your experience of pioneering innovation here at EFAD, could you please share with us, how is EFAD using price competitions to scale up innovation, and especially for those early stage innovations? interventions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dana. And I'm really grateful to everybody for joining this panel. We have been collaborating since the inception of the Change Delivery and Innovation Unit in uh, 2019. The group that you see here today is a group that ha has helped IFAD a lot also in uh, designing our value added and making sure that we were that we build actually complementarities instead of competing with each other and that we are really, really working together. I think the commitment that we have, um, especially with the people in uh, in this particular panel is uh, is incredible. Is uh, you guys are really really generous. We collaborate with a lot of transparency and um, yeah generosity and, and sharing knowledge experiences and also this uh, mindset that uh, failure is one of the best ways 
to uh, support learning so that we can really develop innovations that can be transformational. So let me share with you what is IFAD's unique value proposition and the value added that we bring to the table. And that, you know, thanks to this collaboration and, and cross-pollination, as we call it, has been, uh, we have been able to, to build. So since the, the inception in, in 2020, we launched our first innovation challenge, also um, uh, co-designed with uh, external advisors uh, in behavioral science and lean innovation with the Silicon Valley approach of test, uh, learn, and adapt. And with that, um, with that, some of our uh, external advisors are here in the room with us and they will be sharing with you how is it we do that through our innovation challenges, but not only, um, also in other initiatives that IFAD has. But what we developed was a very, very unique operating model. So in addition, very importantly, IFAD is an international financial institution. So for us, providing financing at key stages of the innovation journey of the teams is fundamental. So and in addition to that financing for product development, we also pair the teams with uh, our own IFAD staff so that they receive mentoring and we ensure that the innovations that we are uh, working on are matched to our country strategies. And that's fundamental because if you, from the beginning, you're designing for scalability, then uh, your chances of actually being successful are much higher. So mentoring is quite important. So that's the matching that we do with the IFAD teams. Then coaching in these methodologies that have proven to, de to deliver better results and impact for poor rural people. And that coaching is done in behavioral science, uh, where we collaborate a lot also with uh, FAO, but also with external advisors as idea for Ideas42 and uh, the Busara Center. Um, so uh, financing, behavioral science, then the lean innovation approach where we collaborate with external advisors as a uh, venture well. And then um, we also offer backfilling support because one of the things that we have been sharing also uh, within the UN system and um, for those of you much more familiar with the research and innovation is that much more important than time and financing is headspace if our innovators don't have headspace they cannot develop their ideas they get lost in translation they get lost in the day-to-day -day work and they just don't have the, the the headspace to be able to develop their ideas so for us that's that's super important and for that reason our unique operating model includes uh, financing for backfilling so that the teams can hire the resources to do the day-to-day -day operations that take away that headspace from them. So that's the unique operating model the, that uh, we have developed as part of the learning because from 2020 we have been learning uh, how is that we can we can improve our operating model to deliver more resources. As a result of this, we have been able to uh, we you know, also based on the on the advice provided by the WFP Innovation Accelerator, we started small and we work with a very small group of ideas, even no matter the amount of applications. Um, we started uh, at the beginning, we started with uh, with 10 teams in the first innovation challenge. Two of them were two of the ideas that were in that innovation challenge were effectively scaled up, one of them with FAO. Uh, in the second innovation challenge, we uh, move to six teams only because we really wanted to make sure that we were providing the teams with enough support for them to develop impactful ideas and of these three uh, of these ideas are now being scaled up some of them are at the marketplace upstairs and you will be uh, for those of you that are here in uh, IFAD you will be able to see them and for those of you joining us online you will be able to hear from them during the Pitch event. So for us, it's really important also in this uh, in this journey of innovation, as I said before, and as you heard from President Lario, that throughout the journey, our innovation challenges run for about nine months. Through that journey, uh, we place a particular emphasis on data collection, uh, evidence, and proven efficacy and effectiveness. Effectiveness because then we collaborate with our uh, program manage management department and with the strategy uh, and knowledge department to ensure that we build the architecture so that we can take those ideas that we incubated from incubation to um, scaling up. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. And I just wanted to say, I think um, the point about uh, tying to country program design is such an important one, really from the onset. So now um, I'd, well, I'd like to thank everybody on stage first, Hilla, Mark, Gladys, and Courtney for your interventions. We're now gonna move to questions. So if you are in our in-person audience and have a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring the mic to you. Any questions so far?
that one. Yes, hi everyone. Um, I'm Patrice Leger from the Fund in Innovation for Development. Um, there was one mention of like the procurement process of how, which I think is key and in many in many time an issue for a barrier to scale up the the programs but i was wondering more generally how do you do this link from prototyping testing financing this at the early stage and then entering them in the mainstream programming of your big organizations which i think may be a, a big uh, maybe a big difficulty if there's any example so far i would be glad to hear from them great Thanks for the question. I'm uh, happy to start and give some perspective from ADB. Um, so typically for very early stage, um, we co-invest with the third party, meaning there's no money on the table that's exchanged. So we put time and effort from the ADB side and we ask the startup or the organization to, um, to do the same. Uh, to develop what we refer, and this is innovation lingo, but a proof of concept, which is basically trying to prove that from a business and technology perspective on digital innovation, it works. And this is a very short sprint, typically six to eight weeks. If this is successful, then we put money on the table. Um, and then that's where we use our procurement uh, innovation framework. Um, I joined ADB from uh, UNDP. And UNDP had similarly developed uh, an approach uh, that used innovation in procurement that's actually available publicly if you Google it. Um, and that was a similar uh, approach. One of the key difference, and we've spent a lot of time with our legal team, is about IP. Uh, I think we've all faced the same. Um, innovators are keen to engage with development organization, but they want to make sure that they retain as much as possible the IP of what is co-created. So I'm not going to go into the detail, you know, legal language, but basically the philosophy, the thinking is that it's co-owned. Um, we are able to use it again, the IP that's created with them in other contexts. So it can be a different geographic or sectoral context, and, but they still own the IP of whatever is co-created. So basically it's an incentive for them uh, to continue uh, and to engage with you know, the organization that sort of started that trajectory, uh, but also they can do a business out of that or, or grow their business. Thank you, Mark. Others on stage wanna, wanna take a shot? Hila? Um, so I think um, what I wanted to share is our experience as well. So when WP started its innovation function, we relied heavily on our procurement uh, function. Um, and I think it's just, before I say that, um, I think it's important to know, many times we think innovation is only about ideation. I think when you're in a um, corporate venture arm like us for WFP, you need to know the rules and the processes very well in order to innovate. So actually most of our team members know rules in WFP much better than the wider organization because if you want to have the system work for you, you need to know the rules. Um, so in our case, in the beginning, we, did, we were based on um, the classic uh, UN uh, procurement process, but then we actually uh, created a directive and we now have a grant process within WFP. Um, it's high, heavily inspired by procurement, the best practices, the checks and balances. Mark and I were just talking about it <laughs> before this session today. Um, because again, yes, you work with early stage companies, so they won't have 10 years of history, but you do need to understand, you know, uh, who's behind the bank account and, you know, things like that. So you do as, you know, because you're using donor money, and it's investable money, you need to ensure that it's used well. So we do have a, a grant process that's inspired by the procurement process um, that enables us to fund startups. And that enables us the first tickets, the first 100,000, second 100,000. When you go into scaling, that's a different question because you need to find what is best for your organization. So we've had cases where we've launched long-term agreements with a few of the startups. It's a competitive process, and it means that the company that you may have worked with in the early stage, you may find new actors that will need to compete with them in the process. But for us, exiting, let's say, or scaling an innovation is not only through procurement. I think it's also adoption through our functions. So we, like, for example, recently did a climate challenge. So it's not that we at the accelerator only thought about it on our own. We actually talked with our climate colleagues and field colleagues to understand what are the climate challenges that you want to address. 
And because they're part of the initial process when we launch the challenge, we hope that they will be the scaling function in the future and that our innovation is part of a corporate function and program in WFP. And another fun fact I'll mention, not linked to procurement, but it's important. We actually now in the WFP program guide have a, a section on innovation. So all of these things to make scaling, it's not only procurement, I think it's procurement, it's the rules, but it's also the mindset. Great, thank you, Hila. And Courtney? I think I would just add a small piece since we're, as I said, uh, our first version of an incubator is happening right now. We're very internal looking on this in this part enabling our teams. I'll just touch on the innovation mindset piece, perhaps, where our counterparts have, have, have talked more about the startups and external, uh, you know, partnership uh, enabling innovation. This key function of really understanding what is an enabling environment for thinking out of the box and you leveraging a lot of what we learned around behavioral science applications. We see that whether it's procurement, HR, uh, how we hold meetings, the processes by which we do things, even internally, are can often be critically uh, embedded with behavioral barriers to innovation. So I think it's also really important that we, you know, uh, one of the things I think FAO is doing uh, in, in concert with the UN Innovation Network and others is really trying to investigate where are there frictions that, that would lead to risk aversion, would lead to behavioral barriers, why you wouldn't innovate, why it makes a whole lot of sense in your organizational context not to innovate. So this co-creation idea is not only about you know, I, I'm sure my colleagues agree, you know, enabling that innovation to be sparked, to happen with startups or being sparked outside, but also being a, an equal partner in terms of how do we enable innovation internally so our processes and procedures can be le less burdensome, have less cognitive load, like, uh, like Gladys so accurately, uh, adequately sa uh, accurately said, headspace or having, you know, less cognitive load. So you can enable that innovation to happen naturally and you can, can create an enabling environment for it. I mean, a simple case in point, but a very powerful one is uh, we were very lucky to uh, secure a behavioral science fellowship through the UN Innovation Network last year, whose uh, intervention increased attendance at a critical meeting about uh, workplace illness by 10 times. So the average it was around 200 people. We using behavioral science and, and design thinking, we, we this this behavioral science approach increased that reduced friction. So 2000 people attended. So extrapolating that out into the processes and procedures we have, we also need to be able to really think about where are frictions happening also in our own house and how can we unlock them so innovation mindsets are more easily uh, enabled. And of course, you know, in all humility, once again, this is very much a, a basis of how we're approaching it philosophically. Great points. Thanks, Courtney. Last word to Gladys. Um, yeah, procurement is a challenge. So I really appreciate the question from, from uh, our colleagues from uh, FID. So, uh, and I think that that's something that all the agencies recognize. Some agencies like the WFP Innovation Accelerator, obviously the Asian Development Bank with the Open Innovation Platform have much more experience with uh, procurement than the nascent uh, innovation units that we have in the uh, some of the uh, nation uh, innovation units in the in the United Nations, um, and that's why I think learning from each other is is key and it's so important. And alliances like the Moonshots for Development Alliance, where we also learn from agencies like the Inter American Development Bank and the World Bank on how is that they do procurement. And one thing that we have learned is that. Uh, if we define um, it, procurement from the corporate side or the programmatic or project side, you still need a different stream for innovation because the challenges that you have under, under innovation are different challenges than the challenges that you have under corporate procurement or under programmatic procurement. So I think that that, that collaboration is, is also key. And when you are learning, while you're learning, building those systems takes a lot of time, as Hila was sharing before. Uh, acquiring that kind of knowledge that Hila was describing, that legal uh, knowledge, and not only that, but you know, it's, it's not only about the rules, but it's about making also the rules a fit for purpose so that we are addressing uh, innovation and, and we are actually agile and can work with the private sector that is much more agile than we, than we are. So in that process of learning, also leveraging on each other's strengths so uh, while we learn, we learn and we build our own procurement processes for innovation, we are collaborating a lot with the Asian Development Bank and, uh, and uh, their uh, open innovation uh, platform. We're going to launch a, a joint innovation challenge this year so that we can leverage exactly on those strengths. Uh, again, 
working together. Um, just a last thing, sharing intellectual property rights, I think is a challenge for everyone. And it's something that we need to address because if we're working with uh, the private sector and with these startups, it's something that we, uh, all of us, we, we need to think of very, very carefully and ensuring that what we develop are actually digital public goods. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. And I'm actually going to give the final final word to Mark, who wants to jump in. A, a little bit uh, on the other side of the scaling. We also work hand in hand with ADB Ventures, which is the ADB Impact Investment uh, Team. So they invest in startups. So we have a, a two way flow of, of information uh, from our side. It's a deal flow for them. And on their side, it's referrals. And it has happened that we've worked with startup, we've built a POC on basically the, the goodwill of the startup. We then put some money on the table and then a few months later, ADB invested a couple of millions in them. So that's also the other side of the spectrum. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. And thanks for the thoughtful question. Other questions? I, we've got one over here. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Nazanin Barikzai, and I'm from Afghanistan. And thank you for giving me opportunity to talk. So my question is regarding invasion pr uh, program in Afghanistan. So is there an uh, invasion program for Afghanistan, especially for youth that you mentioned about youth in, in, your, in your discussion? Thank you. Our program the, is global, so anyone can apply from anywhere around the world. Um, and you can just go on innovation.wfp.org and also follow us on LinkedIn because that's where we share um, all our ongoing challenges. And uh, we just usually ask, we usually don't work with individuals. Um, we work with NGOs, startups, or internal WP colleagues. So if it has to be, it could be an Afghani um, NGO that can apply. It could be an Afghani startup or a small company that can apply. And then they would go through a global competitive assessment uh, process, including checking with our Afghan, uh, our country office in Afghanistan to see if whatever that startup is addressing um, uh, is relevant for the country office or if it's solving an Afghani startup could solve for us a problem in a different location globally. So it's not only focused on that specific country, we're also looking can that startup solve a problem somewhere else and that's always our approach. We prefer to work with startups that can start locally but have global potential. I hope that's useful. Afghanistan is an, a member of the ADB. I'm personally very interested. I lived in Afghanistan for two years. Uh, it has a special place uh, for me and my team. Um, we've organized a couple of very Afghanistan specific uh, innovation related challenges. I'm happy to discuss them uh, bilaterally that are directly linked to what's going on in Afghanistan. Um, but yes, for sure, this is something that can be uh, organized and arranged. Thanks. Great. Thank you all for the great questions from the floor. Um, I'd now like to invite Sarah Mbago, our Regional Director of the East and Southern Africa Division of EFAD, to conclude this session and tell us a little bit, tie together partnerships uh, innovation and how we learn, optimize uh, resources, and really scale these up, particularly with the context of thinking about the field. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, so, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to all. I, I think, well, I have first of all the honor, and I want to thank colleagues for giving me the opportunity to try and summarize uh, and, and sort of tie in what we heard today from this very innovative very interesting um, uh, discussion on innovation. Uh, that's no easy task, I must say. But we heard very interesting things. Um, certain things struck me. Uh, the fact that changing behavior, creating an ecosystem, a culture for learning, uh, partnerships, the complexities of those, and trying to bring those together. Uh, the idea that you need to crowd in different types of financing across the different stages of innovation. The fact that uh, we have different comparative advantages, uh, different strengths as institutions. I heard startup, I heard digital, I heard infrastructure and systems. All these things struck me. And, uh, and, and, and I think that just you know really sets the floor of how complex this is. 
But remember, and I must uh, remind all of us, even as we delve to see how can we build successful partnerships for innovation, we're trying to do it for food, rural, and agriculture transformation as a whole. And I think that's the key challenge that faces us uh, now, uh, but going forward. So if, if I may, I would just like to um, use maybe an example that uh, I have from East and Southern Africa, really from a field perspective, where uh, we have been working very well uh, together. And to just uh, speak to your point, is there any concrete example? Uh, so in the context of Kenya, we have actually been piloting an e-voucher. Uh, and the e-voucher scheme is uh, a tool and an instrument uh, that we thought to introduce to allow small-scale farmers in Kenya to access much-needed agricultural inputs and to promote sustainable agricultural development. Now, this program started, uh, I think, eight or nine years ago, but has been extremely successful in bringing together partnerships as looking into the different factors presented here today. Uh, the the e-voucher has basically started with EU financing and IFAD financing, led, of course, by the Kenyan government uh, and the agriculture extension system. The idea was to try and make more efficient and more effective and bring to scale. Scalability is what we heard as well uh, from Gladys and I think uh, uh, Courtney and others, uh, access to, uh, to inputs. Uh, so at the very onset, there was a, a narrow set of partners, but as we continued with the program, more entered in, and the idea was that agro-dealers, the private sector, would really drive this. And uh, the banks got on board, the Cooperative Kenya Bank, the Equity Development Bank, to redeem the vouchers. Uh, the the e-voucher the e was working on a reducing subsidy scale. So the small-scale farmers are also contributing progressively and increasingly purchasing the agricultural inputs. Fast forward uh, two or three uh, years into it, we then managed to start working with INSURED, it's an acronym for uh, IFAD's insurance scheme, uh, which is a, a crop-based index, uh, area-based index scheme. And very recently, I'm very proud to announce that this e-voucher has also managed uh, in collaboration with Pula now to actually successfully insure crops. Uh, it's reached 100,000 small-scale farmers uh, in Kenya, uh, of which 60% are women, and uh, for which uh, we actually see that with the recent drought, there has been two or three pay, uh, uh, payouts uh, from an insurer's perspective. Now, this didn't happen overnight, but it really took consolidated efforts. FAO was very, very involved and got involved a little bit later to actually look at the range of inputs, to advise on you know, soil fertility quality mapping with the inputs that are meant to be there. Uh, we uh, now have a situation where we have the collective number of actors in the con Kenya context, also the World Bank and the Kenyan government, wanting to scale this e-voucher program and e-voucher scheme to the entire country across all counties. So just to translate what is being said here, so it has been a progressive learning experience. We were very excited to have market players like Pool on board, like the financial banks on board. And I think that just speaks to it. So complexity of partnerships should not take away from this. Creating, uh, creating an, an ecosystem and a culture for learning is very key. Uh, partnering with the private sector is a basis and a fundamental to where we want to go. And then the type of financing is really, really critical. Public, yes, and then increasingly inviting private sectors uh, to take this on board. I just want to thank uh, all the distinguished panelists here who've come today and, uh, and shared their insights on procurement, why is that important, types of partnership, incubations, challenge funds, all types of mechanisms that can stimulate this and actually allow the ideation process to take place on the ground. Uh, from an IFA perspective, I think it's, it's sound to say that digital for us is very key. We are really working with digital providers across uh, uh, the angle and in this small example from kenya which is yielding great results is just one of many examples of how we uh, touch on uh, on on the digital um on the digital uh, uh framework so i would just like to end uh, this this uh, exciting session is definitely not the end of the day but just it gives a bit of a flavor uh, of what lies ahead for us uh, for the rest of the innovation day uh, here at ifad and uh, thank you very much and uh, look to see you 
uh, further and discuss further about innovation. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the thoughtful example from Kenya that kind of tied the whole panel together. I thought that was perfect. And um, I want to thank uh, everyone and uh, to invite our online participants, stick with us. We've got more sessions coming up. And if you're with us here in person, we invite you to visit us on the ground floor uh, where we have our innovation marketplace. You can come up and speak to some of the teams and collaborators in person uh, and ask them about their great and groundbreaking work. Yes, pun was intended. And um, uh, I'd also just like to thank again our speakers and teams from EFAB, the Asian Development Bank, the Food and Agricultural Organization, and the WFP and Innovative Innovation Accelerator. Um, you're all terrific. And thank you all for being with us today. Goodbye.
welcome to this second panel of um, this morning. I'm Claire Bernard. I'm Deputy Director at Fund for Innovation in Development. And I'm really extremely happy to be here today in this Innovation Day. It's really exciting to see all these people from different ecosystems, research, innovation, um, United Nations Agency, um, gathered here to discuss innovation and um, impact investment. In this panel, uh, we want to give you an overview on what is Fund for Innovation in Development um, to show you it's really promising and uh, hopefully to make you willing to contribute as an innovation, as an innovator, a researcher, or um, an institutional organization. There is really much more to do uh, to fund innovation to fight against poverty and inequality. And to introduce this session, I'm really happy to welcome Raoul Mill, who is science advisor of the French Permanent Mission in Rome. Hello, everyone. Yes, it works. Yes. Thank you very much to invite us to open this session on the specific case of the French Fund for Innovation Development. The session is part of the whole IFAD Innovation Day, so congratulations for organizing it successfully. France and IFAD. So first, let me underline the full support of France to IFAD's activities and also the strong interest for collaboration between IFAD and the French research organizations CIRAD, INRAE, and IRD on a broad range of thematics and methods. Last week in Paris, during the new Global Financing Pact Summit, the French President Emmanuel Macron announced that France is championing IFAD's resources mobilizations, urging global leaders to step up the, to their efforts to support IFAD's capacities for actions, reinforcing the resilience of family farmers, and investing for food security and health and nutrition. France will host next December in Paris a landmark and final fundraising session of IFAD's replenishment for the next period 25-27. Indeed, France and IFAD share a common ambition and vision for the struggle against hunger and poverty in rural areas, a vision based on sustainable transition of food systems. Science, technology, and innovation are identified as key levers for implementing the UN Agenda 2030 and its 70 SDGs, and also for the transformation of food systems in the spirit of the 21 UN Food System Summit and the follow-up work on the UN Food System Hub. France fully supports the mobilization of knowledge, science, and innovation in our national and international development agenda. An ambitious innovation agenda called France 2030 was launched considering that investments in resilience and innovation are key to support actors in food system and rural areas to tackle climate risks. Innovation is also a core part of the French Agence pour le Développement and the Fonds d'Innovation pour le Développement. During this IFAD Innovation Day, Several important issues are discussed as models of innovation management, human behaviors, impact and scalability, the EFAT innovation challenge, data, knowledge, science and indicators, finance and innovation for world development. I have only one minute, I had to a little more. <laughs> so EFAT is an innovative development financing mechanism, a new fund created in 2021. Hosted at Agence Française pour le Développement, FID is chaired by Esther Duflo, co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2019. Fit's ambition is to contribute in the long term to the transformation of public policy by supporting the scaling up of proven innovations. At the core of its approach are the synergies between innovation research teams in order to pilot, test, and evaluate the impacts of projects using rigorous scientific methods. The new, this new initiative is complementary to existing tools and has a specific financial mechanism and methodology. It allows access to grants in a flexible way for innovative, innovative teams taking strategic risks and demonstrating what has concrete positive impact and scale them up in order to reduce poverty and inequality. Why is it important? Because we really believe that international cooperation has also a role to support innovation. FEED is a good example of capital risk for development, and this financial support is necessary and very effective to cover risk of innovation process. In a certain way, feed is itself an innovation. But I let our colleagues explain more in details. Uh, 
thank you, thank you very much, uh, Raoul. Um, I just have to like this. Uh, for this uh, insightful uh, introduction, uh, you already already told um, a lot of things about feed. I'm just gonna um, give you a brief overview of what how it works. So it was it was launched two years ago. It was launched two years ago to identify, evaluate the impact and support scale up of impactful innovative solutions to fight against poverty and inequality. Our mandate is therefore broader than just rural development. But as you all know very well, uh, many of the challenge um, in the fight against poverty and inequality lie in rural areas. Uh, so that's why we are here today. Um, what is concretely FEED? It's an uh, open, tiered, and evidence-based fund. It's open. Our call for proposal is open all year long to all innovators across any sectors or geographical areas. Any organization, an NGO, a startup, a governmental organization can apply in any sector as long as, as its innovation target more vulnerable people in a low or middle income country. We also define innovation very broadly as any solution, social, technological, organizational, financial, introducing an improvement over existing approaches. Either by uh, in terms of cost, speed of implementation, feasibility. It's also a tiered fund with multiple multiple stages of funding. Basically, we provide successive funding stages following different maturity level of innovative solution. It means that we support projects in the most critical moments of their development, when they are developing an idea, prototyping, piloting it when it's time to expand and evaluate the ID, and when they are ready to scale impactful solutions. These critical moments are when innovators need the most support, but also the time when we can learn the most from their project. It's also evidence-based impact measurement being at the heart of the grants we propose. Um, demonstrating evidence of impact means rigorously testing whether and how an innovation works and isolating the impact from potential co-funding factors. We really think that impact evaluation can contribute to improve the solutions to make it more efficient at, and also that's necessary to measure the impact of a solution before supporting the scale up. Uh, concretely, here you can see our different grants. We propose um, four uh, successive grants uh, following different maturity level. It's last slide, it's like, yeah. Um, following different maturity level, levels of innovative solution to prototype the first two one to enable the development of new ideas, then a grant for evaluate the impact, and then a grant to support sustainable pathways to scale. We also have a specific grant called uh, transforming quality policy to make policy decisions more evidence-based. So it works. Uh, two years later at FID, the first uh, results are really promising. First, the, dem the demand is exceptionally high. Uh, FID received more than 2,000 applications from all around the world since it, since it started, among them 27% in the field of agriculture. We have a very demanding and responsive uh, financing uh, process um, implying many expect, uh, experts around the world and based on three cross-cutting selection criteria to help us compare, compare very diverse uh, projects. Those are rigorous evidence of impact, cost effectiveness, and pathway to scale. At a portfolio level, um, we already have uh, more than 50 projects across 27 countries with a particular, particular focus on Africa. Um, among them, 12 have a focus on rural development challenges and half of, of our grants support impact evaluation. Also, uh, we try to open doors to a new range of partners. A large share of our portfolio are local organizations. So, um, in this session today, we will have the chance to listen to three speakers. Uh, a researcher, Tanguy Berna, involved in our review process, and then two project team uh, leaders supported by a Fund for Innovation in Development. 
So um, first, I'm very happy to welcome Tanguy Bernard. He is professor at University of Bordeaux and director of Bordeaux School of Economics. Tanguy, um, we, we share the same name, but we are not from the same family. <laughs> just, a, just a small disclosure. Um, Tanguy research focused on agriculture and rural development issues. Most of his field work is concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, he has been involved in the field review process, first as an independent reviewer and then, then in our review committee last year. We thought he was the right person to speak on why evidence-based solutions are needed in the field of rural development, and also explain how feed can be a promising mechanism to identify new evidence-based solutions. Tanguy, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, uh, thank you uh, for the uh, introduction. I'm very pleased to be here today at uh, IFAD's Innovation Day. I'd, I'd been here actually a, some, some years back and I, it's always a pleasure. Uh, I'd like to thank FID to uh, the uh, Fund for Innovation and Development to, to invite me. I'm a researcher uh, and I think the reason I'm here is because the Fund for Innovation uh, in Development is a lot about connecting innovators and researchers. I work in uh, in agriculture and rural development, as most of you uh, as most of you do, and as most of you know, this is a sector that continuously innovates, and that is a sector that is continuously in needs of more innovation because the environment changes, the the, the natural environment, but the economic environment, the challenges are different each time, and therefore innovation is is crucial to the advancements of our objectives. The good news is that there are plenty of ideas and innovations around. And my work as a researcher is essentially to work with innovators, whether in governments, uh, top level or, or frontline agents, uh, with NGOs, with social businesses, with farmer groups sometimes, or international organizations such as IFA, the World Bank and others. In doing this, I try and help contribute to accelerate the scaling up of um, say high potential innovation through rigorous empirical uh, impact uh, evaluation and evidences but also to try and understand why things work why they don't for whom do they work and therefore to help inform a broader learning agenda that goes beyond the particular project that we are uh, working on and, and and try and generate lessons for for other places and other projects i want to give some examples of of this in uh, in the field of uh, agricultural and rural development after which I'll, give, I'll say a word about about the fees approach so just to give you an example i want to so I, I sort of cherry picked some that are a bit closer to my heart and, and and you'll see why in a second so one started in 2008 uh, while i was based in ethiopia and here the innovators are farmers themselves individual farmers and the idea here is that as I was working in Ethiopia, a lot of people were talking about the fact that poor rural households are fatalistic. And when I say a lot of people, I say rural development agents, NGO, uh, frontline agents, and others, etc. And for an economist, fatalism doesn't mean much. Uh, we don't have that in our toolbox. And so we try to understand uh, that a bit better. And at the same, at this time, there were some anthropological work about how people form their aspirations. How, how do they see what is possible for them uh, in the future? So what we did then is that we ran a national competition to identify uh, small success stories. National competition was organized by uh, frontline uh, government agents, NGO agents, and others. And so we had a list of individuals. They didn't become millionaire, but they were no longer on food aid, for instance. They did things that their community thought was, was not permitted, permitted or impossible, uh, probably because no one had tried before. They have very different characters. One was an old, older lady uh, that trashed her entire field, and, uh, and people laughed at her for a while, and then started to say, "Well, I yell it. She's, she's actually uh, quite innovative, and 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 the results are there." And so they tried. They started to imitate uh, Ayelich Fikere, uh, who was our first document, uh, who was our first uh, uh, innovator. Can't go into details, but we made some short documentaries about all of these. Uh, 10 innovators, and then we screened these documentaries in a rural uh, Ethiopian district named Doba, and in 64 uh, villages there. 
because we are sort of obsessed about empirical evidence, we had control groups, we had treatment groups where people were invited to see these videos, but we also had placebo groups where people were invited to see videos that were of other things. The results of this after one year is that there were measurable, measurable changes in people's levels of aspirations. Interestingly, there was nothing in these videos that talked about education, yet the main impact was in terms of was a significant increase in the number of kids that were sent to school. With the idea that seeing these, these life stories of people, you know, putting some hard work in, in pursuing their objective is much more, it was not topic specific, it was much more, uh, much broader, it was about a mindset. Five years later, we came back to see, well, are these short-term effects? And five years later, you see significant investment in agriculture uh, technologies, uh, significant increases in agricultural assets, livestock and others, increase in food security. Think about this, this is just a one hour documentary exposing you to life stories of people who could be you, it could be your village, and they've innovated and, and learning about them actually uh, 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 encourage, you, uh, encourage you to, to, to innovate yourself. This little work was then used in the 2015 World Development Report of the World Bank, which was a lot about behavior. And then, uh, and then it, made, it, uh, it made its little progress. Now these videos, uh, aspirational video as we call them, are now included alongside cash transfer programs in, in several countries, including five of them in, uh, in West Africa, with some still uh, research ongoing. There is a recent uh, paper in Nature that shows that, yes, these videos do bring a lot in addition to, uh, to, uh, to uh, the cash. Um, so that was my first example. The second example is the innovator is called Rikin Gandhi, who was here in the, in the previous session. And so after, as, as we were starting these, uh, these little video experiments, I met Rikin very randomly in a, in a small conference in Minneapolis, and I found out that there was someone else that was, that was playing with, with videos at the time. And Rikin Gandhi started this, this great NGO called Digital Green. And, and we worked to, and so his main innovation was to promote, at the time, sorry, now he's done more, uh, but at the time was to promote agricultural extension mediated through videos. And the idea was, as, as he said, not only do you learn about a technique, but you see a farmer that could be you that actually implements it. And so we worked with Digital Green to assess it as, as rigorously as we could in a large scale randomized control trial in Ethiopia. As he said, the results are quite significant. There is very big increases in attendance to extension session, large uptakes in the promoted technologies. Interestingly, we also introduced some features about what happens if we invite both paths to, uh, to the training instead of the regular only one spouse, which are, uh, most of, uh, in most cases is, is the male household head. Well, didn't find much differences there. So we learn about successes, but we learn also about things that don't give the, the, the at least not large results in the, in the short run. We also learn a lot about mechanisms. But interestingly, as part of this work, we, taught, we tried to push the learning agenda in terms of, but did that, did that change the extension agent's way of doing their job? Because we had observed that not only were farmers more uh, uh, were learning better from these uh, videos, but we saw qualitative work tend to, tended to suggest that extension the agents themselves were quite happy about it because they're quite motivated about their job, but quite frustrated about the fact that they have very little impact. Now that they see that farmers come more often, that they learn better, we see that they tend to put more effort in their, in, in their work, which is from an, from an economist's perspective, you know, when you want to motivate people, first of all, you monitor them, second, you reward them based on, a, on a performance, et cetera. Well, extension services is all about some, somebody, an extension agent that leaves in the morning, go to remote rural areas, come back in the, uh, in the evening, and you have no idea about what is done. It's very difficult to monitor. There's been some advancements now with GPS stuff, et cetera. But the point here is that, helping people be good at their job is in itself a good source of motivation. So that was part of the things we, we, we learned also with Digital Green. Again, this work now has served to, uh, to uh, uh, help scale up the, the whole digital, digital Green program in Ethiopia and elsewhere. And we continue working together. We're trying to, we're trying to keep up with, uh, with Digital Green's uh, uh, fast uh, uh, innovations. 
Third example, this is a private sector. We work with the Lettrie du Berger. Some of you, I'm sure, have heard of him because, because the innovator, Bagore uh, uh, Bacchili, has been, uh, has been uh, featured in, in a lot of medias. With, with the Lettrie du Berger, I have to go a bit faster. We worked with the idea of introducing health services in agricultural contracts. Your work, you all know a lot about agriculture, but also you all have health benefits in your labor contracts. And actually, a lot of people in the world do. You think of it, may, some that don't are the small remote farmers that, are on, that may be under contract with, uh, with some uh, uh, small dairies or, or larger corporate uh, buyers, but they don't have access to health services. What happens if you actually do this? Does it enhance the, the, the performance of the contract? Does it increase people's income? Does it increase uh, people's health, in, in that particular case, uh, children? Can't go into, into all details, but Randomized control trial over two years also did uh, show uh, quite uh, some support for it. But interestingly, this didn't scale up. It didn't continue, not locally because because of many uh, many uh, uh, constraints. It did. It was used somewhere else. Uh, people reached out to us in, uh, from Zambia and Ethiopia, say, "Well, we like the idea. We saw your paper. Uh, we saw it. It was in a good journal. So we, it looks it looks rigorous." We're thinking about this, but it's not in dairy, actually. This is more of a flower business. Well, what do you think, et cetera? So the point is that the learning agenda is, is actually quite important in, in, in what we do. I could cite other, other projects in Senegal with the government agencies in terms of quality certification, in DRC with the World Bank and the government in terms of seeds and forest, in Nigeria with the uh, IITA uh, and uh, uh, in promoting AFLASAFE, et cetera. So I believe, or at least I hope, that this work does contribute to, uh, to better policies. But for this work to exist, I was, I've been fortunate to, uh, to uh, be able to fund these studies, some of which have been funded by if, uh, IFAD in, in, uh, as part of larger grants, by the way. Um, but I think we need a more systematic approach to identify, identifying, rigorously testing, and upscaling <clears throat> innovations. And that's, that's what all that I've heard uh, of this uh, since this morning. And so I've, quite uh, impressed by all of this. But I was invited recently, uh, a year and a half ago, to be a member of the FID, the uh, uh, International for, for Development uh, uh, Review Committee. And I've been involved in many other committees at the National Science Foundation in the US, but also the same in France, at Gates Foundation funds, uh, and, 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 and many others. What I find, and, that's, and I'm, I'm happy to say it because I'm not part of FID, is that FID is in a bit different and is promoting a new approach to promoting innovations and linking research uh, with innovation with the idea of promoting a large uh, learning agenda and, uh, and for, uh, in, in a way to uh, encourage uh, upscaling. As Claire said, it's tiered, which means that it can fund pilots, which is rare. Most of the things we did in videos, we had to do it on the weekend or at night, et cetera, and, and it didn't require much. Or any anything else, I think uh, 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 fund is missing, and therefore innovations are, are not happening. It's open. It's not saying we would like you to uh, innovate on 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 how to uh, do a, a seed that is uh, more drought resistant. It's open, open to uh, any uh, innovation. Importantly, and this is my hat as a as a researcher, but also as a colleague of many other researchers and as a professor. Uh, it is it is ongoing and it has a revise and resubmit procedure. It's very different than saying, here's a fund, everyone competes and the best will get it. This is ongoing, which means if you have a good proposal, you can get it, but there is also revise and resubmit. Therefore, if there is potential, let us, let us give you some feedback. Let's leverage the large feed network that, has, that is quite impressive in terms of all the expertise, operational, academic and others uh, that, that they bring together. In terms of in, uh, so that you can increase the quality of the proposal. This is quite important for colleagues in low income countries that are a bit less uh, used to how to frame the exact proposal, having the right keywords, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and, and I think this is, this is actually quite, quite important. As I said, it has a very strong network. And I was, I'm always impressed by the very highly professional in house staff that makes the review process not only. Um, uh, quite enjoyable, but also uh, very professional. So in the field of agriculture for development, uh, the, there are two recent examples that I was fortunate to evaluate as part of the, of the, of the review uh, committee. 
uh, which I think will be presented now. Thank you, Dangi, for this uh, very inspiring uh, speech and also for the compliments. <laughs> Um, we will now have the chance to listen to innovative teams supported by FEED. These two teams have received a pilot grant. They are really at the early stage of the development of the innovation um, to test their solution in real conditions. Both solutions are developed in Kenya. One is implemented by a research team from a national university, the second one by a private sector team. These are two early stage piloting projects, but our portfolio also counts impact evaluation and support to scale up. We thought it would be interesting to present these two projects to show the different approaches to innovation, whether from private sector or from the world of experimental research. They will tell us how fit funding, funding allows them to take risk and test new solutions, and what are their learning agenda and the next steps uh, to develop further their solutions. I'm very pleased to welcome now uh, Dr. Denis Mushangi from Kiriniaga University. He's not here now. Okay, he's here. Um, he's part of a, of a larger team with four researchers involved. Um, it, I mean, they had to choose someone to represent the, the team. So to, to represent the team, it, it's uh, Dr. Denis Mushangi, but there is also Dr. Grace Kiru, Dr. Agnes Mutisu, and Dr. David Kabata involved in this project and I will let him uh, present uh, the project. Please go ahead. Well, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Dr. Mashangi. I'm presenting from Kenya. And uh, as you've been told, I'm in a team of uh, researchers from Kirinyaga University. Kirinyaga University is uh, in Kenya. I want to give my presentation. Uh, we are uh, one of the beneficiaries of the FID and uh, our research is on upscaling of a small scale cotton ginning unit for the rural farmers in Kenya. And uh, the, the reason we are doing that is that uh, first, Kenya is an agricultural uh, community and uh, it's, uh, it means that uh, much of the population in Kenya depends on agriculture. Uh, actually, up to 70% of the population in Kenya is engaged in uh, agricultural activities. Uh, however, uh, up to 80% of the country is either arid or semi-arid. Fortunately, uh, much of this can do well with cotton, as can be shown there on my presentation, this uh, table there. And indeed, 27 counties in Kenya, out of the 47 counties, can grow uh, cotton. Uh, however, for the last uh, few decades, the cotton and the textile industry in Kenya has been on the decline. And one of the reasons is that uh, the farmers uh, depend on uh, the ginning uh, units, the ginning plants. Uh, but unfortunately, today we only have four ginning units uh, in Kenya. And this has discouraged the farmers from uh, growing cotton uh, mainly because they have to travel long distances in order to reach the, the generis. And uh, for that, it becomes very expensive for them. And even when they reach the generis, the prices are very low because they sell the cotton uh, at, a, uh, at low prices. When you sell cotton, when it is unprocessed, uh, for instance, currently you sell at around 50 shillings. But if you sell to the spinners when it has been uh, processed, the price goes up by four times, up to 200 shillings. And uh, so the table there can show uh, the decline in the cotton industry in Kenya for the last uh, few, de few decades. Now, what the team has done is that uh, we have visited farmers across the country and uh, we have tried to gather out from them what the problem is. And uh, we have also done a lot of empirical review. And the, the key solution, the key problem that we have seen is the lack of the ginning facilities uh, in Kenya, because there are only four ginning facilities uh, in the country. And so what this team has done within a wider team 
is that uh, they came up with an innovation, a prototype of a microgene. And this microgene now can reach, once it has been uh, fully processed, it can now reach farmers from wherever they are. It's portable. It can be used uh, uh, using several sources of, uh, uh, of power. Some parts of the country have no electricity and the farmers can use either solar power, it can be run by solar power, or even manually by hand for those farmers who don't have uh, a lot of cotton. And also in the realization that many of the farmers in Kenya are small scale. And uh, this is now what you're working with the FID. And uh, we are very thankful to FID because we are piloting this now within uh, Kenya in two counties, uh, the county of Kirinyaga and uh, the county of Embu. And we are testing and experimenting and uh, we, we are optimizing and we allow the farmers to use the gene uh, for a period of time and uh, then they will give us the feedback and from that feedback we are able to know what to improve what to change what are the risks and how to you know mitigate the risks uh, and so on and so forth and we expect that uh, once this has been done we shall be able now to uh, have a microgene which will help the farmers uh, process their cotton at the farm and with this they'll be able to sell the cotton at better prices they'll be able to have a better income and uh, because now they'll be accessible to lint lint is now the semi-processed cotton with the lint they'll be in a position now to go to other cotton uh, products such as the earbuds they can be able to do for themselves uh, you know the sanitary towels and so on and so forth and this will help create employment for both the youth and, and the, the, the women, and not just the farmers. And so we expect that uh, once we are done with the, with, the, with the piloting, we can now scale uh, to other parts of the country, uh, the 27 counties in Kenya, which are able to grow uh, cotton. And with that, we shall be able to have more impact uh on the on the rural development in kenya and uh, most importantly we'll be in a position to uh, revive uh, the cotton industry in kenya it will be helpful for the farmers it will also be helpful uh for the for the community so that's our innovation i do want to say thank you so much to the fid for accepting to fund our innovation uh, and uh, we, once we are done with this, probably we can now move to other levels of the cotton uh, value chain. That's the spinning and the, and the weaving. So thank you so much. I'm with, the, with my team, uh, the team from Kirinyaga University in Kenya. We are actually doing our presentation from Kenya and uh, we are very thankful. So thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you, Dennis. Um, we are now welcoming our second online speaker, speaker in, Evelyn Jensen, who is Regional Program Manager for Flood at, at NVU. She will speak about the project Shambani Pro, empowering smallholder farmers through increasing income by turning waste into value. Evelyn, um, yeah. I think we still have the, the slide from Dennis. Okay, great. Evelyn, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Evelyn. I work at Envue. Um, we are actually a venture building studio. Uh, and actually, it's my pleasure to share with you the work that one of our ventures, Shambani Pro, uh, is implementing with, um, with FID, with the support of FID. Um, I'm really briefly going to talk about NVU, just to give you a bit of background um, why I am presenting, but also why our approach is uh, quite unique, in a sense, and innovative, doing these kinds of research-focused projects within our company, so within kind of like private sector approach. Um, this is the NVU project in a process, in a nutshell. We, so our philosophy is that local impact-driven entrepreneurship is key to solving the world's biggest social and environmental issues. Um, and so 
innovative business solutions as a force for good, essentially. So you set up uh, an impact first scalable and sustainable company that, you know, if it's sustainable and commercial, it should be, you know, it keeps growing. Um, and in that way also keeps creating more and more impact. So this makes sure that sustainable and long lasting change can be achieved. Um, but we also start, as you can see more on the left side, uh, before we build anything, we start off with a rigorous assessment of where the system is not working and what kind of business model is needed to um, to push that system to a more sustainable normal, but is not yet in existence. Um, I'll briefly, very briefly, we're a global organization. We exist since 2004. Uh, and the focus of uh, the focus domain of um, NVU in East Africa, where also I am uh, based and located uh, in Kenya, um, is sustainable food systems. So key to our way of building and developing impact ventures um, are the lean startup principles. So we focus strongly on a, what we say, build, measure, learn loop. And so this is not only for the core business operations, but also on the intended impact that we want a venture um, to have. So now, especially in these last two stages that you see here, so these would be the stages that we go through, but especially in these last two stages, build and scale is where we weave in um, an impact focused research agenda into our venture building. And that's where the, the project comes in um, between FID and Shambani Pro. So the venture is called Shambani Pro and it's a value addition venture with a unique business model. So it's set up in the form of micro factories at Farmgate processing second grade or, uh, or reject produce. And it includes smallholder farmers in the process of value addition. And that's a bit the unique point because um, as a bit of background there, so value addition along um, horticultural value chains has been low and has not really been benefiting the smallholder farmers. So um, smallholder farmers are only involved in primary production, kind of missing out on the value that can be added in a value addition process. And of course, it's you know it's a, it's an ideal solution to do something with your second grade or reject produce, um, and. I think as we, as you you know probably know that in a they call it natural resource based production the lowest economic value um, is generated if the resource is sold raw or unprocessed so like coffee is one example there um, and processing is often done in larger factories away from rural areas and so out of reach of the small farmer and really to the benefit of like an individual larger company. So this is the business model of Shambani Pro here. Um, you have a farmer, they collect reject produce and they pre-process at the farm. And now the micro factory, uh, Shambani Pro, they aggregate this and they, um, and they will pay the farmer a higher price than what they would usually get. So um, sometimes farmers don't even get to sell the rejects by the way, or they're, they're simply left with the waste. But Shambani Pro off takes it against a higher price also, because there's already value accruing in that pre-processing phase. And so Shambani Pro then processes it into the final product, which is sold to larger buyers. Now, the learning agenda of our, pro of our project really centers around showing the impact of operationalizing this model. Um, and so improving livelihoods, um, reducing poverty, reducing food loss and waste, and gender inclusiveness. And that's, I think, also a key focus here that we're very keen to see what comes out of this project. Um, the pre-processing pre activity is something that uh, rural women can take on really well, um, and it will empower them in terms of income and social status. Um, and in addition, you know, having a micro factory at Farmgate will also create rural tech jobs um, to run the factory. Um, so because we are an impact focused business, the critical assumptions that we're like that we're looking at, they're all centered around the impact created through our innovation. And so we will really be focusing on um, farmer behavior and motivation, impact on women and youth, uh, post harvest loss and the you know the emissions avoided and resources saved that come with that, and the income increase and improved livelihoods. And so 
the theory is that if critical assumptions are proven, um, that means that the business model works or will work because it means that the customer, so the farmer, wants to engage with the company because it benefits them. And so that means that the product or the service is desired um, and the company will grow. So we test the underlying assumption of this theory of change and validate our business model through a number of pilots at the company uh, that will allow us to collect that data comparatively. And so it's a bit of a, I guess, yeah, <laughs> approach mixed between research and private sector because we gather the majority of the data through the business and through customer records. So we start with a small data collection because we start small. Um, but and we build it into the existing touch points with the customer. So like we when they register, when we do a trade, um, those are moments really to capture data in a lean way, putting the least burden of like continuous surveys and interviews on the farmer. Um, and this also means, of course, that with the venture growing sustainably, also the, the evidence base also grows. So delivering uh, further proof. Um, I just wanted to share some photos of action in the field. So here is um, avocados drying uh, at, the, at the facility. And here we see um, a training being given at the factory on how to uh, pre-process avocados. We started the project two weeks ago. Uh, so I don't have concrete lessons yet that I can share. Um, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes out and I'm super, yeah, super grateful for FID also to enable us to test this because this is quite a unique approach to, you know, setting up at FarmGate, um, from the private sector angle. So I just want to say we have kind of like project innovation on two levels. So on the business model of Shambani Pro itself, but also a little bit on the, um, the innovation to research and impact evaluation through a business. Um, which in a sense, of course, is not um, a surprise because evidence and measuring really lies at the heart of building and scaling a social enterprise uh, in order to create that impact. And through the project between Shambani Pro and FID, this is also um, unique that we're bridging um, the research and the private sector implementation of it more directly. Uh, and the outcome of this, you know, this research agenda is actually directly connected um, to action on the ground. So that's it for me. Um, putting my contacts here in case anyone wants to uh, reach out, wants to reach out and discuss this more. But um, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to the implementation of the project and also to potentially sharing uh, what comes out of this uh, this project as well. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, we now have uh, 10 minutes to take questions. So you can ask questions to Evelyn, Denise, Tanguy, or I, um, whatever. Please feel free. Is there any? Yeah, there is a question. Hello, Courtney Price from FAO. Really, congratulations on a fantastic presentation, a really exciting portfolio you're managing and innovations you're you're enabling on the ground. Curious about the specifics of some of the tests you do and how you're mitigating for heuristics behavioral biases with with how you're asking questions, how you're mitigating. I know it may get into some of the nitty gritty, but it's some of the things where um, with co-creation of behavioral insights on the field level, it's one of the challenges all of us are facing. So your insights and experience on how you're mitigating uh, the, the implicit biases in how you test and how you survey and how you engage. Uh, would be really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, is this a question to the both of us? Okay. Um, and do you mean mitigating the risk during the project or be during the review process? Just to, just to be... I apologize if I was unclear. The the this presenters, uh, especially the the, the current uh, last presenter, was talking about the piloting and the experimentation. So yes, I was thinking of, of you, ma'am. If you could share with us some of these methods uh, in your in your uh, design of the the research and testing and piloting. All right. 
Um, it's a, yeah, thanks for asking. It's a really good question because it's also something that we realize that we will have a certain level of bias, of course, because these yeah, these farmers are also, you know, working with the company and benefiting from them. Um, we will have a uh, an RCT approach to um, to also have at least a control group. Um, and we are, as part of the, the project, we're, you know, making sure that we develop the, the survey and also the, you know, incorporate ways of asking the questions kind of based on on best practices. But it's really something that we're also still still starting. Um, and so, yeah, from that angle, also very, very keen to to hear also from others, um, from Dr. Dennis, my colleague, um, if there's any approaches you you would recommend or share. Uh, for the Kirinyaga team, uh, we are mainly working with the with the farmers who give us feedback on an everyday basis. Uh, they're able to tell us uh, where we go wrong and with that we are able to come back and see whether we need to modify to rectify to optimize more to use different sources of power so the 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 team uh, mainly uh, involves the stakeholders at all levels including the government and that way we are able to know whether we are going right or we are going wrong and uh, we, we with that we hope that with time we shall be able to uh, have a product uh, that benefits all the stakeholders. Yeah, I think I'm just thinking out loud here, but um, I'll, I'll wrap it up. I'm also like the, the way that we're, you know, what we're doing, of course, is where I'm saying we're collecting data through the um, through the, the basically the registration system of the company, but at the same time, so we hold those surveys as well. So we hold surveys with a control group and with the and with the, the customer group and probably both in quantitative surveys as uh, as well as farmer group discussions um i think it would be good to kind of figure out early on uh, if there is any change if we do if we do that in a sense like executed by the company or executed from like a neutral party to have kind of those more open discussions with the farmer let me leave it at that, but happy to pick up the conversation. Thank you. Um, at the field level, we are we are ready to take some risks. What is really important is uh, it's a learning agenda on each project. We want to be sure to learn something, uh, if it works or not, and if uh, if it's a failure, why, why is it a failure? What didn't work, etc. And to share the results on the project uh, so that uh, everybody can learn uh, from this success or this fail. It's really important. Um, is there another question? Yeah. I'm Claudia Casarotto from Innovation Through Poverty Action. Thanks a lot for the great presentations and input. That's definitely our turf, we work on impact evaluation. So I have a question about the last part of the FID model, so the scaling part, that it's really interesting. And I'm wondering, like the learning agenda, we do want to learn something out of these projects. And so what is FID, and maybe also the experience of MVU could be really interesting, but what have you learned so far about what it takes to successfully scale an innovation? It might be a little early, I know it's an ambitious question, but I think you know what does it take what are the who, which stakeholders are fundamental to be involved in the scaling process what are the challenges that we've been facing and we should also speak about like the null results right and what doesn't work thank you thank you for this question um we are still at the beginning of, of uh, fund for innovation and development, so we don't have many experience in the scaling up of, of a project, but we already have three uh, scale up grants in our portfolio. So those are projects we, we were um, evaluated before and developed before uh, uh, FIT started, and uh, uh, which are um, the three of, of them are very. Uh, been proven to be very impactful um, and very cost effective also. And for those uh, three projects, I think what was really important was the policy involvement um, because of the, these, three pro these three projects are um, developed with governments. Um, so 
yeah, the policy moment was was really important, and the, the policy involvement was was important. So, um, in our impact evaluation project, uh, we are really um, we are we, we are very careful to to be sure that there is um, um, a convincing pathway to scale, either with the government or through market. Um, and we really check uh, if uh, this is convincing in us um, at our stage two funding um, to be sure that we, we are funding an impact evaluation on something which could be after that uh, scale up. But I think Tangi wanted to add something on this. Fundamental question. Uh, quite often, uh, what is produced about scaling up is the question is, those results that are done that are found at the pilot level do they hold when things are implemented at a, at a larger scale because there are effects on prices there are effects on, on on many other or because the the the, the intensity of um, scrutiny uh, of that exists at the pilot stage may not exist at a larger scale i think this is a, these are important but this is not sufficient especially when we think about agriculture uh, i think going from small scale to large scale scaling up uh, requires oftentimes innovations that go beyond the initial innovation itself i want to give an example of of things that work in the field at small scale we, with small scale farmers for instance a study we did about measuring the quality certifying the quality of onions in rural markets uh, rural assembly markets in senegal works super well super large demand from farmers themselves they increased quality because they knew there would be some uh, some uh, uh, quality assessment, etc. That season, the prices were actually better, and so it seems quite virtuous. As soon as the study finishes, uh, some actors lobby against uh, the, the continuation, despite government involvement. My point here is that when we think about agricultural value chains to which smaller farmers participate into, they are long, they are complex, some have market power at local level or at inter intermediary level, etc. And going from pilot to large scale requires a, a much broader understanding of, of how the agricultural sector uh, works uh, in itself. And I think this is clearly some places where we're at IFAD here, so there is huge knowledge about, about all of that. Uh, uh, FAO is not far also and also has this, uh, this, uh, all this work uh, trying to understand better uh, value chains uh, with IFAD and WFP actually, et cetera. And I think a big question about scaling up is linking those pilots, those randomized control trials are small, at a small level to this knowledge and eventually being able to pilot scaling up mechanisms themselves uh that go beyond just learning whether the, the the results hold at scale but also what what makes it possible to go at scale that involves that means involving go governments but also all the private actors along those chains some will be thinking about losing on these new systems and so they need to be convinced that it's also good for them otherwise things can get blocked and never go to scale so um Okay, I see we have one minute uh, left, so I think it's time to conclude. Uh, do you want to say over on the question or do I have to? Oh, I'll just say one word, which is as a former researcher, I have no research perspective, I have no grab on it, but I think the main question also is all of this work, innovation, research, etc., how does that translate into policy? And I think this is everyone's uh, uh, job around this room. and. Uh, and something we need to be much better about. Um, I think I have one slide left for the conclusion, if it's possible to put in. If not, I mean, I can just conclude like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, if uh, innovation, if had innovation team for the invitation uh, in this panel. It was really, really a, a good opportunity for us to present uh, FID two years after our, our, we started. Uh, thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, Denise, for your for your very uh, uh, inspiring presentation. Um, I think you 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 got it. I mean, we we really need uh, more people around the table. To we need need more application. I mean, we already have a lot of application, but in the field of rural development, we think we are 
we are still missing some very good innovation. So if you know innovative team or if you are an innovative team, uh, please apply. I mean, it's it's open all year long. You can really it's it's an easy um, form to to fill and uh, and the process is is quite uh, fast. So. Um, please apply. Uh, if you are a researcher, uh, we need an uh, expert to evaluate uh, our, our um, uh, application. And also we need a researcher to help the, the innovative team to learn about the impact of their project. Um, anybody in, in this room, please spread the word about feed. And uh, yeah, we, we spoke about scaling up. We, we have a, still a lot of work to do on uh, scale up. And I think we have to build some uh, strong partnership with organizations like uh, IFAD uh, and other UN organizations, also bilateral donors, to work on the scale up of the of the solution. So yeah, um, we will be at the lunch break. If you want to to discuss with us, uh, we would we would be very happy to to discuss with you and Pete. Thank you. And now it's time, um, here you can see our contact and our website, and now it's time to have the, the lunch break uh, during one hour, and we will meet at uh, 1 p.m. this afternoon. Thank you, everybody.
Hello and welcome back everyone. It has been a really, really exciting morning. I hope that you have enjoyed the sessions, the panels and your engagement with the speakers as much as I have. Now we have a very, very special panel. This is a core session of the IFAD Innovation Day. And we are going to be talking about multi-stakeholder partnerships to scale up innovation. And each of you was chosen particularly because of, our, of your contributions in your own countries, uh, in your agencies and at IFAD to make uh, the scaling up possible. So uh, without much further ado, I have the great pleasure and honor to introduce IFAD's Associate Vice President for the Strategy and Knowledge Department, Dr. Joe Puri. Doctor. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, friends, Gladys, it's such a privilege for me to be here today for personal as well as professional reasons. Personal, because I'm, um, well, I'm just coming out of a short medical leave and um, I wanted to make it here primarily because innovation and the topic of today is so critical to me professionally as well as personally. And so if you wanted a testimony to how dedicated we at IFAD are to innovation, I think I can give you one. Galileo, Copernicus, and many other inventors didn't change the world in a day. They changed it after pushing the frontiers of science, providing evidence, and what Thomas Kuhn in his 1960s book of Scientific Revolutions called anomalies. They provided evidence that the way that we think of the world today is not the right one. And we need evidence over and over again, systematically in a consistent, synthesized way for us to know that our conception of the world has to change. And that's how Copernicus and Galileo changed our conception of the world. At IFAD, we very much believe that we've got to do things differently if we want to bring about a change in the nature of food systems, in the nature of private sector participation, and in the nature of rural development. IFAD stands at the forefront of development and encourages growth for rural poor worldwide. But for that, we know that we can't keep on continuing to do things the way we have been doing. And so whether it is carbon markets that we are pursuing in Lesotho, or it is a payment for ecosystem services in Rwanda, or biogas services in very unreached parts of Africa, where it's still considered innovative, or where we are thinking about blockchain in parts of Kenya, or using even methods to get farmers to change the way they are producing. So half moon circles in the way they are producing their agricultural produce on their fields. All of this is really predicated on innovation taking place at different scales, whether it is at the individual level or it's at the subnational level or it's at the national and the international level. But IFAD is committed to pursuing innovation at all of these scales. I think one of the key things that we are keen to see within innovation is not just what innovation can do at a small scale, but clearly what we can do in terms of impact. And not just impact, but optimal impact. So there are two things that we like to pursue with our change and development, uh, with our change and um, delivery and, um, and innovation unit, um, as well as the strategy knowledge department, where we are responsible for designing and delivering, um, along with the program management department, the investments on the ground. What we are keen to see are two important things. One is efficacy. Does the innovation work to solve the problem that the user has put in front of us. So it has to be to see that, yes, there is the efficacy 
of the innovation to respond to the problem. But the second one is effectiveness. Really to see when we replicate, when we scale up that innovation, are we truly able to get the same effectiveness of results? And both of those are high bars for innovations, but we are committed in both putting resources, people, as well as technology to put all of this together. And in all of this, I think the three things that I really want to bring out with respect to innovation at EFAD is user centricity. That is, we are responding to the needs of the user. Second, that we are responding to the needs of scale. And third, that we are also responding to financial sustainability, because we know that most innovations fail if they do not meet all three of those standards and criteria. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to be witnessing a very, very interactive and very exciting panel soon after. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion uh, hereafter. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Gladys, for having me. So much, Joe. And as <laughs> thank you to the audience for that as well. So, um, and thank you, Joe, for highlighting the vision of the not only the strategy and knowledge department, but of DFAT in terms of how is it we want to scale up innovation and the uh, re uh, the relationship between efficacy, effectiveness, the role of knowledge, the, the role of learning, but most importantly, the role of evidence in our decision making process. So with that, I am going to introduce now His Excellency Joaquin Blaker, and please excuse the pronunciation, <laughs> um, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the Federal Republic of Germany to the international organizations in Rome. Before becoming an ambassador in Rome, Ambassador Blaker uh, represented the German Federal Foreign Office in Denmark, the Slovak Republic, Poland, Serbia, and Montenegro, the United States, and the United Kingdom. Ambassador, could you please share with us what is the strategic vision of Germany when it comes to financing and supporting innovation for rural and agricultural development? Yes. Does it work? Yes. <laughs> thank you very much uh, for introducing me so kindly, and uh, thank you very much for, for setting this up. I think before I start talking about the specifics of your question, I think it's important to remember why we are all doing this, what we are doing. And this is basically creating, trying to create food security, fight hunger. And we have to remember that we really have to uh, look at conflicts, we have to look at climate extremes or climate change causing the climate excre extremes and economic shocks. And this has caused a global food crisis uh, that is really unprecedented in, in the last decades. So that's basically the context where uh, where we are working and why we are working uh, here. Uh, and we see that many measures and efforts taken so far uh, were not sufficient. Uh, we have to focus on new approaches and innovative ideas to tackle this challenge. Uh, and that's why we're so happy that you organize these innova uh, innovation days, because uh, this gives brings together talented minds and uh, people who have a say and have influence on developing innovation and possibilities to develop innovation, uh, basically to help us fight the global food crisis. Um, and I think IFAD is ideally suited to do this, because just as Joe also mentioned it uh, just before, uh, you are in touch with small scale rural farmers, you work with rural women and youth, and these are exactly the people, I mean, that are close to you where, where you have expertise and through learning and proximity, uh, you and your local partners have a very clear idea of what is needed and uh, what small scale farmers uh, need in their daily life, basically for the works in the field, literally. Uh, and of course, for in innovation, innovations can only work if they have, if we find investors, people who have the money to to finance all that. Uh, and Germany has since long supported uh, relevant research nationally and internationally. Uh, for example, on improved seeds, um, 
or climate smart uh, innovations, cooling or drying systems. Uh, and the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, together with GIZ, uh, GIZ set up uh, green innovation centers in 16 African and Asian countries um, to basically work with local and international and also German partners, of course, to promote the introduction and dissemination of inno innovations all along the agricultural value chain, uh, from the field to the plate, literally. And uh, those partnerships and the ability to scale up are so important because only then innovations can make a difference. And the central part of Germany's strategy is to promote concepts which help to attract private investors uh, that are willing to invest into ideas and innovations in the agriculture sector and food system, because otherwise it's all theory and not cannot be put into practice. Maybe I give just two examples uh, with a specific German, German accent. The first example, of course, is probably something you all know. Uh, this is the uh, WFP you know, um, Innovation Accelerator in Munich, uh, which really has been a beacon project uh, since 2015 already, scaling up innovations to make humanitarian aid more cost effective. Uh, Germany is basically providing a home base uh, for for the accelerator together with uh, some other countries as well and of course uh, with WFP and one of the many success stories of that uh, innovation accelerator is the so-called Dalili app which is an app that was developed for vulnerable fam families in Lebanon uh, basically to have a possibility to compare prices in local food stores because I mean they certainly don't have much money to spend they they live on a very very uh, small budget and for them it's so important to know where they can buy uh cheapest really and uh, and this dalili app helps them to compare those prices this is a very practical i think example of how an innovation can have very good effects and another success story we think is the scaling digital agriculture innovations initiative or sas initiative and this initiative supports African startups to distribute their digital agriculture food innovations, helping them to scale up and acquire capital and clients through a good business model and investment readiness, basically to prepare those startups, help them starting their, their thing. And this is good for development because uh, there are gains, of course, from successful uh, innovation start, innovative startups and the additional capital which is mobilized for development purposes. But of course, also the investors themselves profit from that. So it's a win-win situation, I think, uh, for, for all sides concerns, because also the investors have increasing income and the ability to grow. So we can basically foster an environment that can produce more out of its own uh, existence. And if we just look at the numbers, I think this is also important, especially when looking at Africa. If we look at, uh, we, we, I think the year 2021 was a record year for startup investment in Africa. But if we look closer, we see that only 1% of global venture capital went to Africa in that year. and. Of that 1%, only 2.3% went into agritech investment. So this is an enormous mismatch for the continent of Africa and really uh, a waste of opportunities because we all know that Africa has enormous potential also for agriculture or especially for agriculture. So in that sense, um, uh, when we talk about money, when we talk about innovations, Africa is really a continent uh, to look at. And uh, we really hope that many of today's initiatives also can be realized and give a basically a push for African development. Uh, and this brings me to my, to my last point, really. Um, cooperation with other partners is so important. Uh, innovations are much more effective if wider development investments that go into structures and systems are also scaled up with partners. 
And this also uh, is true for, or this is especially true for cooperation with governments and other actors. We need a good education system in a given country. We need to have infrastructure for electricity, for road, because this also then can accelerate innovation so much. So the partners are, are very important in each and every country. And again, I want to thank EFART for providing a platform to connect your senior management with expertise of partners to support the rural poor uh, and to transform food systems uh, in the end to advance our joint mission, basically realizing the Agenda 2030, because that's the overall framework we're working in and the goal that we want to achieve. And right now it doesn't look good if we look at the uh at, at the figures um we are far off track with the global development goals but uh, sustainable development goals but this innovation or innovations can help us a lot in maybe turning around and and still achieve a better result in the end so much for the time being maybe um so many points that you made there in your, in your intervention. Uh, thank you so much for, for them. But a key one was at the beginning of your intervention when you were talking about ensuring that those innovations are really addressing the needs of smallholders and indigenous people. So user centricity is one of the core principles of our um, innovation initiatives. So I appreciate that very much, as well as your contribution about partnerships for innovation, making sure that we are leveraging on each other's strengths and uh, collaborate and look for that collaboration rather than uh, competing against each other. So uh, with that, I'm going to now give the floor to Eric Fering, Assistant Director at the Department for Partnerships and Shared Prosperity of the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation. Eric. Um, you have a passion for cross-section collaboration, but you are also an expert in, uh, in scalability. So when you look at the scaling innovations, what is that you look for? What, 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 uh, how, how do you measure and how do you identify uh, solutions that are ready to be scaled up? And how is that your government is supporting that kind of uh, scalability? Thank you, Gladys. Um, first, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and thanks to IFAD for uh, having me here. Uh, first, I must say that uh, the function I lead and, and NORAD's and Norway's new strategy on innovation is relatively new, so I think we still have a lot to learn. And then this is also a good opportunity to meet others, so, so uh, thank you for that. On your question, I think we generally underestimate what it takes to scale innovation. Uh, to put it bluntly, I would say that in the past, we as a collective, I think the development community have maybe been too focused on seed funding without thinking really through the full cycle of innovation through piloting to full scale implementation and all of the different types of interventions and support that is needed from a very complex ecosystem of actors. Um, so, so based on our experience, um, all of the following elements are required for scaling of innovations. Of course, the first is the seed funding, how to uh, fund those great ideas that can change the world. But we see that there is also a need for a lot of technical assistance, matchmaking to access finance. You need an enabling environment with the right policies in place sometimes in order to really reach scale. And sometimes you even need some sort of end user finance mechanism because we operate in markets, to use that word, where the needs often outpace the purchasing power. So you might need some sort of mechanisms in place on that side as well. And of course, all of these elements have to be context specific, both in, both in terms of the markets you operate in, the geography and the policy context. We have the impression that IFAD takes all of these matters into consideration in your work on scaling innovations, and we applaud that. Uh, we have also learned that successful scaling of innovations require multi-stakeholder partnerships. Uh, in our role as donors, we have relatively flexible risk capital, at least compared to the private sector. We are prepared to lose that money, quote unquote, because it's, it's a grant, while the private sector has other uh, requirements when it comes to, to profitability. But we lack market knowledge. We don't have the industry expertise and many more things that we don't have. And of course, we also operate in a relatively speaking, slow moving bureaucracy 
that is not always conducive to innovation. So what we need are other partners, the private sector, academia and research, civil society, and of course, multilateral organizations that have other comparative advantages that are required to succeed. Uh, and when it comes to our multilateral partners like IFAD, we look to you for your convening power, bringing all of these different actors together in order to create the ecosystem we need to scale innovations, and also your ability to deliver on the ground. In short, multi-stakeholder partnerships ensure complementary expertise, reduced risk, and improved long-term sustainability of innovations. Uh, on the second part of your question, what we look for and how we work, I think I would like to focus on uh, what we do on digital transformation, because there I think we are, alongside a few other, uh, including Germany, uh, a leader. Uh, we have taken quite a principled approach to digital transformation. We are a founding member of the Digital Public Goods Alliance, and we promote a digital public goods approach in our development cooperation. So I won't bore you with, with the long definitions, but digital public goods are open, they comply with applicable laws, they do no harm by design, and they are imperative in reaching the sustainable development goals. Um, what we see both in Norway in, and in our partner countries is that too often proprietary solutions, they hinder scalability and they threaten digital sovereignty, while on the other hand, digital public goods, they are based on open data, open source code, open standards and open licenses. And this means the potential for scalability is built into the design from the very start. The problem today, uh, when it comes to technology and data on uh, agriculture, nature and climate adaptation, is that we are investing large sums in closed data solutions and closed technology. So what we are doing now is to take a step back and look at the broader architecture on data and technology. We take a stack approach where we look at what can we do in order to make data storage open, to make uh, key aggregate data sets open in order to unleash innovation for the entire ecosystem. We can work on the deeper layers of the stack and then you, IFAD and others might be, I would say, mid-level so that the market, and here I mean the market of private, civil society, and everyone else can then innovate to create better solutions for the end users we try to reach, which are the small scale food producers. Thanks. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, and um, thank you so much for making also the link between the, the convening power of uh, IFAD and also our uh, results in the field. I also would like to take advantage of this opportunity to thank the Kingdom of Norway for the words by the Minister um, of International Cooperation this morning, praising the work of IFAD, but also uh, acknowledging an increase in uh, contributions from the Kingdom of Norway to IFAD's mandate. So thank you, thank you very much. And thank you so much also for the um, discussion on digital public goods and why they're important and why we need to make sure that in our work for innovation, we are designing for scalability from the beginning, but also making sure that the data of smallholders and indigenous people is safe and protected. So with that, I'm going to move to Phil Feilerstein, um, President and CEO of VentureWell, who uh, is a long-standing partner of uh, IFAD, and who is uh, and VentureWell has been contributing to ensuring that from the beginning in the design of our innovations, we are designing for user centricity, feasibility, desirability, marketability. So, um, Phil. Could you share with us a little bit more of the approach of uh, venture well? Maybe also a, a bit on your uh, work also with the National Science Foundation. And if it is not the only Rome based agency that you are collaborating with uh, recently, thanks to the introduction from IFAD, um, you are now also working with FAO. Could you share a little bit how is that you're ensuring scalability from the design phase, please? Sure. And uh, thank you for having us here and thank you for the opportunity to work with you and, and to uh, bring our approach to scale the impact of some of the great ideas that are emerging from within the organization. Um, our organization is a uh, NGO. We're based in the U.S., but we work globally uh, bringing innovation to solve 
some of the world's most pressing problems through scientific and technical solutions and business innovation. We work with both institutions and to support innovators in taking their ideas forward. And we're really trying to bring together an innovation process that can produce the collaboration, the uh, breakout from kind of closed ways of thinking and old approaches to one which really sets an open path, but drives the solution towards a uh, customer-centric and user-centric approach that from the outset is uh, based on evidence that it will be attractive, that it will be scalable, and that it will provide a value to all of the different stakeholders involved in the process. Uh, and the work that we're doing really apply um, in a kind of very directed and efficient way, the tools of design and lean discovery. Um, we use a pretty rigorous market and user informed approach that frames for the participants a pathway to examine who's interested in using their technology to do that in an iterative way that's informed not by what you think as an innovator, but by what the users, the stakeholders, what the market thinks, and using that then to iterate on both the technology, the way that it's applied, and the way that it's scaled. Um, so we've had the opportunity to do this work uh, for about 30 years. Uh, we're in our, our 28th year now as an organization, and we've built up a practice of supporting both cultural transformation within institutions, uh, working with the NSF, as you mentioned, uh, to build programs, uh, not just as a provider of the program, but actually as a backbone partner to help to understand how the program can shift culture within the institution that we're working with, as well as in the stakeholder institutions that the innovators are emerging from. And that's been very effective. We run a program called i which has now kind of become a uh, standard language for uh, innovation development using lean methodologies. And that uh, is a program that has thousands of scientific and technical innovators going through it each year and producing solutions based in incredible science in not just sort of the technology of science, but also the insights that it provides. And sometimes those are applied to scale ventures. We've had a lot of great success coming out of these programs with uh, thousands of ventures that have raised billions of dollars in the private markets, but we also apply it to uh, behavioral interventions and understanding the stakeholder communities and thinking about the value of those interventions in the same way as you would for a product so that the path to scale is actually one that's welcomed by the users, by the consumers involved. And we, we work with many other organizations, private philanthropies. Um, we're we're uh, very honored to work with the US State Department, with uh, the other international uh, stakeholders. And in this work, uh, we've been able to really support a, a wide range of technologies uh, for solutions across a broad range of different technology spaces. So the approach is effective uh, almost regardless of the sort of underlying technology. Uh, the methodology is agnostic to where you're starting from, but the idea is to use tools of science, evidence-based inquiry, and really a rigorous, iterative, large-scale approach to gathering data so that when you're making decisions about what to do next, you're actually basing it on what the user will, will use and what the adaptation will require. Um, our approach, though, doesn't just stop there. And I think to your point earlier about the importance of um, taking the idea all the way to impact and scale, it's necessary to think ahead to how you're going to achieve those impacts and to actually build the technology, not just around sort of a pilot or a prototype, but actually thinking about how it will scale, where, where, where will the sources of capital to make that scale possible come from, and to think about those uh, players as stakeholders from the outset. So that often requires really a, a big shift in the way that you think about how you're going to approach your um, opportunity and take it all the way from idea to impact, impact and scale. We um, use five stages 
in our approach here, which run from really understanding and discovering the market through validating it, through then taking a development process and moving then into identifying your partners, your investors, and looking at the way that you're gonna enter the market and scale from there. So at each stage, again, we're looking for a rigorous approach uh, based on evidence gathered by talking to people, talking to stakeholders, talking to the end user of the technology, and talking, and most importantly, perhaps, to the decision makers who will drive whether resources are allocated to it. And I think that um, that approach is one that can be very effective in bringing innovations out of a wide variety of different kinds of institutions. And one of the things that I think we're most proud of and seek opportunities to do is to do this work in ways that can leave a cultural impact on the organizations that we partner with. So we're delighted to be working with you and I hope that our work has been able to produce some impact already and we look forward to continuing it. Thank you so much, Phil. And indeed, it has delivered impact. We uh, we have uh, from implementing the approach that was co-designed between VentureWell and IFAD, we uh, have now teams that have graduated from the Innovation Challenge with incredible results already. Um, some of our partners here from the International Land Coalition, and I don't see Yapu, they must be downstairs, uh, actually upstairs in the marketplace, but um, they are already influencing policy making they're already influencing if that's country strategy papers and uh, they are uh, collecting that evidence that um, through the new design of the innovation challenges um, we have identified that it's that evidence-based decision making but only also ensuring that we are mitigating risk while supporting innovation and uh, having a stage gate assessments so that our resources are optimized and we are providing financing in key stages of the innovation journey. So all of those has been uh, developed based on the learnings from previous uh, innovation challenges, but also through the experience that you are contributing to ensure that we uh, develop it the, and design the best innovation challenges possible. With that, I'm going to move to our Director of uh, Communications, uh, Global Communications and Advocacy at IFAD, Helen Papper. Helen has been a champion of um, innovation in storytelling and how IFAD approaches the relationship with smallholders and indigenous people, women and youth. How is that we uh, give them a voice so that they can tell the story themselves? Helen, why don't you share with us how is that IFAD is innovating in terms of communications and advocacy? Thank you. I'm going to take a little bit of a step back before I answer that question directly and take you to the concept itself of, of storytelling, because sometimes people say, well, storytelling, how is that innovative, right? Um, storytelling is actually the oldest form of communication to be able to move our world forward. The once upon a time there was is something that has accompanying us uh, through centuries and centuries. And yet, sometimes innovation lies in history. Innovation lies in what we often forget and how we can take that and move it into today's realities. So, so I wanted to, to put that into context. Today, we, we're living in a very, very busy world. We're flooded with all types of information. We're flooded with all types of communication. We're actually flooded with all types of storytelling to the point that we don't know whether the real, not real, misinformation, disinformation is at the key in one of the keys of global challenges today that we face, and it's gonna become more and more important. So how do we use our necessary, necessary capacity to tell stories, to share information, to share knowledge in an effective way that is going to cut through that noise, that is going to be credible, that is actually going to help us move forward because that's going to be the challenge it is the challenge of today it's going to be the challenge of tomorrow so in the end to be able to cut through that noise we need to make sure that our storytelling the knowledge that we're sharing actually connects the people that are engaged that are listening our audiences right we hear about that all the time and how do you do that well to make sure that the audiences understand that what we're saying actually matters what does it matter? Why am I going to pay attention? It, because it matters to me, because it matters to my future, because it matters to my family, actually because it matters to my survival. 
because that's what gets people to pay attention in the end is what matters. So that's where innovation comes in because our capacity to put innovation into the way that we share information today because we have so, so much information, because we have so much knowledge, because we have so much data and we hear about that all the time. How do we take that and use this very old method of telling stories to actually serve our purpose today? So that's taking that into perspective. Let's take these fundamental principles and these questions that I, I've just raised back to EFAD. We work to ensure that rural populations uh, who feed a third of our planet have access to the funds they need to continue delivering for our world, to continue feeding themselves and to continue feeding us. They are those people behind our plates. So in the end, their local realities, their knowledge, their culture is what needs to take center stage if we want to move forward in addressing global challenges. And as some of my colleagues said, there's an amazing culture and richness that comes from these rural communities across the globe that need to be shared today. And through innovation and storytelling, we have the capacity to do that. So the work that EFAD does hand in hand with these communities and that unique approach, which leads to clear, sustainable results and long term development objectives is the key to our continued success. And so we have to make sure that our various stakeholders, our various audiences, even more global communities stop and listen. So we do that by using and embedding new technology. We have the capacity today to use immersive storytelling opportunities to get people to pay attention to areas and places that they have never had a chance to get to know. You'll see outside, if you have a chance to put on these virtual reality glasses, that thanks to virtual reality, we take you and immerse you in places that you would never have a chance to go to and get to know people that you would never hear from and get to know their own knowledge. And that's where dignification comes in. Because the fact of being able to listen to them is the dignification of the people that we serve. And every person that we work with merits their dignity. And so dignified storytelling is also something that we are pushing forward at EFAD and that we need to use as a model for the rest of the world as well. Secondly, I want to talk to you, and I know that the time's up, but I'm going to be very quick. One of the ways that we've innovative in storytelling, because storytelling is not just about communicating, it's also the way that we embed technology. Through um, a partnership with Farm Radio International, we've been able to use new technology and combine it with radio to get hundreds of thousands of these rural farmers that we would never speak to, to engage in what are their exact challenges that they're facing when it comes to global challenges, conflict, climate change, their, their specific necessities. And we've been able to, in, to, to embed blockchain technology so that those hundreds of thousands of voices turn into qualitative data and quantitative data that then can be used directly for global decision making. This is something that's groundbreaking, and it is a form of storytelling in and of itself. It enables us to bring data from people directly that we are looking to work with. So these are two examples. I could go, of course, on and on. Storytelling is something that we are bringing in through these innovative approaches to make sure not only that we are heard, but that we serve a purpose, that our work serves a purpose, and that the people we work with are heard and help move uh, our, our challenges, move our world towards this sustainability that we are all so passionately involved with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. And before I give the floor to um, Dina for our closing remarks, you echoed something really important from our um, opening session today. We heard uh, this morning from the CEO of Digital Green about the importance of combining uh, frontier technologies such as artificial intelligence and even virtual reality in our storytelling. But more than that, the importance of combining uh, frontier technologies, artificial intelligence with human intelligence to ensure that we are making an ethical use of technology and that we are ensuring that uh, information is truly information and not misinformation. So that sourcing the, the information is, is quite important and also referencing to make sure that that data 
is uh, is real and we can make decisions really based on, on 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 evidence and not misinformation so thank you so much for that helen now i'm going to move to our um closing remarks unfortunately we are running uh, out of time so i don't think that we have uh, we don't have time for q a um, i apologize for that but uh dina your um division is one of the champions of uh, innovation here at IFAD, and you uh, you were actually the um, main champion of the IFAD innovation talks we launched together the uh, IFAD innovation talks the first one was a uh, collaboration between uh, IFAD and IFPRI to uh, launch uh, AIDA a digital platform um, can you share with us how is that NEN has been working uh, not only with uh, CDI because we're quite nascent but uh, for a long time has been working on ideating originating ideas and then working together with partners to scale up those ideas well, good afternoon and uh, thank you very much for organizing this. I mean, as the other uh, esteemed panelists have said, this is actually an, an extremely important subject and opportunity for us to sit around and just listening and looking at the representation here. I mean, it's private sector, it's public sector, it's civil society, it's, you know, it's, it's everybody that needs to be around the partnerships that is gathered here today. So, so very quickly, I mean, first of all, I don't think I can do enough justice to all that has been said, but I couldn't agree more. You know, when I listen to, um, you know, Joe starting off with the user centricity, looking at financial sustainability, looking at partnerships for scaling up. I mean, these are extremely important. And Your Excellency, you know, talking about really, um, you know, how much money is there and how much of this can be actually targeted towards innovations and, you know, using the startups and trying to really uh, invest in these, you know, youths and young, you know, solutions that are there um and listening also you know to the to the other I, I like the point that you made um about saying you know there is so much that needs to be still understood in the market about how we can match you know what's in the market and what the needs are and obviously you know the 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 brokering work that you're doing you know in venture well this is excellent so this is trying i mean you took us down i was already seeing imagining grandmother sitting around the fire and 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 discussing and passing stories but i'll i'll focus on on gladys so in near east north africa europe and central asia as you can already imagine this is a region that goes from morocco to kyrgyzstan and then down to somalia so there is a lot of um experiences there a lot of knowledge there and this is why maybe you know sometimes we we think only about the challenges but i think in those challenges there are a lot of solutions a lot of innovations that can come out of that so when i think about the region i think about you know um desert i think about climate change and i look at what we have done in in countries like egypt in countries like you know tunisia and somalia where we've brought you know, taking those indigenous solutions and try to match them with the technologies and try to match them with the investors. So if I take, for example, what we're doing in uh, a border, uh, let's say frontier uh, region in Egypt, uh, bordering with Libya, where we have massive issues there of, of course, as you know, you know, you have migrants there, you have local communities, then you have also the climate, um, you know, desert harsh environments. And we have tried to adopt crops that are drought tolerant. We brought in climate resilient infrastructure. This is where the public investments come in. And then we've also tried to, as, as you were saying, and I like that about the behavioral aspects, right? So trying to understand these are very conservative Bedouin communities and how do you get them to appreciate technologies and innovations and that's the work we've been doing also with the local community actors with looking at some of the um, some of the NGOs that are in the area and how can we bring all these together so that we can have a viable investment financial sustainability. The other uh, area um, and I know that time I have one minute left so I'll talk very quickly recently if has been um you know appointed or or selected by the government of egypt as well and i'm not focusing only on egypt because we also have kyrgyzstan we've been selected as the the champions for um a nexus of water food and energy so this is extremely i mean if you look at that these three components water food and energy is really um, you know, this is livelihoods, this is survival, this is what we need for our day to day. And IFAD has 
been leading this and championing this, not just in Egypt, but also in Kyrgyzstan. What are we doing here? Is we're bringing the partners, conveners, we're convening the partners. So assemblers of finance, bringing, channeling the money where it should go, trying to understand what are the community needs, and then bringing these investors. So the if you look at it, the private investors, so it's technology, communications, again, the storytelling, bringing about also the um, solutions. So for example, now we have digital solutions, digital agriculture, we're looking at GIS, we're looking at remote sensing, we're looking at all those innovation challenges, and also trying, how do you convince the private sector? So de-risking, how do you tell, actually bring the private sector and say, look, this is a viable investment. And the only way to do that is really to make them see the profitability of it, but also to see that the long-term um, benefit of having sustainable communities. And I know most of the donors look at that as well. How can we prevent these migrants jumping onto ships and, and, and what we've seen the tragedy of last, you know, the last few days? How can we prevent that? And that is actually by making these environments more livable and more, um, I would say, sustainable. So I'll stop there. I know there's a lot I can say about our region, um, but um, yeah, thank you for, for listening to us and, and thank you to all the panelists for these excellent uh, inputs and ideas. Back to you, Gladys. Tina, uh, before we give a big round of applause to all of our speakers, um, I would like to say that this is actually our cue. Uh, storytelling is our cue for the next session. We're going to go on a really short break, and then we're going to hear from our innovators because they're going to be pitching you with uh, their ideas, uh, the results of the work that they have been uh, doing, and how is that they are delivering impact for smallholders, indigenous people, women, youth and all the great work that you guys are, are doing. So I'm really looking forward to the pitch event. Short break, but before that, a big round of applause to our, our speakers.
we are going to start the pitch event. Hi everyone and welcome to today's pitch event at EFAD Innovation Day. My name is Dana Vitell and I'm the Communication Officer for Partnership and Innovation here at EFAD. Before we get started, I'd like to invite all, all of our participants to visit our event page and check the speaker profiles and agenda. John is sharing that link in the chat right now. Um, everything will be uploaded there, including the recording of this session. Um, the chat box is already open now for your questions, so please post your questions during the pitch session so that we get a chance to turn those over to all of the different teams to answer them. This is a really special and decisive session today. Teams from EFAD's Innovation Challenge that you've heard all about today are going to be here showcasing the results of testing and piloting their solutions. It's also an exciting opportunity for the EFAD Challenge winning teams to explore resources and partners for scaling up their innovations. So the projects have been incubated under the Innovation Challenge, which you've heard a lot about, which is all the way from ideation to piloting and have been selected for further development and additional funding based on a rigorous evaluation process. So we have with us today four teams, uh, Land Monitor, Behavioral Mindset Avansar, Digi Climate Risk, and Geoscan. So the first team that's gonna join us on stage today is Land Monitor, and I'm really pleased to introduce them. They facilitate comprehensive land tenure data collection with a focus on target groups and empower and engage them in land policy development, uh, land tenure reporting, and also SDG monitoring. So from the International Land Coalition, we have with us Eva and Michelle. Take it away, ladies. Fantastic. It's such a pleasure to be here today um, and to be speaking on behalf of Land Monitor, a project that we co-developed with IFAD and have implemented in the Philippines. Um, my name is Eva Hershaw. I'm the Global Land Monitoring and Data Lead for the International Land Coalition. ILC is the largest, most diverse global coalition working on land. We are about 300 members. We work across 84 countries and our members represent an estimated 77 million people. Um, we're also located on the fourth floor of IFAD. What we did in the Philippines with IFAD um, was develop a process by which we could put people, their needs, their priorities at the center of data collection. So at ILC, we work to promote people-centered land governance. In our data work, we look to uphold those same principles. That means putting the individuals, the groups, the communities that are most often absent in official data sets back into this process. We center their needs, their priorities, and we use diverse data sources, as well as data collection through focused group discussions to explicitly elicit their perspectives. We want to know what their experience with land tenure is. We want to know what their needs are as individuals. So how do we do this? We look at official data. We also work with participatory data tools. We use Landex, which is ILC's global land governance index. We use people-based assessments and then we bring people together in target groups in order to make sure that we understood what is really the most pressing needs in these communities so we we use the land sdgs as a point of entry you could apply this process to different frameworks we see them as frameworks for accountability the sdgs being the most prominent when it comes to land so if in 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 the philippines what we did was we worked with local partners to identify what official data exists. If we look at SDG data on the Philippines, we don't see anything. If we look at official data on land tenure in the Philippines, we see 96% tenure security, 
We know that that's an overestimation. We know that doesn't include farmland. We know it doesn't include collective territory or natural resources such as fisheries. So if we look at other data sets, we could look at the Prindex global data set, for example, on rural tenure security, we would see a different picture. We would see 57% are secure, are sec feel secure, despite 86% being documented. So who that, that document isn't translating into security. We know that women are less secure and we know that those living on community lands are even less secure. If we look at SDG data on 5A1, we don't see that 36%, 33% of agra agrarian reform beneficiaries are women. So this is something that fills a gap and gives us an understanding where we wouldn't otherwise have one. The same with 5A2, where we didn't have an assessment based on an official SDG indicator. Landex can provide a citizen-led assessment of the, um, of the, the, the land rights situation for women. So we heard from these target groups, we understood their priorities, and with this, we were able to translate their needs, their feedback into concrete policy recommendation, recommendations to improve investment, and recommendations that would guide better policy and understanding of progress towards the SDGs. Michelle's going to tell you why that worked so well in the Philippines and um, what the results have been to you, Michelle. Thank you, Eva. I'm Michelle Calcatelli, Resource Globalization Consultant for ILC. What has Eva has presented up till now, how did that work in practice for EFA? So basically what we did first is generate inclusive land tenure data for and with target groups. This then the data was presented to IFAD, which was in the process of formulating their country strategy in the Philippines at the time. Sorry, Eva, can you click the slide? Thanks. Help me. <laughs> That's okay. Um, great, cool, thanks. Uh, so this was reflected in IFAD's new COSOP, which is going to be approved by the end of this year, and also in the new project that is going to be uh, approved by the board. For our team, this point was extremely important because for the first time in IFAD's portfolio in the Philippines, there's going to be a project that has an entirely dedicated component only for land issues based on land monitor recommendations. These recommendations, point two, were taken up to government level by the target groups, CSO representatives, to the National Statistical Office of the Philippines. This happened about a month ago. Essentially, the result of that meeting and the knowledge sharing experience, of course, was that these target groups were invited excuse me, to participate in interagency committee meetings and in two national processes that are ongoing at the moment. One is the community-based monitoring system and the other is the 2023 Ag and Fisheries Census. Beautiful recommendations, results, and data. Where is all this stuff? It's in our wonderful land monitor report. You have a QR code upstairs at our booth. Please look at it. This is used for direct recommendations for policy change, but it can also be used to influence national VNR processes and SDG monitoring, especially like Eva said, where we do not have any official SDG data that is related to land tenure. Besides all of this, why does land monitor work? It works because the approach is simple, standardized, flexible, easily replicable, and it's based on Landex, which I've explained earlier, comes with technical assistance, support, and training. But Land Monitor works mostly because people are at the center, at the heart of data. They are the ones that collect it, validated it, and validated, excuse me, and monitor it. Without those steps, this data goes nowhere. So the process is highly and fully inclusive. What is our ask? Well, our dream now between <laughs> this summer and the end of 2023 is to raise $1.5 million with your help, probably, if we can, and be able to scale up this process and methodology in at least 20 countries, preferably starting where ILC has uh, members. That already is about 80 countries, per se. Of course, the information that we would gather would turn into national, regional, and global advocacy products, which of course would be complementary to official data, of course, always with target groups being at the center. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, please go ahead. Thank you, ladies. As you heard from Eva and Michelle, Land Monitor has been tested and piloted in the Philippines and tied to the country program design process from the onset and is now being replicated in Brazil with high ambition to replicate across eight more countries, which is what we call scaling up. 
Um, we've got time, I think, for maybe one question from the floor. Any questions for Eva and Michelle? Over to Joe. Thank you, ladies. Fantastic, really exciting work. If you had to do it all over again, what would you do differently? Well, if, if I can start then Eva, maybe you could build on that. What I would do differently would probably have a better idea of how the bureaucratic part works. So getting everybody together on the same page. Of course, we all know that pre-implementation support works, but this was a very, as was already said, rigorous process. So we had a really snappy time schedule to, to have to adhere to. And the bureaucratic process at the beginning slowed us down a bit, but because we had such great cooperation at national level, we were then able to have the great results that you've seen in not even a year. So the three months that we took to get all of the, the bureaucracy sorted really paid off in the end because we made up for it, at least in terms of results and numbers, et cetera. But maybe Eva, you have something no, to add? No, I would agree with that. And I would add that getting all of the actors involved together around the table at the very beginning um, to agree on priority areas, target groups. Um, that was something now we, we're kind of already learning as we go. So in Brazil, we've done this and it's been a really fantastic kind of, let's everyone meet one another, who needs to be here, who's missing here, what are our hopes for this project, what are our expectations? I think because timing was quick and it was a pilot in the Philippines, we kind of hit the ground running. And in Brazil, we had a little bit more time to get everyone together do a little bit more um, collective capacity building, awareness raising about what the project was intending to do. Data can be one of those things that people feel a little allergic to until you get down into what we're actually going to do and they see that it's rather concrete and, and they can get their heads around it. So yeah, I think that buy-in from the beginning is something we learned already with the Brazil process. Oh. I wanted to say to the audience um, th to thank our guests uh, and a round of applause for Land Monitor and International thank Land you. Coalition. Thank you, ladies. Our second team joining us today is Behavioral Mindset Avansar, which creates valuable operational knowledge and instruments, provides innovative and low cost solutions to help country teams work more efficiently and reach their target populations. So joining us today, we've got one member of the team from EFAD's Latin America and Caribbean division. Please welcome to the stage, Rosa Maria. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I am really happy uh, to be here representing our team, Behavioral Mindset Avanzar. Daniel is on, online, <laughs> is, is also joining us. Um, well, we, we are really happy to be one of the innovation uh, challenge projects. Uh, and our main challenge was uh, that the, the design of IFAR project doesn't consider a decision-making process of, it, of the beneficiaries. Therefore, it was no surprise that under implementation, some potential behavioral barriers appear. And also IFAD country teams don't have the tools and the knowledge on how to identify and address these behavioral barriers. So our solution proposal was a behavioral toolkit for IFAD project. And it has two main components. One component is a pilot in the Avanzar Rural Project in Peru, where we apply the behavioral design methodology, the phases of problem definition, uh, behavioral diagnosis, uh, design of solutions uh, and interventions and testing. And our second component is a prototype of a behavioral toolkit that is informed by the results of the pilot and also by uh, interviews with key stakeholders such as country directors, project delivery teams. And uh, the idea is to have easy to use tools to understand and identify behavioral barriers during the project cycle. So here is an example of what we did in, in the Avanzar Rural Project in Peru in the face of the behavioral diagnosis. So the problem was the low participation of rural women in the Avanzar Rural trainings. So together with the project implementers, 
we conduct the behavioral diagnosis. And the interesting feature of this behavioral diagnosis is that it helps you to understand and differentiate between behavioral barriers and structural barriers. And then after this phase of the diagnosis, we select some behavioral barriers associated with the, the, the uh, participation in the trainings. And together uh, with some partners, we develop a behavioral solution that was a notebook to encourage self-reflection during training. This notebook contains some characteristics, specific characteristics, for example, self-affirmation exercises from the from um, uh, November to June, because we implemented the pilots, we are fi finalizing the pilot and we started in November. It also contains a calendar to write when is the next meeting coming. It also contains a space for not taking. It contains personalization, so each, it, it, it is for each member of the association and uh, another interesting thing is that together we, we partner with a research uh, center in peru to conduct a randomized control trial in the producer organizations so uh, in 60 producer organizations we we uh, in 30 that were our treatment group we gave these notebooks to the, the to the producer organizations and in the other ones we we didn't give uh, the notebooks and also we send monthly uh, reminders to the technical producers about the self-affirmation exercises. So to, to, to remember that they need to conduct this self-affirmation exercise the first five minutes of the, of the training. Uh, right now we are finalizing the pilot and we are uh, in the test, uh, passing to the testing phase. Uh, well, uh, some, some points to highlight the, the uh, why it's important to use the toolkit. Also, upstairs you have the QR to download the toolkit, to download the infographic, and to download more material of our projects. Uh, one, one of the things is that it, it will help the teams to become a behavioral science champion. Also, it will help to map out the behavioral, potential behavioral barriers, and it, it has a potential to increase uh, IFAD uh, effectiveness. Uh, now we are already, because the, the pilot is in a project under implementation, right now we are testing in a project under design in Bolivia. Actually, we are in the design phase and we are trying to understand uh, the potential behavioral barriers to consumers to attend agroecological first. Uh, we are already, already starting this diagnosis. And what we ask is for more projects to pilot, to test our toolkits under design and implementation in our regions, because we already started in the Latin American regions, but it has potential to scale in our regions. And the last thing uh, is the import. I, I have heard in all, in all the, the sessions, the importance of partnership. And in our case, it's also really important to partner with behavioral experts, to partner with our UN entities and also with the private sector. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa Maria. So as you all heard, uh, Behavioral Mindset Avanzar uh, has piloted a behavioral toolkit and piloted this in Peru and is now under already, I think, scaling up in Bolivia with an aim to go even bigger. So um, with that, are there any questions from the floor for Rosa Maria? Go for it. All right. Sincere congratulations for this really exciting pilot you've got going. Um, from the perspective of piloting, it sounds like you have two pilots going on. One is the use of this toolkit, and the other is the results of using the toolkit. How are you disentangling these two or benefiting from, let's say, having two pilots in one? Thank you. Uh, the result of the first pilot, the results in, in, in the Peru case, the we, we are final, finalizing the testing but we already have lessons learned on how to to do all the all the steps in an ifar project so we are already incorporating how because this is a toolkit that should be used in 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 the projects in in the day-to-day -day, uh, work in the design phase we are already applying the lessons learned of how to conduct together with the implementers the the, the different phases the result of the behavioral solution itself, we don't have it yet, uh, but for sure, for example, in September, we are planning to have 
a seminar to disseminate the results of the, the first pilot. But the way of conducting, and I think this is a rich, the rich part of our of our project, is it, our toolkit is flexible. Is is the the to, to be the most useful for for IFAD project. So, for example, we have created an express path, and it's different because we know that we don't have time <laughs> so uh, we need it uh, and also country directors uh, there's a lot of, uh, of of things already so how to be the most useful we have created this express pass and we are adapting our toolkit with these pilots but of course the result of the of the pilot in peru we are going to have it uh, later and then in bolivia all, what we are learning while we are doing it is uh, we are also is because it is in the design phase we are uh, learning how to adapt uh, this this diagnosis in the design phase for example we just did a concept note and this is as an annex but then we are in the in the design document there will be already some interventions we are planning some interventions in already the cost the table cost so we are already uh, using our 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 pilots as uh, embedding in the in the in the process of of IFAD project. So we are we are we are learning by doing. But of course, we hope, for example, that while more projects use it, we have more lessons learned, and we have something that is uh, easy to because the idea is to have the, the tools easy to use. Also, uh, more partners, more behavioral partners, because we know that sometimes. You you need a behavior partner, but it's not available. So we also ask for that, like the availability, the sharing. Uh, I think is 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 uh, is a starting point. But we are learning learning uh, while we are working on that. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemaria. We've got a question from the online chat box. Ah, no, one more question. <laughs> We where our online participants are also engaged in today's session, so we have a question and I don't know if you want to turn this one over to Daniel if you want to answer it yourself, but is it possible to share the behavioral toolkit. Yes it's, a, it's upstairs, we just create a QR code upstairs and we can send it uh, the link to the ones that are. Uh, in the chat we can so put we'll the put link. the we'll put the link in the chat and if you're here in person definitely go upstairs to the ground floor and check it out let's give a round of applause to rosa maria and behavioral mindset avanzar terrific um all right i'm excited to introduce our third team uh digi climate risk empowers financial service providers to integrate climate risks into their lending process and finance adaptation solutions accordingly. So this team is a private sector partnership between EFAD and Yafu Solutions, representing the team. Please welcome to the stage, Mark and Christoph. Take it away, gentlemen. Congratulations to all the participants and, and to CDI for putting on this great event. Well, after almost two years of working with Yafu Solutions, there's only two things I can say with absolute confidence about private public partnerships for collaboration, uh, for innovation. One, they're complex and require constant nurturing. And two, they require a large host of willing, obsessive even, innovationists. People who believe that a single innovation can make a difference in this world, and they're willing to walk through concrete walls to get to it, right? And, um, and, and be it from a social enterprise like Yapu or from an international development agency like IFA. Today, Christoph Jungfles, director of Yapu Solutions, developer of a climate credit risk app that could actually revolutionize inclusive smallholder climate finance. No pressure, yeah. Christoph. It's will okay. take us through our pilot <laughs> in Sudan, pilot program in Sudan, a pilot to learn how IFAD, with our unique and very unique smallholder development experience can integrate with other types of similar integrations, this innovation and other types of innovations, uh, innovation more broadly to um, reach greater and greater scale. Christoph? Thanks, Mark. Hello, everybody, and thanks for having us. Um, yeah, so it's all about financing adaptation for the most vulnerable, creating resilience. And we know that adaptation is a process and it's highly context specific, so we don't have one fits all solutions available. 
So first, we need to understand what are actually the climate threats smallholder farmers are exposed to. We are working with CGIAR SEAT in order to structure data from different databases and put them operational for partner financial institutions, looking at five climate threats, storms, droughts, floodings, um, extreme heat, and in Sudan, much less frost. Then we need to look at how sensitive final borrowers are vis-a-vis -vis these climate threats. So different crops have different water requirements. Um, different animals have different temperature requirements. So it is a structured approach to according to crop uh, in terms of climate sensitivity, according to animal. And lately, we also have included resilient housing according to type and materials of construction. That's fine. With these two data points, it's only two data points, click, click, we have basically the gross climate risk. Now we are coming to the, to the, to the interesting part. So how can we actually finance adaptive capacity? Um, what we are doing there is looking at what customers are already doing, borrowers are already doing, they are adapting, and we are looking at what they're actually financing. So we want to understand based on pre-structured taxonomies, adaptation finance taxonomies, what IFAD um, borrowers are actually doing. These taxonomies are a living organism. They are updated regularly from administrative records. So it's not a standalone once uh, for, for, for uh, all ways defined, but we regularly update them. And of course, they need to align with the national strategies, national adaptation plans, NDCs, and similar climate change strategies. And of course, we need monitoring and evaluation. And this is also an evolving field. So um, we have the, the massive data. We have technical verification for each implementation, but also what we are working on and participating on working on with EFAT in a different project is the certification of um, resilience and adaptation finance loan portfolios. So what are we talking about? We talk about drip irrigation systems. We talk about um, water reservoirs and solar dryers, for example, which have a very concrete impact on productivity. We summarize all this on an app where we have the standard credit risk scoring, but we also look at the physical climate risk and the technical verification for each loan. And in the end, what we want to facilitate and what we're aiming for is better access to adaptation solutions and technologies for the final borrowers, the smallholder farmers. How are we funding operations? Well, of course, in the beginning, yes, we have provided also equity into this pilot. Um, but of course, there is a grant component also for the scaling up. We are looking for grants. We are looking um, equally for equity investment. And then at some point, profit capped um, revenue, um, which is being in the longer term generated by investors, private commercial investors we are targeting on the capital markets. We focus on impact maximization, attractive terms for early adopters, and as I mentioned, the capital market structuring. So what have we um, reached in Sudan? Well, four months, and then of course we had the conflict. We have worked with seven institutions, 40 people, taxonomy with 50 investment items, the app in Arabic uh, available, and we have of course all climate data structured. So each loan is coming out with a specific climate risk report. Um, as we had to stop, we have a couple of um, results, of course, Yapu and other countries, we have worked in over 13, uh, no, in 13 countries with over 60 financial institutions and um, have channeled over the platform over 100 million US dollars. What are we looking at scale up? What we are focusing on is supporting existing and future um, IFAD um, programs. So looking at um, uh, the Sahel region and Western Africa, we can repli uh, re re replicable it's a replicable for countries financial institutions in any context and four major steps gather the data build the capacities um, provide software services for free um, in order to increase the transparency and certify the portfolios in collaboration with these other projects i mentioned what is our ask per country we need around 350 thousand euros and we are targeting four countries so a total budget of estimated four million euros for scaling this up and for this of course you get common goods like taxonomies and the data on productivity on taxonomy solution providers and similar so we hope that you can go with that and uh, looking forward to it back to you
Well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Christoph. I, I want to conclude only by saying that the integration of services like Yapu, and you notice I said services like Yapu, because procuring a private sector company is a challenge sometimes. So we have to be able to look broadly to civil society. We have to look to universities. We have to look to private companies, large and small. We have to think about where we can source our innovation. So services like Yapu that are going to be able to expand what we're doing on the ground already in our portfolio of, of, of activities. And one important, important part that I just bring out is that in the integration of services like that, it takes advantage and leverages all the wonderful things that we do in financial and non-financial technical support to the smallholders. Everything from the infrastructure, to market access, to financial inclusion. So all these things that we're already doing, we can great, get massive scale with digitization of this type of credit risk app. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark and Christoph. And as you heard, Digi Climate Risk was piloted and tested in Sudan and is looking to expand um, and is being scaled up as part of EFAD's green financing initiative, which is called iGreefin2. So we've got a question already online, uh, which is how can we reach Digi Climate Risk? Well, just Digi Climate Risk is the name of our pilot that we're doing in Sudan. What you really want to ask, it's a good question, you should say, how do I reach Yapu Solutions? But you can also talk to me as well as the representative. And also, I would like to do a quick shout out to Isha Singh, who's not here, who's also on our team. And she was instrumental from ECG to help us with this pilot. Thank you. Great. Any questions from the floor? We were hoping for a really tough one. No tough one, Joe. I'm not looking at <laughs> any no question. Well, then let's give a round of applause right, to both you. Mark and Christoph. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Our fourth and final team today is GeoScan, uh, which is a project that's been dedicated to geospatial evidence based country strategic planning, which incorporates project design implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. So joining us today from the EFAD Information and Communications Technology Division is Lubomir Filipov. So take it away, Lubo. Great. Thank you, Dana. Oh. Great. It's amazing to be on site. Hello to everyone. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all colleagues uh, who are joining uh, online. It's amazing to be here today. Uh, my name is Lubo Filipov. I'm a geospatial consultant in the IST division in uh, IFAT, and my talk today is about GeoScan. So GeoScan is an innovation solution in IFAT, which basically provides quite sophisticated data at your fingertips in terms of maps, reports, statistics, dashboards, and web applications. And like any other geographic information system, it has basically five obligatory components, hardware, software, data, specific workflow procedures, and people, a key trained personnel. So I'll try to briefly walk you through our innovation journey on combining these five different uh, elements into one single strong integrated solution called GeoScan. So the initial idea, was based on the demand from different uh, colleagues. Hope the next slide will change. Yep. Uh, on demand from uh, colleagues from different divisions in IFAT asking uh, geospatial data for baseline assessments for project design. And we quickly realized that uh, basically solving the complex challenges of today which are in the very core of IFAT's mandate uh, working in uh, remote rural environments in uh, uh, climate fragile areas uh, it requires much more than individual ad hoc approach or single data set or tools or, or encapsulated knowledge basically it requires a, a little bit more whole systems approach uh, on exploring different solutions, understanding patterns, collaborating, and basically embracing innovation. Innovation per se is one thing. I'm getting slightly better, hopefully. Uh, but then scalability and sustainability is a whole other dimension or challenge. And we based our initial approach on the solid foundation established by the ICT division on building a free and open source geospatial infrastructure. 
And with that, we got covered two out of five components on hardware and software infrastructure. And this allows us to focus on the next component, uh, building on top of data. And we benchmark various data providers against industry standard um, quality requirements, precision, uh, up-to-date information, and we selected the top relevant providers uh, aligned with uh, IFAT uh, internal needs for country strategic so-called COSOP initiatives for project designs. And because we are big fans of standards and naming convention, we organize all this input data in a number of uh, more than 180 geospatial indicators, all aligned based on predefined ISO data teams, covering uh, data like uh, climate, environment, uh, transportation, various location analytics, from machine learning data sources, remote sensing imagery, complex model future scenarios, uh, etc. So we had the software, we had the hardware, uh, we're building uh, a lot of things with the data and we focus on the fourth component, workflow procedures. How to mainstream different use cases uh, depending on the different uh, application areas. So we started with um, uh, predefined country atlases for every single country of its uh, operation. We built upon on various uh, web applications, so hosted on the corporate enterprise GIS system in IFAT. We developed a number of uh, web uh, regional web dashboards with quite cool uh, visualization of complex and future uh, data scenarios. Uh, and the whole approach from start to finish was a very step-by-step -step approach, uh, agile approach, uh, focusing uh, on the limited time frame and budget from the innovation. But we didn't stop there and we continue quite cool integration between the geospatial component and some BI, uh, Power BI in particular analytics uh, and through the so-called Omni Data project, we focused on the final fifth component, which is key for any GIS system, the capacity building, and we're providing a number of training courses with uh, Omni. And this allows us actually to sustain, to scale, uh, and to make the project a little bit more sustainable after the innovation uh, funding. So to sum up, I would say that uh, with GeoScan, we introduce a new ways for geographic targeting in IFAT, focusing on cost of design. We just pilot in Ethiopia uh, uh, on some private uh, areas for CCAP assessment. And the lessons learned, I would say that uh, we took a whole system approach, considering not only technology and data, but also governance, leadership, standard securities, and also capacity building uh, skills. One of also the key was that we benchmark our solution outside effort, attending a number of international conference, feedback from uh, other IFIs, UN agencies, so to uh, basically prove our uh, innovation idea. And with that, on behalf of the whole team, I would like to thank you very much. Over to you, Dana. Thank you, Lubo. Thank you. Um, so we've got a question online, which is how is GeoScan linked to the Hand in Hand initiative? It's a good one. Great. Yep. The Hand in Hand initiative is a great uh, fundamental product, which is uh, coming from the colleagues from IFAO. Actually, we did GeoScan uh, back in 2019 uh, because we did it on stages, piloting uh, the first initial stage with a couple of countries, then we scale up for the whole region, and then we mainstream through all IFAT countries. And uh, back then, the Hand in Hand was not actually uh, available. Uh, hand in Hand, I would say it's great, it's massive, it's uh, much larger than our humble uh, activities. Uh, but with small team, with agile approach, we built, built something uh, quite, uh, I would say, innovative, quite cool, and many uh, quite tailored to IFAT internal particular requirements. So it has many features uh, which are targeting offline uh, usage of the grid usage, uh, which make the difference between hand in hand. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And a follow up to that um, is the initiative related to or collaborating with uh, WFP's hunger map or the PRISM initiative? Uh, I, collaboration questions here. Yep. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we are not alone. I mean, we partnership with uh, the other uh, uh, ROM based uh, agency. We harvest a lot of data, which I probably missed from uh, hand in hand, uh, leveraging what uh, the colleagues from FAO are doing. And the same thing apply from uh, WFP. Uh, so the hunger map is a great, uh, uh, let's say, final top level visualization, but we use a lot of data from WFP, which we are harvesting, integrating our day to day solutions. 
Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the PRISM platform, but we collaborate with colleagues from WFP a lot. Terrific. Any questions from the floor? Uh -oh. Thank you, Dana. No, thanks very much for that, Yubumi. Um, so I actually want to ask you, as well as the previous team, one question which is related to the additionality question. And what I wanted to ask Mark and Christoph, but also you, is if the three of you and your teams were not doing this, what would we be stuck stuck with? In Mark and Christoph's case, I could imagine that insurance companies are looking at a lot of the risk and are thinking about premia to be paid, um, and they are incorporating a lot of the climate risk. And in Lubomir's case, I'm thinking very much that we've got um, no, that we've got other technologies as well that we can bring in quite quickly. So, what is the additionality of the work that you're doing? Um, sorry that I'm going across both teams. Thanks. I would say from, of course, my perspective, uh, I mentioned the beginning these five obligatory components which are crucial for uh, not only any GA system, but um, um, any system in general. Uh, I would say that the, the data nowadays is easy to, to grab. There is a notion of data out there. The technology is, is, is uh, available. The process we can easily automate from a, a city perspective. Uh, I would say that the most challenging is to implement the right procedures and to uh, actually raise awareness and do capacity building uh, among uh, different users or different stakeholders so we can bring the whole picture together. So integration between five different or balanced integration between five different approaches. Because I see it in some cases, hardware is easy, software is easy, a lot of investments are going in that area. But if we underestimate a little bit some of this component, then we have a beautiful, empty, and uh, useless uh, system at the end. At least this is my humble experience. Thank you, Lubo. And now we're going to turn it over back to Team DigiRisk uh, to, yes. to answer the same question from Joe. On the additionality. Now, I think, um, as, as you said, um, we have an ocean of data. We have a lot of solutions. Um, uh, the quest is more, how can we bring it together? And how can we make it operational? And how can we make it operational quickly and transparently, um, how can we avoid greenwashing, maladaptation, and how can we channel the funds where they are needed? Yeah. So um, I think what we can bring in with DigiClim um, is really that we make it operational. So you have an existing program, we just tap into it and we make it um, visible what you're actually financing in a, in a matter of um, weeks rather than months or years. Thank you. And we've got one final question from online, which is there's a lot of data collection. We've talked a lot about this. Can you give us a concrete application of that? So an example um, that GeoScan utilizes. Okay, okay. I, ju I, I just got the question. Yep, thank you. Uh, well, the GeoScan is very much tailored to effort internal needs. So we, 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 we tailor it to specific cost of design. The cost of is a country strategy in effort, which uh, is very much GIS based. We do have climate, environment, social, economic, demographic data, all standard components of the cost of initial screening, basically saying where we should uh, invest uh, based on a climate, uh, rural population, land use type of priorities within the countries. So uh, initially the juice can was uh, entirely focused for the uh, country strategy uh, overview design or cost of design. And then can be, let's say, downscaled for a particular project design, and hopefully with uh, colleagues from uh, RIA and other departments for follow-up uh, supervision missions, uh, m and &E, etc. Great, thank you. Let's give Lubo a round of applause. And, and actually, I just want to say um, to all the teams that came up on stage, um, I thought, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to quickly summarize a complex project and then pitch an active room like this one. So congratulations to all four teams. I'm now very pleased to turn it over to our esteemed lead of the Change and Delivery Innovation Unit, EFAD's own Edward Gallagher, to conclude our team's pitch challenge today. Thank you, Dana, and welcome to everyone. And uh, first, this isn't the first time I've actually heard the pitches, but I could listen to them every day, all day, because the energy and the enthusiasm that comes across, it's not often that you see people smiling, listening to projects being pitched, 
So I think that's something that is not just about energy enthusiasm, it's also about a lot of hard work in terms of storytelling. The team have worked on this. They've also, and this is one of the unique things that I think Gladys and the team have brought in the innovation, is the support, not just in storytelling, but on the coaching on behavioral science and on the coaching on lean innovation, as well as making the practical tools of the UN Innovation Toolkit available. It all makes a difference. And I think we've actually just heard how it makes a difference with the teams that are presented. So today's session has also highlighted the potential these innovations have to deliver impact and results. And most importantly, and it goes to one of the things that was actually said before in one of the earlier sessions, is that some of them are actually influencing policy making and investment decisions, putting data and evidence at the center of the decision making process. So I just want to make four points, some of which, and I think it's my job here today to repeat pretty much everything that everyone else has said. But innovation, first one isn't though, innovation is not only about sophisticated tools or technologies such as blockchain, and artificial intelligence. Innovation is primarily about people originating, testing and scaling up ideas are solutions that solve problems for other people. And for IFAD, the most important innovations are those that impact poor rural people directly. And that's where we want our focus to stay. Second, at IFAD, we, we adopt a test, learn, and adapt approach with the fail fast and cheap mindset, or as our FAO colleague called fast and frugal. Um, and we also use tools and guidelines that focus on impact learning and human centricity. And I think the Change, Delivery and Innovation Unit with Gladys and the team has been successful in creating a space where ideas can be tested and when proven effective, support to be scaled up to achieve impact. And one of the things, just when Lubomir was speaking, I actually asked him, I asked my tough questions in private. I said, this was about getting funding for your idea. What actually did the innovation challenge create? This is your day job. You are a GIS person. Why? What is extra about the innovation challenge? And Lubomir looked at me, honest question, honest answer. He said, no, you're wrong. What the innovation challenge provided me was space to try out new things. I could fail. There are things that I did in the innovation challenge that I would not have done in my day-to-day -day job. I think that is a key thing that I want to just say here today. The other thing is the innovation challenges do make a difference. The team compiled some of the results, and I think Gladys referred to this before. Over 2,600 smallholder farmers reached in four countries, Peru, Nigeria, Sudan, Philippines, an average involvement of 61% of women in pilots of the different innovations, and 27 EFAD team members from the leading divisions were trained in Silicon Valley approach to ensure user centricity, feasibility, desirability, and viability. And as I said, to repeat again, I think that comes across in how they deliver. Although early days and the data is quite small, this shows that replicating and expanding innovative models can help address development challenges on a larger scale, reaching people and communities, leading to long term development outcomes. And four, partnerships, partnerships, partnerships are key to innovation. We've heard it, I think, in every single session, and I'm going to repeat it. You can't do innovation alone, and you'd be foolish to think you could do. So EFAD works obviously with our own based agencies to share knowledge and to co-fund or to look for funding ideas, to scale up ideas. We also, beyond the Rome based agencies, work with the international financial institutions. I think Gladys mentioned it before with the Moonshots for Development Alliance. Um, we also, EFAD will continue to seek opportunities to partner and co-fund initiatives that prove to have potential to deliver better results quicker and higher impact for the poor rural people we serve. So I think innovation has come a long way since our small unit was set up in 2019. From defining EFAD's vision on innovation to rolling out our operating model, our innovation team is constantly working and evolving to improve as we continue the innovation journey while also having fun. Before I conclude, I would like to thank the innovation team and all the teams that have contributed to today's event, and in particular, Gladys and the innovation team. Although on paper, I'm Gladys's boss, what that means for days like this is to get out of our way, keep out of the way, <laughs> and make sure that the, the, he, she, and the team get everything sorted. So thank you very much for that to Gladys and the team. I invite you, if you haven't done so, because some of the questions meant that people do need to visit the stands in the marketplace. So please do so. And thank you very much. I think I've been red carded. Over. So Edward, thank you for well summarizing and I don't think I need to add much more to that. If you haven't already been inspired to visit the ground floor for the groundbreaking projects, please visit. And if you're online, please stick with us. We're gonna take a short break and then we'll be right back. Thank you.
Daria? I mean, good afternoon. It works, yes. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to moderate uh, this session today on uh, um, innovating for well being, where we will explore ongoing work on indicators for indigenous peoples. Indicators play a vital role in capturing the multifaceted dimensions of well being among indigenous peoples. Uh, they help understanding indigenous people's unique needs, their aspirations, uh, their development priorities, and therefore they are key to tailor effective interventions to address uh, their challenges. Both government uh, and uh, uh, international agencies uh, normally collect data to track progress, you know, for example, on the SDGs. However, statistical information uh, about indigenous people uh, is relatively scarce uh, and uh, this lead to their issues uh, being overlooked or hidden in uh, the national averages. Um, this session will provide us uh, with a discussion platform to delve into the latest uh, development in terms of indicators for indigenous peoples and will help us exploring how we can leverage this knowledge uh, uh, across uh, IFAD's diverse portfolio and also beyond uh, IFAD. So innovation is at the heart of our discussion today. And we will share the experience of the IFAD's Indigenous Peoples Assistance Facility, or IPAF, which supports indigenous communities uh, and their projects that implement innovative approaches that directly address their specific needs and their aspirations. So at IFAD, we believe that through embracing new ideas, new methodologies, new partnerships, um, we can overcome the unique challenges faced by uh, indigenous peoples. We also believe that it's through our collective efforts that we can contribute to a future in which the invaluable contribution of indigenous peoples can be fully recognized. Uh, once again, thank you very much for, uh, for your presence here today. I really encourage all of you to intervene and participate in the discussion. But before we dive into the panel discussion, we can take a moment to watch a video on IPAF, the Indigenous Peoples Assistance Facility. And later, we'll also hear from the three regional Indigenous Peoples Organizations who actually implement and manage IPAF. The Indigenous Peoples Assistance Facility is an innovative funding instrument that Indigenous communities can use to find solutions to the challenges they face. The objective of the facility is to strengthen Indigenous Peoples communities and their organisations. It finances small projects that foster self-driven development. At the global level, EPAF is directed by a board of Indigenous leaders. At a regional level, EPAF is co-managed and coordinated by regional indigenous peoples organizations as the implementing partners. In the five cycles of implementation to date, 159 projects have been financed in more than 45 countries, directly benefiting 110,000 people from indigenous peoples communities and mobilizing 12.5 million US dollars. EPAF comprises three main components, empowering Indigenous peoples' grassroots organizations, strengthening Indigenous peoples' networks and linking them with the global Indigenous movement, and knowledge sharing to support Indigenous peoples' solutions. The establishment of the Indigenous Peoples Forum by IFAD, the adoption of the uh, policies of engagement with Indigenous peoples, as well as the establishment of the Indigenous Peoples Assistance Facility, these moves that IFAD has done are going to matter a lot in terms of better respect for Indigenous peoples' rights and knowledge, as well as uh, better relationships and partnerships between IFAD and Indigenous peoples. And we have been able to see changes at IFAD. We have been able to see that our facility has been growing over the years. We have been able to see that the senior management of IFAD 
really listen to our recommendations and to make changes at the regional and country levels. We are there with our voices, through our voices, men and women of indigenous organizations, and we have been united when we make demands and proposals. It's really about uh, creating more spaces uh, for indigenous peoples to engage uh, when they advocate uh, the reversal of historical injustices directed to them. Indigenous peoples have implemented EPA through holistic solutions that are rooted in the values of community, solidarity, and respect for Mother Earth. And they have shown their leadership in the stewardship of natural resources always keeping in mind the generations to come. This facility has served as a successful tool to listen and learn from Indigenous peoples and implement development initiatives, such as improving sustainable agricultural practices, developing new off-farm enterprises, and enhancing market access, developing capacity on Indigenous peoples' rights, revitalizing cultural heritage and traditional knowledge, mapping indigenous territories and cultures, empowering indigenous women and youth, boosting disaster and climate change risk management based on traditional knowledge and practices, as well as preserving and promoting local varieties of traditional crops. The EPAF 2022 funding cycle has a focus on climate change adaptation, resilience and biodiversity and will be supported by CEDA, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency. La alianza de FIMI con IPAF permitió a los pueblos indígenas cosechar saberes ancestrales de acuerdo a nuestros usos y costumbres. IPAF is an empowering tool. Indigenous peoples are given the driver's seat for development initiatives and they can operationalize the concept of sustainable and self-determined development in their communities. EPAF is development with a soul, people, environment, and economics. Hope you enjoyed the video. And now without, and we'll talk uh, about EPAF a lot uh, during this panel discussion. So without further ado, I now give the floor to David Berger, who is advisor on data generation and analysis at IFGIA, to tell us a bit about the experience with developing the indigenous navigator and in general on developing indicators that are relevant to indigenous people, David. Thank you so much, Ilaria. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's an honor to be part of this space with leading experts and key voices, particularly in the development of indicators and monitoring for indigenous people's rights, but also to hear more about the impressive work of EPAF and what is being done with indigenous peoples in that co-creation and that real development of projects that address their needs, their priorities. So when we talk about the Indigenous Navigator, it's a complementary process. The Navigator is a consortium. It's led by Indigenous peoples, and it's been working to develop indicators to monitor the implementation gap in regard to Indigenous peoples' rights, as well as to evidence the realities of Indigenous peoples globally. And this is so important when we look at a facility like EPAF, because we have to know what the context is around their situations, particularly in rural areas. So the Indigenous Navigator is a unique initiative that enables Indigenous peoples to monitor and to advocate for their rights using a set of tools that are based on international human rights standards. It's bringing that international network all the way down into the local context. And these standards include the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but also core human rights conventions, including ILO C-169, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, the ICCPR, for example, as well as the SDGs and the outcomes of the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. So we've developed a monitoring framework and a set of indicators that are really quite comprehensive in understanding that. And that comprehensive set of indicators covers 12 thematic domains when we discuss Indigenous Peoples' rights. Those include self-determination, they include lands, territories, and resources, but they also include cultural integrity and education, as well as access to justice and their free participation all critical themes when we start talking about development and really addressing the challenges that they face. 
The framework of the tool, including its core indicators, were developed through a participatory uh, methodology and, and a collaborative process that was led by Indigenous peoples organizations themselves, and that was really critical for us, bringing in human rights experts and development practitioners, but in that co-creation with Indigenous peoples organizations. The Indigenous Navigator was first piloted in six countries in 2014, and it's now operating in 28 countries, monitoring the rights situation for them, as well as with a small grants facility similar to EPAF, where we're assisting over 150,000 beneficiaries. So when we talk about what needed to be done, then we really start to get into some of the challenges that we have. When we wanted to develop indicators that were relevant for Indigenous peoples, we needed to follow best practices with core international or internalization of the international human rights based approach, but the international framework as well. First, the indicators needed to be consistent with international human rights standards and commitments that affirm and protect Indigenous peoples rights. And as a result of that, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was the key document that forms the structure of our indicator framework. But second, we needed to move forward and ensure the active participation of Indigenous peoples. I've said that it was led by Indigenous peoples organizations, but that means that they were leading in every part of the development of the framework, from the translation of the international human rights framework to the acknowledgement of how those indicators should be understood to respect their cosmovision and worldviews. And further, when we started to identify the key attributes of what the indicators should measure, their voices were the determinants in what those key attributes should be and what those final indicators should be as we examined their situations on the ground. In regard to the data collection process, the indicators also needed to have flexibility. And this is because we needed to respect their free prior informed consent, but we also really needed to respect their self-identification. And what that affects is how you choose your units of measurement. It also affects how you structure the indicators themselves in order to be relevant, but also in order to be described in a way that can be translated to individual localized contexts. Because you're talking about that global infrastructure and you're trying to bring it into very diverse, very different situations. So the indicators that we developed were <laughs> encompassing both structural process and also outcome indicators, following the OHCHR's manual on human rights monitoring. But a key demand in the development of the framework and the indicators was to ensure that the collected data could be used by Indigenous peoples themselves in various processes, not only in terms of understanding the situation and the realities on the ground, but also in terms of conducting advocacy and impacting policy development at the municipal level and at the global level and in discussions with governments. Finally, as an innovative tool that empowers Indigenous peoples to monitor and claim their rights, the Indigenous Navigator has been a key resource for us in how we can understand not only their situation, but also how we can really engage with the international system. What I would say is that indicator development is a living process. It's a process that we engage in in order to better understand how we can platform Indigenous peoples, how we can bring their voices to the fore, and how we can really support them in their own self-determined advocacy and development. I think that's probably the, the, the end of my time, but I would just add one small point that because this is a living process, one of the things that we're doing in this year is developing specific modules that are addressing the recent developments in the international human rights framework, including indicators on the Convention on Biological Diversity, expanding what's already there to address the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, adding indicators on due diligence and the impact of business operations in the private sector on Indigenous peoples, and working on better recognition for climate change and the climate crisis that we're facing, including on adaptation and including in response to calls for better engagement around loss and damage. Thank you so much, Ilaria, for the opportunity to present the Indigenous Navigator and to speak more about EPEF. <laughs> Thanks.
thanks very much, David. Thanks to you. And um, now, uh, since I, I just to stay on time, I mean, thanks for the introduction, the Indigenous Navigator, which of course would deserve uh, like hours for being fully explained and presented. But we now give the floor to Miss Eleanor Dick. Tang Bangoa, who is joining us online. I, I see Ellen. Hi, Ellen. Uh, she's the regional coordinator at Tebteba. And uh, hi, Ellen. Can you hear as well? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Perfect. Hi, everyone. And uh, we we have a question for you. If you can tell us a bit uh, about uh, the indicators framework you have developed uh, in the framework of the EPAF, the rationale for developing it and the potential for enhancing a self-driven development along with the challenges encountered. Thank you, Ellen. The floor is yours. And if you have a presentation, I think you, you can put it on. If you can share your screen. OK, thank you, Laria, and thank you for, for this opportunity to share about our initiatives on indicators and indigenous peoples. Um, Tebtaba is an indigenous peoples organization work, working globally. Um, hold on, what happened to my screen? <laughs> Sorry. Working globally. In a... It has um, been, its work has been framed on the indigenous peoples self-determined and sustainable development, uh, which is uh, trying to operationalize uh, a very common perspective for development from indigenous peoples. No? So, um, so it brought these principles of IPSSDD in short uh, in its uh, work uh, and advocacy for for the uh, for a for a dedicated window for indigenous peoples to be able to um, to realize the development that they want, which came in the form of the indigenous peoples window, which was then in the World Bank and now um, the and it is now the EPAF. No, today it's called the EPAF under IFAD. So we are glad with the developments in IFAD and and the EPAF. And uh, let me just briefly run you through the, the core domains and the uh, indicators that we have. We are testing this. It's not perfect, but we are getting something from it. So first off is the uh, land and territories. The first domain is on land and territories, looking into its recognition of the recognition of indigenous people's ownership, uh, the area the land use and it's ch the changes that happened. Second is on natural resources and biodiversity, um, looking into community management, access and use of the resources still there, benefits that they are getting from the resources by the conservation and innovation, persistence of sustain sustainable customary practices and use. Next, please, sorry. Um, third is on economics. So we're looking into the persistence of traditional livelihood systems, access to natural resources again, innovation, livelihoods, um, and traditional resources um, for uh, uh, supporting the economic system. Fourth is on governance, both traditional and uh, the mainstream. So we're looking into the record. Uh, are, are these systems recognizing the rights of indigenous peoples? Recog uh, traditional governance is traditional governance as well recognized. Uh, persistence, um, FPIC, and co the complementation between the systems, among others. Fifth, we go into next, please. Traditional knowledge and culture. Again, this looks into persistence, specifically on traditional occupation, because this is an operationalization of knowledge and culture. Um, it's rec the recognition, transfer, revival, and revitalization of the knowledge. Language as well. Is it still there? Is it uh, being used? How far is it being used? Um, 
among others, we also look into rituals and culture you know, under this domain. Six hell is the, um, looking into, of course, the uh, healthcare providers and what types are what type of providers are there, conditions and health seeking behavior among indigenous peoples, and looking very much into safe drinking water as well because this is something very critical in indigenous people's territories next please um the last three are on gender and intergenerational dynamics indigenous people's rights and community development or the institutional development for gender we're looking uh, in two different areas uh, participation both men and when uh, young people and the uh, women and uh, the transfer of knowledge for the indigenous people's rights our particular about the violation of rights whether collective or uh, individual and cases of discrimination and uh, for the ninth uh, domain um, we're looking into how community institutions or organizations are influencing customary institutions towards appropriate change so these are the nine domains with 32 indicators that we are looking into um and along the way we have found some challenges next please uh yeah so these are uh emit these are what comes to mind uh, when we think of immediate challenges that we are um facing of course, in the case of projects, the priority is always on the project indicators rather than the broader IPSS the indicators that we are trying to um, push. No? So sometimes the significance uh, is not seen by, by partners or maybe they realize it later when the project is already done. Um, of course, there's a question of language and uh like are we asking the appropriate questions or are they are this all measurable as uh like that um is can it be comparable to the academic measurable questions no and uh, of course we have very limited scope and resources and these are all based on self-assessment on the green part of the table um these are just some recommendations which we are trying to do ourselves so we're trying to integrate it in the project uh, we'll see how far we can go rather in integrating this in the due diligence process of the projects uh, under epaf um of course we've been using the most significant stories to just to give a measure of how we have impacted on indigenous people's lives and um yeah it's been we have been encouraging uh, project partners to really integrate this part of this for uh, as part of the project and assessment reports no yeah. so so there it's um the whole work is a, is in progress we, we are further developing this through the CBMIS, the community. Time was also over. So thank you very much uh, for providing all these examples uh, from uh, the TEPTEB experience. Can... It's communities. Uh, Ellen, you are, you are breaking. Can you hear us? I, yeah, I, point. yeah. Hello, am I on? Yeah, can you summarize your Hello? last point so we move to the next speaker because we are. Yeah, so, so we look at this. Um, as a tool no, for communities to start talking about their situations, like the indigenous navigator has said through David, to uh, trigger collective analysis. And more than anything else, it becomes a factual basis 
for communities to mobilize and act on their situations, they being the primary political actors. So yeah, it's a work in progress and we are very much open to collaboration, especially in responding to the challenges. Thank you very much. Sorry for the glitches. No, no problem at all. And I think we, we could listen very, very well to all, uh, just, well, just the final part, but your points came across uh, very clear. And already we see a lot of connection with the work of Gia and uh, uh, yeah, what we mentioned already about IPAP. And now uh, I would like to introduce Margarita Antonio, who is the IPAF Regional Coordinator at the International Indigenous Women's Forum, or FIMI. And uh, she can also share about uh, the indicators that FIMI has developed for IPAF with their potential and challenges, but also uh, with a particular focus on how indicator can contribute to equality. So Margarita, the floor is yours. Hi, Laria. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, sorry that this is only in English because we need this information also in the other languages we use. However, um, let me start by saying that FIMI as a global mechanism that brings together Indigenous women from the different the, from the different so socio-cultural regions. We work in uh, um, globally, and uh, we have four main working areas in advocacy, capacity building, economic empowerment, and uh, leadership development. Um, we recently, in 2021, launched our uh, new strategic plan and our very first theory of change and within this we have like five key performance indicators that we follow and within this from the grant making arm of FIMI we have some specific indicators that are embedded with um, this strategic planning and that we use on a daily basis um, you can see it and uh, we find that many of the numbers and indicators we have placed are similar to those used around by different organizations, even in IFA, IFA the, um, framework. However, I want to take time to um, go deeper into what are our learnings. Um, Working with indigenous women organizations, I would say that only in Latin America, we have this um, working approach with IP organizations and not specific indigenous women organizations under the IPAF agreement. However, an effort is there and uh, we are very grateful for the way organizations in Latin America respond to our um, insistence and our um, continuous um, reflection on getting indigenous women on board, getting the leadership of indigenous women being speakers and being visible in the project implementation. So our learning has to do with accompaniment an accompaniment that is at all step from the very beginning of thinking on the project, preparing the project, um, preparing the agreement and all the implementation period. And uh, we find that sometimes organizations think that they um, only if they really need it they will come for say let's get some support but when we have trust and open dialogue and relationship this type of support flow more easily and with this we also identify the role capacity building play in all the process 
Accompaniment also become a way of contributing to capacity building as we develop training and work together and learning new methodologies, providing tools, and the learning going both ways for us and for our partners. So it's a joint effort. And when it comes to understanding, monitoring, and evaluation, we find that we really need to have a common understanding, have clear clarity on what an indicator means, what it is we want to document, and how we can have a constant documentation. This effort is ongoing and we try to adapt our tools to the context of each region and also try to have collective information, general information that can document institutional need. With the learnings, we also have the challenges that um, we want to share in this opportunity. Capacity is always a challenge. Building a framework, a, a log frame, building a timeline, building a detailed budget, and understanding how this log frame relate with your implementation. So while we think that I'm just going to wrap up, while we think that numbers collections are very important, sometimes numbers only reflect a specific project and we want further changes. Indicators are priority, how we build indicators together that are meaningful for organizations, for community and for institutions and how we learn together to use, do a better use as all the instruments that are there, this um, navigator that David is presenting and other tools that are available and we just don't use them because we don't know they are there, put them uh, available for organizations and for leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margarita. That was, uh, I mean, for us and the team working on EPAF, uh, these are very uh, uh, challenges that we are all very familiar with and very, very, very important. And now we'll hear the last of the EPAF experience. So I give the floor to Jack Macharia, who is the EPAF uh, Regional Coordinator at Sambuya Women Trust. So hi, Jack, um, to share about the challenges in developing indicators to monitoring indigenous people's well-being and also her views on how to measure traditional knowledge. So Jack, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ilaria, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think I want to sort of pivot from what uh, Margarita has just spoken. I think I'll, I'll pick up from there because that is actually some of the talking about the challenges. That is exactly where you know we 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 start struggling with when we are talking about indigenous people's well-being and indicators that you know um, can be measured. I think one of the things I want to say is you know a point of clarification is that in monitoring and measuring impact, it's not just to show donors and partners, but it's to assess the well-being of indigenous people, you know, and this means sometimes that there's conflict on what type of indicators to use, you know, but there's also several points of convergence, you know, and defining this from the onset is both important. I mean, it's important and can be achieved. And one of the things that Margarita mentioned was, you know, sometimes we have very standard and rigid ways of um, developing indicators, and our experience has also been the same that you know in measuring and monitoring impact two areas are mainly focused on but you know i mean one of one of those areas being the quantitative area putting emphasis on numbers you know and where the numbers are not sufficient you know then it's assumed that impact is not worth pursuing you know so that's one area i feel like you know we have a huge challenge that the emphasis is always how many how much you know, I've been in sessions where when I'm presenting data on the EPAF, you know, most people will respond back and say, 
but that's very small. You know, it's 300 households. I mean, how do you make a difference in 300 households, you know? So, and that tells you the, the thinking that goes behind how we think about uh, monitoring and measuring impact. But the second area for me that I have noticed as we work with the EPAF is the intangibles. And you just mentioned one of them, which is, you know, traditional knowledge and practices and indigenous ways of knowing and spirituality. How do you measure spirituality? And yet it underpins all the work that, you know, uh, indigenous people, I mean, this sometimes is the basis of why they have the results that they have. And I'll give an example. I mean, in Northern Tanzania, the Maasai community, uh, one of the Maasai communities that lives there, live in this forest that has two blocks and one is managed uh, by the community and one by the local administration. And the difference between the two forests is so noticeable that you can actually see it as you're approaching the forest. One of the er things you will see that is noticeable is that the forest that is managed by communities has a very thick undergrowth. You know, it's very healthy. You know, you can tell by just looking at the trees. But when you look at the one that's managed by the local administration, you know, there's a lot of deforestation that's taking place there. There's very little undergrowth. And when you dig deeper to find out why there's these differences, it's because the community managed forest is a sacred site. You know, the Maasai, um, depend on certain trees and leaves and the backs of trees that is critical for some of their ceremonial practices. And as a result, they take care of that forest because that affects their ceremonies. So basically, if they stop those practices, then the forest is at risk, you know. Um, but when you look at that from, say, a perspective of a scientific or, you know, um, when we look at it from how we measure impact, is you'd think about that undergrowth as productivity, which tells you that the soil quality is actually good, you know, but that's not how the communities look at it, you know. A second uh, example I'll probably quickly share is, you know, when we think about pastoralism, communities that practice pastoralism support landscapes that also hold wildlife. You know, without that practice, you find that the land goes through a lot of fragmentation, and it affects wildlife corridors and increases human wildlife conflict. So again, those are underpinnings that, you know, most of the time you'll not find them being discussed when you're talking about indicators. And, and thus they are undervalued sometimes. So, and I think it is important to value them in their current form and not undermine them because quantitative measurements are not always just the only way that we can actually be able to measure impact. There are other ways that we are able to measure impact. And EPAF collects a lot of that qualitative data. I think it's time to figure out how do we bring it to the forefront? You know, how do we make sure that we are discussing what are the drivers? What's the underpinning of why, say, for example, this Maasai community managed forest, you know, is healthy, you know, um, and the one just right opposite is, you know, not doing so well. I mean, those are the critical things that we look at. And in EPAF, we actually do collect these uh, types of data. But I've also, like I said, noticed that it's most of the time not really valued, but we continue to put both in emphasis, both quantitative and qualitative data. Thank you very much, Ilaria. Jack, uh, that was, uh, I mean, I think in the Q&A session, we can pick up a lot on, on the points you made. Um, I would like now to invite uh, Mrs. Tania Eulalia Martinez Cruz, who is the Indigenous Peoples Water and Food System Indicators expert at FAO. Thank you very much, Tania, for joining us. We know you had a very busy day, so we are very grateful for you <laughs> to join us here. And um, Tania uh, will discuss about we can, how we can co-create indicators uh, and indigenous-led indicators and data, especially to inform policy processes. Um, for example, the Coalition on Indigenous People's Food Systems, but also other type of policy processes. So Tania, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to be in part of this conversation because I see we all agree that we need to think of metrics and indicators in a different way, especially when we're talking about indigenous people. So um, uh, I think especially now that we are facing different crises with insecurity, climate change, displacement and conflict that we are learning 
I'm going to speak about food systems because that's my speciality. We know that we cannot keep business as usual. While we can recognize that there's been a, a lot of steps forward in recognizing the role of indigenous peoples, they have become more visible um, and they are acknowledged, especially in this era of crisis, as resilient people, um, keeping 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity, in, even though we represent 6% uh, of the world's population. Uh, still, when we think of the metrics that the World Bank portrays, for example, they say that 15% uh, of the poorest are indigenous peoples. It's paradoxical to think that despite all the richness that lies in indigenous territories, still we are put in this position of being some of the poorest peoples in the world. Even though developing practitioners have tried to understand many of the roots uh, that have caused poverty and the drivers affecting indigenous peoples, we have failed to describe a lot of these drivers because especially when we are listening to the narratives in international development, indigenous peoples are put or portrayed as vulnerable people. And we say, no, we are not vulnerable, but we are put into this category because there are many drivers that have uh, pushed us to the margins, into that state. But how do we change these things? How can we influence policies that can better uh, help us in changing, in enacting our self-development? Um, so uh, like, like with the World Bank, uh, when we talk about metrics on poverty, uh, many times those are related to monetary terms. And I think I'm going to echo some of what other of the previous speakers have said before, that we have to think of other factors like self-sufficiency, uh, the strong community ties, the collectiveness of, 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 of communities, the values of solidarity and reciprocity, spirituality that cannot be put into many of these terms. There's a lot of... a uh, or, or lack of disaggregated data on indigenous peoples that make us invisible in many of these large discourses of development. Uh, and even just like the estimate of how many we account as part of the world's population is not clear. We say there are 476 millions of indigenous peoples in the world, yet these numbers are probably not the most precise yet. So, but as we are also conscious of uh, that the numbers can also uh, have a negative effect on policies, uh, we also have to take opportunities when we see spaces, political lobbying. And one of these was during the United Nations Food Systems Summit, uh, where indigenous peoples were recognized and acknowledged as game changers, as knowledge holders, because that's also the other tricky part. I'm really happy to see that many initiatives are being led and worked in terms of generating disaggregated data with indigenous peoples, because we need that data to influence these different processes. So during the United Nations Food Systems Summit in 2021, uh, thanks to the leadership of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, several indigenous organizations, several UN agencies, including IFAD, member states, we advocated for the coalition on indigenous peoples to strengthen our food systems, our knowledge systems, while also committing to support the world to tackle many of the pressing um, struggles and challenges that we are facing these days. So what is relevant for the work of our coalition is that because we want to influence policy processes that affect our livelihoods, we also need to acknowledge the role of science, metrics, and indicators in providing feedback to these processes, but we have to question what knowledge, what indicators, how do we create them? How can we create them in such a way that it's appealing and speaking in the terms of the self-development that we want to take? So um, what we're doing within the coalition is uh, working closely with a platform in FAO that is called the Global Hub on Indigenous People's Food Systems, which is a knowledge platform that brings together indigenous and non-indigenous scientists and knowledge holders, because we have to also think of science and the way of creating, generating data in a different way. And what we're trying to do is gather that information to inform different uh, policy processes. The coalition, um, I invite you that we're going to have the stock taking in three weeks and we're going to be presenting the work of our coalition, the ways that you can join and create synergies with us. 
we need to generate evidence if we want to influence policy processes on the school meals, on restoration, on the use of uh, toxins on pesticides, just to mention some of the key lines that we are already working with. Uh, but we need to create or generate that data that is appealing and based on the terms that can help us in the self-development that we want to pursue. Um, I think this is what I want to say. I have probably some minutes left, so I want to leave it more for discussion. I see like there's many uh, potential uh, synergies that we can create, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tanya, and actually thanks to all the panelists um, for your like, valuable insights and contributions. And I think now we can open the floor for comments, uh, both from the floor and uh, online. Okay, so, so far, for, from the floor, there are no comments online yet. And maybe please, can you introduce yourself? Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse Hawks, and um, I have done a lot of international development work, uh, behavior change communications in Rwanda, where I had a chance to work with uh, the community of potters, uh, the historically marginalized groups there. Uh, I'm curious about the youth from uh, the indigenous communities and um, the uptake of data in YouTubing and social media and that kind of influence on um, spreading the message and also how it's uh, galvanizing communities today. And if that is, um, if there's a conflict among uh, communities, uh, indigenous peoples uh, related to that, or if it's seen as a positive. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for your question. I think uh, David will kick off and then uh, if other panelists want to have a say. Want me to, want me to offer a very, uh quick example, but in our work in Cameroon, one of the key issues identified was lack of citizenship documents, which prevented them from accessing any social services. And in response to that, we developed a project which was implemented to mobilize local courts and bring them out to the communities in order to hold the legal proceedings to issue those documents. But the youth engaged to make music videos and they engaged not only on YouTube, but also within the Cameroonian kind of uh, music space in order to popularize their language, the issue that they were facing, who they were as indigenous peoples and navigate identity politics, and to present the project that they were developing and implementing, and then also developed a documentary. And that was done together with traditional leadership with the local youth and with the communities that were affected. So just as a very tangible, I'd be happy to share a link to the YouTube video uh, after the event. Thank you very much, David. Is there any other input uh, from the panelists? If not, we can see if there are other questions from the floor. I keep... Ilaria, maybe I would just oh, okay. like to add yeah. that. Please. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Margarita. We can hear yes, you. maybe just add that. Um, Indigenous people, indigenous women, girls make they 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 self visible with these contributions, and it is uh, also a very important resource in leadership transition within organizations as uh, leaders rest upon these abilities and capacity that the youth bring to the movement and to the organizations. Thank you very much. Yes, that was an important point. I think. We have now another question from the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ilaria, and everyone for this great event. I was, uh, my name is Akiko. I'm a partnership officer working in IFAT. I, I, I learned a lot about indigenous people this, from this event, especially the importance of developing indicator and also some of the challenges that you are facing. I was just curious about um, if there is a situation where the, the national based data and the community based data uh, originated by this kind of indicator sometimes are uh, uh, in conflict or different and in such case what would you address this difference and what would be your recommendation to the policy maker or international organization like us in this kind of situation thank you very much Uh, 
um, I guess uh, David, I, I don't know if someone online wants to pick it. Uh, David also has, uh, has some feedback. You can kick off and then maybe. I think maybe from our work together with Ellen and also uh, in the Philippines with Teb Teba, but um, also in our broader work, there are often times where we see that the community generated data is at odds with the official narrative or the official statistics. And oftentimes when we present that alternative data or community generated data, there is pushback from duty bearers whose obligation is to fulfill those rights saying, well, we are already doing this. We have these wonderful programs that are protecting those rights and fulfilling our obligations. Um, as we heard in the previous session, where the land uh, monitoring project presented about the difference in the Philippines specifically between the official recognition and what the communities were reporting around land tenure and the land SDGs. This is a key example of how that can occur. And when that happens, we need to look at it in a constructive light. It's an opportunity for dialogue to say, Yes, but then why isn't the community aware of those initiatives? Yes, you're reporting that this data, where are you, you know, collecting this data from and where is it being developed and held as official statistics? Why aren't the voices of these communities being included? Why haven't they been brought along in that process? And how can we work together to bring those two narratives to a space where we can try to address it? Um, so that might be a partial answer. I think maybe Ellen and, and the others online can, can also um, add to it. Elena, Margarita, Jacques, or Tanya, do you want to add? Yeah, go ahead, Elena. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry, my, my, my computer, my connection is unstable. I hope this will hold through. Yeah, um, I didn't quite get the question because of the unstable connection, but um, let me let me respond according to what I got from the from before I got disconnected earlier. Uh, so yes, yeah, so there was, for example, one instance. This is not covered by by any initiative except for, uh, by any of our projects, except that we uh, we supported their own initiated initiated mapping because they wanted to apply for. Uh, what they called is in the Philippines, we call it certificate of ancestral domain titles, which is provided by law. Um, despite indigenous people's resistance to the concept of trying of asking the government uh, the titles to your land, because we believe that we are entitled to it. Anyway, they went through the process, they went through the process, the legal process, just to make it um, official. No. Um, but along the way, there are mining claims which are contesting the ownership. So what the community does is um, bring the maps. They did their own maps. They bring the maps to the government to the dialogue and show that these mining claims are within. Oh. Yeah, we are losing you, Ellen, unfortunately. So, so yeah, it becomes um, an advocacy tool, as well as a proof, uh, uh, an own a proof that the indigenous peoples know their arguments against whatever is um, uh, contravening their their claims to to the land and to to the own to the resources that they own. Thank you very much. I think we have very few minutes left. Or maybe I can pick uh, one. If I, there are no questions from the floor here, I can pick one from Zoom, uh, which asks that uh, if there are there are any initiatives uh, that allow indigenous people to identify and define their own indicators, uh, to assert uh, their own worldview, and to measure the results uh, or impact uh, of assistance interventions to their community, uh, to their territory. Uh, so this is one question that came on Zoom. Uh, I, I guess maybe, um, maybe someone, you know, on the EPAF uh, experience, someone can bring it. But also David has been a bit explaining how the uh, the indicators have been uh, co-created with indigenous peoples. But maybe, I mean, some of you wants to respond. 
Hello? Hello? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the, the initiatives are in the. Ellen, do you want to try to switch uh, camera and off? Support. Maybe we can hear your voice uh, better. And uh, I think that's what matters most at the moment. Uh, you can try to switch camera off and we see if we can hear you better. Let me just put off my video. Yeah, yeah we can hear you. The community monitoring and information systems that I, I was talking about. That the you know collating data about their community, and it was uh, a space to to talk about what knowledge remains there with the resources with the land and what is lost, and so that they were building the. Uh, the result of that was uh, what you call this um, um, uh, a community discussion on what, how do would they respond to that situation, to their situation, given the data that they collected. Um, at the immediate is to create or develop a community protocol. Uh, protecting the resources left uh, from the uh, from the community members as well uh, but more especially um from the from outsiders who come in no? so these are just examples where their uh, community initiated data initiated systems information systems uh including indicators because they know their own indicators they know when a tree dies they know what what it means for a tree to die um, in relation to the weather. They know um, what kind of birds are there on these seasons, and they um, they are uh, they have their own indicators to you know um, to read <laughs> their the environment and if their land or resources are degrade degraded. Um, and this I think are very. Um, good examples of pe indigenous peoples having their own indicators and trying to bring it out of course they are very specific so we have to be uh, indicators has to be in context uh, contextualized as well um based on the community's perspectives and how they read things how they see things um yeah i think that's that's all Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. And we could hear your point very well. So I think uh, it's good it came across. I think we are, we, our time is over. I'm supposed to have the difficult task of summarizing all this discussion, which uh, I'm not sure I will be able to, but probably I will pick one, one, I mean, building on the last point from Ellen, I would pick uh, uh, one of, uh, I mean, if I had to, yeah, to summarize some key points, one is definitely community-based monitoring is important and it's something we can do more in our project. I mean, we see there is a trend overall in development projects towards improving methods for community-based monitoring, but there is long, also a long way to go. And I think this is a sort of a call for action for for all the development practitioners. Then for me, other point that um, came across as key, one is definitely the importance of co-creation uh, and linked to that, the fact of ownership. So it's important uh, to work together uh, and, and create uh, jointly. So with respect to monitoring the processes, tools, uh, everything uh, related to um, all the project aspects. Then uh, also that learning in, in this process is learning goes both ways. So um, capacity building and any form of learning really goes in both directions. So we were talking about um, the, the fact that sometimes uh, requirements for, from donors are very rigid. 
And there is, I think, a lot of room for learning also on the donor side. Uh, the other aspect important on indicator, I think, is flexibility. Not all these uh, indicators are always living processes. And uh, we saw examples also of the navigator now integrating uh, the new indicators related to biodiversity, for example, private sector. I mean, they, they really need to be flexible to, to integrate uh, all new uh, issues uh, coming uh, up. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the importance of not being too much focused on the quantitative aspects, but really on the qualitative and especially to measure indigenous people's values, which are often not attached to numbers. And probably last but not least, uh, in the role of indicators for advocacy for policy outcomes uh, and not just, uh, just for measuring the project related results. So I think with that, we can end this session. I thank you very, very much, uh, all of you, for participating, and in particular, our very knowledgeable panelists. And uh, yeah, I hope we, uh, on our side, uh, with all the panelists here, we'll, we'll continue this discussion very soon uh, because we are working on strengthening the EPAF uh, indicator framework. Thank you very much.
name is uh, Giacomo Cavalli, Relationship Manager at Caripro Factory. And today I will moderate the panel Collaborate to, to Innovate and Impact at Systemic Level, organized by Caripro Factory. What is the difference between innovation and collaborative innovation? And how it is related to impact? Impact is based on the fact that the same idea generation is the fruit of a participatory process in which different actors working together can make the difference for a final result. Grow is at the base of innovation and that's its natural goal, but collaborative innovation has a special grow embedded. Three key characteristics, sustainable, strategic and societal innovation. Let's focus on this last piece of innovation. Economic growth has lifted 100 million of people out of poverty and improved the lives of many in the past half century. But it's increasingly clear that a model that is not including a perspective broader and focus only on economic process is incomplete a model that fails to meet human needs, equip citizens to improve the quality of life and protect the environment and provide opportunities will not succeed. This type of growth that we're talking about includes sustainable and strategic, of course. Simply, it improves economic growth and leads to long-lasting changes. This process was very well designed in 2015 when the Sustainable Development Goals were, were born and uh, they represent our compass, but responsibilities are spread and everyone has a role to play. Very often, and this is one of the problem, there is a, 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 a comp an understanding problem between the people, that the language spoken are different. <laughs> besides the fact that the targets are exactly the same. So design a collaborative innovation process that include all this language is a difficult asset, but is a, ne a necessary one. Putting it in practice means indeed catalyzing the different languages into universal one. And strategic collaboration and partnership between uh, public institution, research, organization, academia, private sectors, even competitors, startups, third sector actors, represent the key of this kind of collaboration. And this is especially crucial when we're talking about the food system, that a sector so strategic for our future. Innovation and sustainability in the agri-food sector are indeed the real keys, the turning point for human and earth. Collaborative innovation involving empowering rural people and the entire value chain, providing new tools and solution while ensuring a solid infrastructure could be the bedrock upon which we can build a solid future. Collaborative innovation is what we're trying to do and we are achieving at Caripro Factory since our foundation in 2016. Today we speak about three projects that will navigate through the different side, but before that I will leave the floor to uh, uh, our keynote speaker. I'm honored to introduce to you Ms. Beatrice Covassi, member of the European Parliament represent the House of uh, European Democracy. Ms. Kovasi has more than 20 years of experience as a European diplomat and a deep expertise in the policymaking process. Among other roles, she has been the head of the European Commission representation to Italy, the first woman in that position. Ms. Kovasi, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Giacomo. It is a pleasure to be here uh, with you all at IFAD and to open this session. Um, I'm just sorry I couldn't be physically with you uh, today because uh, we have uh, committee week in Brussels. And uh, thank you for your very inspiring words on uh, cooperative uh, innovation. Um, I think this uh, idea of cooperation enables and empowers innovation in different ways is also at the heart of what we're trying to do at the parliament and what as politicians uh, uh, we should learn better to do sometimes. Um, However, I think it's not simply innovation for the sake of it, of course, but, uh, that we will share experiences on. It is indeed innovation aimed at generating impact, prosperity, better food systems. Uh, and this is the kind of innovation that puts people at the center. 
um, a few remarks on uh, the topics you will uh, uh, touch upon uh, and also from my perspective, uh, uh, my experience from the digital uh, uh, domain. The first is the closing the digital divide. Indeed, uh, putting people at the center of a digital transition is a key priority for Europe, but it is a hard goal to, to accomplish with the current digital divide. Internet use uh, has now reached 93% in high income countries, uh, but just 36% in the least developed countries. And before joining you, actually, I was speaking of the industry committee. Uh, because I'm shadow rapporteur, which means rapporteur for my political group on the new gigabit connectivity legislation. And indeed, uh, one of the big issues that we are facing uh, is also in Europe the fact that the new high speed inter internet we're trying to, um, to achieve uh, um, risks to leave behind uh, a lot of people, rural areas, but also uh, less favorable. Uh, um, society, part of the society. And indeed, this is even more true for developing countries. So the digital divide hits the most vulnerable, the elderly, people with disabilities, women, especially those in rural areas. And all these categories are being left uh, uh, behind. I've had recently launched a study on digital divide and digital gender inequality in Latin America highlighting how lack of connectivity can have an impact of, on inequalities that rural women already have to endure. And I think this perspective is, is a key challenge that everyone in the innovation and development space would need to consider. Um, it is true that, I mean, you can be judged and measured only by how far, you know, the lowest part of a less privileged part of your society goes. Uh, and uh, that is uh, a token for judgment of uh, you know, societies and, and, and politicians in the like. Um, the second, I mean, highlight I would like to uh, provide today is about artificial intelligence. Again, it's something which will impact us all. Um, it is an area we have been discussing very much of the European Parliament. Uh, and um, as today we touch upon different models uh, of innovation management, uh, I think that uh, this kind of uh, revolution that comes also from AI is something which has uh, to be taken into account. Uh, and also a bit provocatively thinking that, you know, sometimes innovation comes also from institutions. Uh, in my long uh, uh, career on, on digital issues at the European Commission, the sentence I have been writing the most in my briefings, in my, you know, um, in my also legislative acts before was like Europe is lagging behind. Well, for the first time, maybe, you know, on artificial intelligence, Europe is ahead. And as you know, we're trying to set the first uh, rules uh, worldwide for uh, finding a human centric approach to artificial intelligence. Um, of course, they're not perfect. Of course, they can be debated and discussed. Uh, we're negotiating them now but they will be a benchmark. They will be, again, an example of, uh, you know, how we have to measure all innovation, uh, technological innovation, you know, the progress it can unlock uh, by also the effects on the human being, the human-centric approach, uh, what I call digital humanism, you know, and the respect of citizen rights and fundamental rights. In other words, innovation and change has always to truly work for the people. So in conclusion, uh, I think you can see how innovating for impact can take many shapes and does have several challenges to overcome. Um, but I think this reminds us how important it is that no one is left behind uh, and uh, at times when the piece of this innovation is, keeps growing. And I look very much forward to the discussion and hearing the experiences from innovation uh, in developing co cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kovassi. Uh, uh, inspirational speech, and you're right. Innovation comes also from an uh, institution. All, I should say it must. We must work together. And uh, uh, you highlight the precious role that uh, public institutions play in uh, a collaborative innovation framework. So now I will move to the panel. Uh, three different projects uh, designed to really create solid and inclusive growth, to create impact 
through innovation, to create effective synergy through open innovation, to create successful outcome through an approach capable of stimulating fruitful collaboration while providing a solid framework that contribute to building a fair, resilient and inclusive society. Let's start with the, the as we are in the European space, with the EU-funded project FoodClick. Projects represent an answer to European challenges to ensure the availability and consumption of healthy, affordable, safe, and sustainable produced food, and imagine to scale its action on a broader level. We will speak about it with its project manager, Jacqueline Burrs, Professor of Innovation and Communication, Health and Life Science, and Director of the Athena Institute at Bray University, Amsterdam. A real community builder. So, Jacqueline, mm. FoodClick is an ambitious project. Tell us a little bit more about its origin, its composition, and yeah. uh, uh, its targets. Yes. I hope um, I'm still muted, I guess. Huh? Oh, no, you can hear me. Great. Yes. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you very much for inviting me and, and especially to tell more about the food click project, which I think it, which has quite a unique approach and is uh, very much in line with what you call the collaborative innovation and moving towards a sustainable and fair society. Um, but it's a bit of a complex project, so I have uh, prepared some slides which I like, would like to share um, to uh, help the audience uh, follow my, uh, my story. Uh, I hope this works. So I'll now do the share screen. Um, and I will go into full presentation mode. Uh, can you see it now? Can you see one big slide? Yes, or do we do. You... Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, well, I'll start with the beginning. Um, food click starts from the observation that the current food system is facing a range of persistent problems. And um, I have listed a couple of those here. Undoubtedly, they are familiar about, of course, the environmental pollution, poor animal welfare, but also in the health field, overweight and obesity, and in the social field, the low incomes of farmers and farm workers. And the problem is that these these problems put real pressure on several of the values we consider important in our food system, such as sustainability, diversity, health and welfare, and fairness. Now, the root causes of these problems can be found in the food system itself, the way it is structured and organized. And our current food system was shaped during the 50s and the 60s in the global fight against hunger. Very important. All policies and programs were geared towards enabling the food system to produce large quantities of food at low cost. And at that time, the type of agriculture that was thought to be the solution was intensive large scale agriculture with high yielding crop varieties and uh, animal breeds using a lot of chemical inputs. It also led to a food system where power accumulated in the hands of a few groups, causing asymmetrical distribution of cost and benefits. Hence, we see this growing pleas for a fundamental change in the structural, functional and relational aspects of the food system. In other words, we need food system transformation. Now, food system transformation is not at all easy to realize. The food system is characterized as a complex adaptive system, and such a system has many interactions and routines with intricate feedback loops. And this makes it very difficult to predict the impact of innovations in the system, particularly those that are not optimizing current practices, but aim to change the system. Although a complex adaptive system is capable of change, it is also highly resilient. In order to maintain stable, of course, we need to be resilient towards crises and other shocks. But as a result, few innovations that aim to transform that system scale out or scale up. They simply get stuck. They're in lock-in. Now, the EU-funded project FoodClick focuses on the urban food environments to realize food system transformation. 
And food environment is a very important crossroad in the food system. It's where food supply and demand meet. In food and food environments include retail, such as supermarkets, uh, hospitality, such as restaurants, um, but also institutional environments, such as canteens in schools and um, agri-food environments, things about farm shops or uh, urban gardens, uh, things like that. And um, FoodClick aims to create food environments that are empowering citizens to access healthy, sustainably produced food. So making the healthy, sustainable choice the easy choice for people, especially for those that are currently food deprived and vulnerable. Uh, but the quick, the big question, of course, is how to accelerate food system transformation, given all these complexities I just talked about. And to do that, um, FoodClick has designed an, an, agri an architecture at city regional level. So within city regions, we strengthen so-called food policy networks. And these are groups of stakeholders that operate at this science policy practice interface. And FoodClick Click supports these networks in developing, first of all, a city regional food strategy. And that includes a future vision and an innovation agenda. And the innovation agenda is then implemented in so-called living labs to generate evidence on which innovations work and which don't uh, in relation to transforming the food system and specifically the food environment. And the evidence then feeds into food policy and planning processes of municipalities and metropolitan authorities in order to support scaling up and scaling out. And uh, we are setting up these architectures in uh, eight city regions in different countries in Europe. And then midterm, we will expand to another eight city regions, but not only in Europe, that will also be in Sub-Saharan Africa. Although these city regions have not yet been selected, but that will be late, done later on. Well, this gives you in a nutshell already a bit of an idea, I think, about what FoodClick is about. <laughs> Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you very much. Pretty clear indeed. Uh, you've been mentioning in the last part of your uh, uh, intervention, the food policy network and the expansion of those networks also uh, yeah. outside uh, Europe. Could you tell us a little bit more as they represent the backbone of the projects? Yeah, yeah I would be happy to tell more about the approach because I think we have a yeah, a really comprehensive approach in trying to uh, to to make the change possible. and. Um, our approach is carefully designed and based on, on also lots of um, insights from practice and theory that have come together. And then we have this, this field of sustainability transition theory that gives us very interesting heuristics, uh, steps on, on which we can, uh, can build. And that's what we actually have integrated in, in our food click approach. Um, now, first of all, you already mentioned it about that, that that network building, um, yeah, any process of change starts with the people who are convinced that we need to do things differently, so-called change agents. Um, but given the resistance of the systems I talked about before, a critical mass of people is required, not just a few people, but we really need a larger group of people. People need to come together and join hands. So network building is key. And given the complexity of the food system, this will need to include a large variety of different sorts of actors from government, industry, civil society and academia, and also from different parts of the food system, the different environments. So that makes the quantiple helix. And um, yeah, therefore, in FoodClip, we are building and strengthening these existing food policy networks because they usually are not yet functioning that well they they need to be more rich to actually and, and and stronger to be able to to make those leverage points now these these actors then they have to do things together and one of the first things they have to do together is getting a better understanding a deeper understanding about the food system and also identify all the different initiatives that are already taking place 
and the different facilitators and barriers in the system. And in FootClick, we therefore conduct in each of the city regions a variety of mapping and gapping steward studies. And that is actually the step that FootClick is in now, because we started in September 2022. So um, this is where we are at, but we have a number of other steps to go. And the next thing what we will do is to uh, to um, define. So if you if you want to use the transformative dynamics in the system that are already going on, you, it is important to provide a sense of direction. So to define the desired outcomes at the start. So what sustainable future vision do members of the food policy network share? And the idea is that the vin, that, that vision will function as a lighthouse. But, but can also act as an attractor for bringing in more actors, more supporters. So to this end, FootClick will organize this coming October a uh, range of multi-actor visioning workshops in, uh, in the city regions. Now, and after that, uh, we will identify innovations that could catalyze food system transformation. And given the complex adaptive nature of food system, silver bullets don't exist. They cannot be found. Also, partial tinkering will be ineffective. We know that. So we need to think in terms of sets of smart combinations that when integrated can function as so-called leverage points for transformative change. So really accelerate things. And what these leverage points are differ. It's, it's not, you cannot know in advance in, in the different contexts what will be the exact leverage points. It's something you need to find out together. Um, now, the following step is to integrate all this. So the system analysis, the future visions and the potential leverage points. Um, and it will be transformed into the action innovation agendas. And within FootClick, we will develop those in the form of roadmaps for food system transformation. And this will include various transformation pathways, just not, not just one pathway, but various ones for the short, medium and longer term. And then the road roadmaps will also detail these, these various leverage points we have identified. And those, that, those are the ones that will be tested in these um, experimental settings in the living labs. Um, they will be developed in co-creative design sessions. So again, in this collaboration between the different stakeholders and actors. And so, and, and those, what, that, what we will test will then be monitored and evaluated with transdisciplinary methods. So not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively in order to deepen the learning from the living labs. And then that those learnings will be that, that will be used to inform the development of integrated food policies and in food click we will set up communities of practice with policymakers from the municipalities and metropolitan authorities and so and to ensure that those food policies will then be really integrated because we know that's so critical for having success those were integrated we use the click framework and that's where it actually the term food click comes from that's because we use the click framework to make things click where the c stands for co-benefits between social environmental and economic sustainability objectives co-benefits the l stands for linkages between urban and rural areas the i represents inclusion that means that all stakeholders and their knowledge come together and are integrated and the c stands uh, stands for um Connectivity is the second one between food and other policy areas. So, so it really becomes cross sectoral, not just the food sector, but you can also think of the energy sector, but also very much urban planning, and so on. And these policies, by fundamentally changing then the structure, because it, it changes the rules and regulations through these policies, they will function these policies as, as uh, some kind of top down processes that will support the scaling out and scaling up of those bottom-up initiatives. So we will really get this clamp idea from bottom-up and top-down. And the idea is that that will accelerate the food system transformation process towards realizing these visions of sustainable and fair uh, food systems. 
And of course, whether that works in practice, uh, we will need to find out. So that's why we continuously also have a learning reflexive attitude within the project in trying to see, see whether we are on track. Are we indeed doing the right things at the right moment in the right way? I think. I think. Oh, sorry, Jill. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's fine. These are just the partners that, that are all in the project. So we have uh, 26 partners all over Europe and some uh, also international partners, of course, because we really also link to, to Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you very much. Indeed, uh, you highlighted very well uh, the purpose of the project and how uh, the joint effort of uh, different uh, stakeholders can lead to something that we will measure uh, in really in the coming years. Yeah. So now I move to co-open, a process uh, capable of leveraging systemic growth through innovative approach involving civil society organizations and innovators. It's a participatory open uh, innovation process uh, promoted by Compagnia di San Paolo and the uh, Fondazione Compagnia di San Paolo and Fondazione Cariclo to foster identification of innovative, sustainable and concrete, impactful and technological solutions to meet specific challenges related to sustainable development in Africa. Alessandro Masciadri. Program Officer at Fondazione Cariplo, is Coopen Project Manager. <clears throat> Alessandro, why does Coopen represent an innovation itself? Two actors will really talk to each other together now, thanks to Coopen, because there is an infrastructure. How does it, how does it work? Please tell us more about it. Good afternoon. And first of all, let me thank you, Giacomo, Cariplo Factory, and of course, IFAD for setting this up. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to represent indeed Fondazione Carplo and also Fondazione Compagnia di San Paolo. And to tell you, I, I would say just a couple of things about this process, Coopen. I will try to be as effective as possible. Uh, why is it innovative? Because we have uh, worked very hard and we have tried and I think somehow we have succeeded, as we will see in a few minutes, to bring together actors from different sectors who have different expertise, experience, skills, knowledge, knowledge of the context they operate and facilitate them to work together. So we did not try to invent anything new from the beginning. We just tried to facilitate a process of open innovation indeed. Um, we, I have a couple of slides. I don't know if we can go to the next one, but anyway, the, the point is quite easy. So we have started, thank you, this process uh, from the very beginning, let's say. So from phase one, we have, uh, you see in the slides, these four phases that highlights the, uh, the open innovation process itself. So we started working with the civil society organization, the NGOs, asking them which were the main challenges to be faced in the community they are operating. We were addressing three main topics with the three SDGs uh, in the slide and working in eight African countries. So starting working with the CSOs, we have identified the main challenges and the main needs. They were uh, then part of three different, three specific call for innovators, uh, seven challenges for each of the three topics. And then we asked to the innovation ecosystem, the Italian one, but especially the African one, uh, which solutions do you have to try to address and solve these challenges. We received some applications. In, in a while, we will see some figures about the process. And then together, of course, with the big support of our partners, here in the slide, we have, of course, Cariplo Factory, but also Jenga Lab. Uh, we have selected, we did the first selection of the uh, application, and then we uh, created the first link between the CSOs and the startups to make let them know talk to each other, and then together with the CSO, we identified the matches that we thought were the best ones for the implementation of a pilot process, a pilot project, sorry. So together, NGO and startup, Italian NGO and Italian startup, Italian NGO and African startup from any of actually the African uh, countries, not just the eight ones, uh, they started an incubation or acceleration uh, three months process uh, either in Italy or in Africa, and then they implemented the pilot uh, on the ground. Uh, so they went through phase three and phase four of, of the slide. 
this, uh, as I said, was an innovative process because we really made work together uh, actors that usually, or at least previously, were not that much used to even uh, just talk to each other. So can you imagine working uh, together? Uh, in the next slide, we see just very briefly the numbers uh, of the three call for innovators. Uh, so the, we said three different topics. We received in total 360 business proposals uh, involving many African countries, but also uh, extra, let's say, African and Europe countries. And this brought us to uh, implement, uh, in the next slide, please, um, 20 pilot projects. So these were uh, projects coming from, uh, well, I think was nine projects focusing on food and sustainable agriculture, four on circular economy, and seven on health and well-being. Uh, this made, uh, th these teams were composed by more than 30 civil society organizations and uh, 20 in, uh, innovators, 19 innovators, uh, my bad. So to, to sum it up, we really believe that the extra value in this case was diversity. So the diversity uh, in skills, in expertise, in experience that these actors could bring together made it possible to actually implement pilot and address solutions that were out there for a while. And now they are starting to find uh, some initial answers, at least. Thank you, Sandro. Thank you very much. Very clear. The framework uh, is, uh, um, is an ambition uh, that we are trying to deliver also for the coming for the coming years. So I would like to see the results. And I'll start with um, with the field. Uh, Francis Obita, Chief of Party and uh, Global Focal Point for Agriculture and Food Security at AVSI Foundation. Its Balu from Waste project has been developed with Marula Protein, the first industrial black soldier fly production company in Kampala. So Francis, tell us uh, a little bit more about the project, uh, the challenges that you face and the new opportunities that uh, the co-open framework has provided to you to deliver your results. Yes, good afternoon. Uh... It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to, to really share the experience that we were able to, to have through the, the Copen initiative. Uh, I've seen for years has been uh, working in uh, low and middle income countries to address the issue of uh, high youth and employment, uh, poverty, and uh, other related challenges in uganda where afsi has been operating for many years youth unemployment is at a record high um agriculture is the sector where at least 70 percent of the people depend on for their livelihoods so yet productivity is very low mainly because of lack of access of uh input and then also low no knowledge and skills to engage in the sector. And on the other side, urbanization is really, really happening fast. And uh, so the issue of waste management has really cropped in highly. So when we saw the opportunity with the, the Copen initiative it clicked for us that this is an opportunity to really see how to address some of the issue that issues that we've been grappling with so the challenge was how we could increase the management the utilization of, of solid of solid organic waste in the markets how we could use this as an opportunity to create employment but also increase productivity in the agriculture uh, sector so uh, Marola Protein and a Dutch innovator had for a while been implementing their business model where they used the black soldier fly technology to produce uh, both feed for the animals and then uh, fertilizers for the field. So together with them, uh, we developed this project value from uh, West, which uh, received about 90,000 90, euros funding funding from uh, from uh, funded Fondazione Cariplo and uh, Campagna di San Paolo to implement this uh, project for nine uh, months, targeting four urban markets, and then also trying to create 
employment both for youth to work in in the factory that we we were able to uh, set up and then also to create to become self employees so we were able to recruit 155 youth who were then trained in first of all in a good agronomic practices uh then in the technology of uh the black so the fly and so next slide please so that they can go out there those who can get employment will be absorbed in the factory for that we are targeted 30 15 women and 15 uh, males so we were then able to we were then able to set up four demonstration sites which are going to continue to be available for use to uh, train more more youth and more smallholder farmers across the the community so in a nutshell this uh, collaboration enable us as i've seen to understand better how to apply the technology which we would then see how we can um, scale up and integrate in uh, the different projects that we do have but then most importantly for the farming system fertilizer was being produced on a daily basis at least one metric ton for the market organic solid waste up to five metric ton was being utilized on a daily basis um and then for the youth they were really able to get employed in the the sector and the application of the organic fertilizers and the animal uh, feed really led to increase in productivity both in the livestock sector and the the cropping sector and for that many many CSOs have picked up interest they want to see how they can they want to see how they can also get to know how to use the black soldier fly technology to make more animal feeds as well as uh, fertilizers so that uh, we are able to use that to address the problem of high youth and employment and low productivity in in uh, the agriculture sector so for now we can speak about high availability of animal fertilizers no um, animal animal feeds which is which has been used in the pig poultry and the fish sector and an increase in availability of fertilizers for for the agricultural land and then an opportunity for youth to get into em employment you can see there an agripreneur who was a beneficiary of of the project who, who is now managing her own uh her own production system so for us this innovation really really worked out very well we have picked it up we are integrating it in the different projects that we do have and then also trying to scale it up into other other regions of uh, the country together with the marula protein otherwise for us the learning was uh, was beautiful and we look forward to opportunity of applying this technology and also spreading it and scaling it, it up thank you thank you francis thank you very much uh, it really looks like uh, that uh, this model is uh, sustainable even under an economic perspective and uh, this leads me to the private sector so alessandro kelly co-founder and ceo of apio for the project uh, traceability and product quality system for fresh products in the ethiopian agri value chain it's a pilot project developed together with elvia oh, alessandro we'll be listening to the framework we'll be listening to the civil society organization but which perspective from the private sector side thanks Giacomo for the question thanks also Ifat for the opportunity and also Fondazione Cariplo uh, for follow us uh, in uh, the project and Cariplo Factory for uh, supporting uh, the whole project before answering the question I would like to uh, share some characteristic of, uh, of the project as Apio we implement uh, an end-to-end -end traceability platform for uh, agri-food supply chain called uh, Trusty uh, we in the project uh, we uh, with the uh, LVA that is uh, uh, the ONG we work uh, in uh, Ethiopia in order to deploy the platform uh, in uh, uh, Union of Farmers uh, composed by over 2,000 farmers uh, called Mekibatu 
uh, the project, uh, the objective of the project is to improve uh, um, data traceability, so data information on uh, food traceability for uh, fresh fruit and fresh vegetables uh, in order to uh, improve food quality, but also food security, but also avoid disputes with their, uh, on, on, a, on a contract uh, with their client that, is, uh, that was uh, Ethiopian Airline. Uh, as you can imagine, the project has several uh, technological aspects uh, we use blockchain for traceability, we use uh, uh, application that works offline, uh, we use a lot of uh, uh, technological aspects, but the real challenge in the project was uh, to implement uh, in uh, the country. And uh, in, uh, in this particular challenge, uh, project like Copen, it was uh, for us very helpful because uh, with LVA, we have the opportunity to work in the country with uh, an organization that have uh, any quarter in the country. We can work with uh, an organization that have the possibility to uh, set up training, to uh, make the farmer uh, understand the technology, to make the farmer use the application, understand the, uh, the beneficial of the application, and uh, um, Thanks uh, uh, to the collaboration with Alvia, the project uh, um, have several batches of uh, vegetable tracked with the, with the project. Ethiopian Airline use uh, the platform in order to confirm uh, what uh, uh, Makibatu uh, dispatched to, uh, to their office. And uh, the success of this project uh, is uh, um, measured by the opportunity uh, for Apio to continue to work in Ethiopia with uh, Makibatu, but also uh, the opportunity to continue to work with uh, LVA in other projects uh, for uh, implement uh, the same platform that uh, is suitable for uh, smallholder farmers and for the, this kind of uh, uh, project in emerging country. Thank you, Alessandro. As uh, we were describing before, it's a process that keeps going, is still alive, and it is uh, nice to hear uh, the successful stories uh, give uh, new opportunities. So we get back to Europe now and uh, we go to Milano, actually to MIND, the Milan Innovation District, where once there was Expo 2015. There, there is uh, an innovation driver that's Federated Innovation. It's a network of companies that brings together different actors that are benefiting from the MIND ecosystem are delivering innovation initiatives. Uh, it's a model beyond open innovation that will be described uh, uh, in details by its president. But before we uh, give the floor to him, uh, a short video of introduction. Tommaso Boralevi, Lendley's Chief Technology Officer, is uh, currently Federated Innovations President. Oh, Tommaso, tell us a little bit more about uh, how it was conceived and, uh, most of all, where it leads. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, it's very exciting to be here for me. It's the first time I've uh, learned about uh, this IFAD organization, and I, I think there's going to be many more times that we will work together. So let me give you the, the little insight. So. Uh, because it's a very sustainable concept. We, have, uh, as a land lease, uh, we are private uh, developer. We do urban regeneration, and we had the challenge to take this large area of Milan, where the World Expo 2015 happened, and transform it in a new piece of the city focused on innovation. And rather than first building the infrastructure and the buildings as typical uh, for a regeneration project, we thought, uh, what if we reverse the approach? What if we start from the content and then design the container around it? And then we went a step further and we said, why we don't build an engine? 
And that would be the most sustainable way to ensure um, uh, our growth and especially our survival for the 99 years of the concession of these uh, uh, projects. So what Federated Innovation is, is a business networking engine. So this is very important word, business, because it's driven by the private sector. Uh, networking, because the goal is to connect, as we've seen today, is the key element to um, um, generate innovation. And the goal is very simple, is to accelerate the innovation creation process uh, focused on a physical district as a living lab. I've, I've seen this word used also in the previous project, like food, click, and a few others. So the idea is, let's use a, a, a physical place that is there, that will be there, that will attract um, hundreds of participants. Some of the numbers in the video are already superseded by reality. The, the network is growing and, uh, and it's gonna keep growing, but the key uh, measure for us, the key KPI, <laughs> sorry, the, the double alliteration is uh, initiatives. And the goal is to build projects that start in mind, that use the ability of these multinational companies to attract talents and their top level uh, employees but the goal is to go to kampala you know to, to the site we've seen in the previous videos and deliver there the solution and sometimes it's not only physical i've seen in the marketplace today upstairs a lot of project related to uh, artificial intelligence to observation uh, heard from the ground to software to data so those are the key elements that could uh, connect the two initiatives. Uh, large companies and, and uh, projects related in mind will develop a solution uh, that then will definitely be applicable for us. And um, we have, uh, just to generate some interest and teaser, <laughs> we have uh, 12 thematic areas right now that go, uh, that are built on two main pillars, the city of the future and the future of medicine. We will hear a little bit more later by one of our uh, steam ambassadors that will talk about the agri-food tech and well-being areas. And the goal is to uh, keep working on our innovation agenda. So this is a totally a private, uh, a public and open system. So you can go online, see all the projects, all the hundred plus initiatives that were mentioned in the video. And if you're interested, or if you have uh, pieces and parts that you want to take or collaborate, simply reach out to our organization. We have a um, presence continuous at mine. Uh, so just uh, the invite is to come, to ring our bell, as I always say, and to start uh, working with our organization. Thank you, Tommaso. Thank you very much. So an open invitation to all the stakeholders, public, private, startups, corporations, institutions, to join us in this journey. And uh, speaking about the topics, Sara Roversi, founder of the Future Food Institute and ambassador of agriculture, tech and well-being thematic area. Sara, you know very well the collaborative approach that is at the base of this session, but um, uh, tell us a, a bit more of uh, how it's working inside the machine from your perspective and uh, where we are going to. I love to connect dots. This is my sport. And while you were talking, I was thinking about the journey we have been making in the last 10 years <laughs> and the place where mine is located and about our country, Italy. So if I'm thinking about Italy, Italy is already a big hub for all of that. It's the country that is hosting the three main agencies of the United Nations taking care about food. IFED, FAO, World Food Programme, the country that anyway is hosting uh, and gave the birth of slow food, the largest world movement, taking care about the soul ethic culture about food. Then we were hosting the World Expo, the first one that was connecting four major world world that are pretty important today, feeding the planet energy for life. And I think that all of those dots need to be connected. And I feel that we have a big responsibility. And I'm pretty proud that this project is happening in the former location hosting ESPO. And I think that this is a big mission that we are taking. Talking about collaborative innovation now is an, imper an imperative. Innovation is something that needs to change the status quo for a better solution, a better situation. And we know that now we're facing challenges that are huge. Climate, yes, is a huge challenge. We are changing completely the audience. 
but all of that is facing uh, the largest transformation that we're going to face ai jumping in our life changing completely our interaction with life so all of those challenges mixed together need a complete new approach to innovation so nowadays innovation as future food institute we always said that innovation is a cooperative effort yes but innovation or is collaborative or it couldn't be called innovation and i'm thinking that we all also have been changing the narrative a lot we're changing the vocabulary we're talking about living lives we're talking about ecosystems we are talking about hubs we're talking about connections collaborative platforms everywhere if you think about that, 10 years ago, we had accelerators, incubators taking care about the future of plastic, the future of proteins, or working in a silo. If I'm thinking about mine and federated innovation, the thematic areas are completely interconnected, but also our thematic area, agri-food and well-being, and the two main partners, Selunga and Promocop, they are already two ecosystems themselves. But if we are talking about uh, agri-food and well-being, we're talking about uh, everything else. Energy is interconnected, health is interconnected, mobility, logistics, uh, finance, uh, all of those topics are interconnected. And all of that leads to what's the concept of sustainability nowadays. We probably have been thinking about sustainability just thinking about the environmental perspective, but I think that uh, this ecosystemic approach and collaborative innovation leads to a complete new mindset and framework uh, talking about uh, what we are going to face in the future. And we need to talk about uh, integral approach uh, to sustainability. So talking about uh, integral ecology that needs to connect uh, all the six areas, the political area, the economical area, the social and human area, then of course uh, the environmental and the cultural one. And so we need more and more ecosystems of innovation and players that are able to change completely the mindset and the narrative of innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Indeed, you're right, because uh, that project embeds uh, sites that must work together to create uh, a common framework. The holistic approach is the only one possible. and. Uh, they are trying to build a city of the future with solution for the world of the present. So that's the great ambition of our times, eager to go forward. So uh, we have been listening to the panelists and uh, I would like to open uh, for a short Q&A session, starting from uh, the live audience, if anyone is interested to give some questions to our, to our panelists including those online. No? Okay, so I have some questions here. Uh, I'll start with that. What are key principles to follow when designing an ecosystem with multi-stakeholders? How do you sustain the system change? Who wants to pick up that? Alessandro? I mean, I, I'll just start and then I'm sure you can have a round table if, can, you, if can, you like. Yeah. We uh, could let's talk give about this probably ideas. a couple of days. I think one of the key principles is most likely the ability to listen and be open to what the other stakeholders are bringing to the table. So the, the first part is definitely listening. Of course, everybody has something to bring, but also everybody must be open to listen to what the others are bringing. Otherwise, we will be just telling fairy tales and not going anywhere indeed alessandro what's your point for uh, my point of view um, following the copen project uh, one of the most uh, important uh, aspect is uh, to uh, share specific needs as uh, uh, alessandro said and uh, um, listen to the um, the needs of the startup and take the uh, for from my side the startup <laughs> take the startup in uh, some biggest challenge that they face in their country or in their comfort zone. For example, during the project, we face an acceleration project uh, program. We grow Africa. This is one of the most important incubator in Africa. And this for us was a great opportunity to have a new perspective. So also for the startup point of view, it is very important to um, exit the comfort zone. It's obviously to say the but uh, in a real way. Correct. 
Tommaso? So I would say um, three principles that were really uh, useful for us uh, was focus on clear governance, uh, full transparency, and continuous accountability. Uh, and, and these, um, you know, if you follow this principle, then you go quite far, especially when you have to organize a, a large uh, ecosystem with multi stakeholders, like the question it is, and these are principles that are then valid uh, also in the project implementation phase. So for us, we, we draw, uh, we draw a manifesto which we invite you to uh, to read is on our website and there's 10 points and the synthesis of the manifesto it's uh, collaborate to compete so we try to to push to the limits this model and for me there are some keywords that i think that nowadays are very important the first one is the keyword of competition because here we're talking about cooperating Again, of course, we are working in the business, so there's also competition, but we need to learn how to cooperate uh, while competing. True. On the other hand, uh, I think that ecosystems need to have givers uh, inside uh, the game. You need to be a giver if you want to grow an ecosystem, because ecosystems can stay alive only thanks to generosity. You need people who are feeding the ecosystems. And then to be open to diversity as much as we can, because still i think that we need more diversity in uh, writing ecosystem thank you jacqueline francis yeah i, I would like to um follow up on the listening because i i think that is extremely important and the diversity uh, that we really need to go for a broad inclusion and identify silent voices if we want to go for a fair transition in the food system it is important to identify those and do our best to draw them into the process and not only just to listen but also to actually follow up to, to so be responsive to those expressed needs and ideas um, i think that's that's key if we want to be truly collaborative Thank you, Jacqueline. Francis. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, on our, our part, it's always the commonality of uh, interests where our interests usually intersect because then that allows us to have the motivation and enough uh, put in the level of effort that would, that would allow for, for impact. So we try to see if we share a vision, if, if uh, we yeah, the interest to achieve the same kind of impact. So that's normally very important and it's our starting point. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Thank you very much. I see a question from uh, the public. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm a researcher at CMCC, that is the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. So we mainly deal with climate change. And my question is uh, uh, how climate change should be included in this collaborative approach for innovation? Because we know that is, um, of course, of course, a cross-cutting issue when we speak about the transition toward uh, food uh, sustainability, healthy food. So, how climate change should be included in innovations? Who wants to answer to this question? It's included in all the process I, I have been listening to. It's a must. I think that, and it's not just change. I think we need to change the world because. Uh, the transformation that climate is bringing in our life it's massive we see it every single day and it's going to be so deep uh, as well as uh, ai because nowadays still we don't perceive that but those two elements are going to change completely the space where we live uh, the way where we live uh, the rhythm of our life the risk that we're going to face just uh, a couple of, from our point of view your you know research succeeded really because um, it's so uh, clear that that is one of the items in all the project that is no more a fact is there you know it's interesting because there's no debate like the the big companies that have this approach the collaboration the innovation and want to work in the future otherwise you're out if you don't believe that climate change is everywhere so thank you for your work and ready uh, for our ingrained in, in the system. 
just to send on this uh, regarding blockchain technology and just a suggestion uh, look at uh, regenerative finance uh, and also all the uh, stuff that come from tokenized uh, carbon crazy and so on because uh, uh, there is a lot of interesting uh, also in innovation uh, climate change that link to this uh, communication can i connect two dots very quickly yes. so the first one is back to the previous point when i said it's very important to listen in this case it's even more important because most of the people who are going to be hit by climate change have lower voices so in this case the listening is even on, on top of anything else and the second dot before it was mentioned the importance in ecosystem of giving in this case is giving back because we have taken a lot Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that we are at the end of our conversation and uh, well, I can sum up with listen, dare, share values, cooperation, inclusion. Those are the keywords we've been listening today. That's the framework of uh, collaborative innovation. That it's a process extremely difficult as well as necessary. You need, of course, the right partners. You need uh, the right ecosystem. You need a, someone that is able to translate that into a single stream you need the will uh, but uh, it's the only way forward and today we gave a very interesting perspective of how it can also be successful by uniting different dots different perspective different actors for a future that is uh, necessarily going to that direction so I would like to thank all our speakers, Alessandro Machado, Alessandro Kelly, Tommaso Borrelevi, Sara Roversi, Jacqueline Brers, and Francis Obita. I would like to thank all the partners that has worked with Caripal Factory in, uh, in these years for those projects. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here to tell the stories. And most of all, I would like to thank very much if at the Change Delivery and Innovation Unit for giving us this incredible opportunity to share those ideas uh, and uh, our will to move forward to you and last but not least thanks you all for listening and uh, hope to get in touch with you soon
Did you see the marketplace? Did you see the marketplace? You didn't see the marketplace? Okay. Hello, I know it's been a very long day, but welcome. Um, it's good to see all of you here for this important moment on innovation. Um, and everyone here for our Coffee with the Press partnerships for impacts and scalability at the 2023 EFAD Innovation Day. My name is Helen Papper. I'm the Director of Global Communications and advocacy at EFAD. This open door session uh, is with the press and will focus on the role of partnerships to finance and scale up innovation. We've got an amazing panel of speakers that are gonna give us their various insights. In 2023, EFAD is enhancing collaboration with key partners in the following areas, geospatial information systems, data, innovative finance, and capacity building. We're consistently pushing the barriers in terms of innovation, in terms of how we can all work together for long-term sustainable impact. So we encourage the members here to take this opportunity to ask questions and interact with our esteemed speakers. Just before we get into it, a very, very um, short tidbit uh, of information when it comes to innovation, when it comes to space. We've all in our various capacities and our various agencies as well uh, across the UN have started looking at the capacity of using space as a way to innovate when it comes to finding new solutions to global challenges, especially when it comes to climate change, especially when it comes to rural development. As a matter of fact, in 2019, we were at the Aeronautical Space Conference in Dubai and launched together a challenge to the youth to come up with innovative solutions in terms of rural development um, and, and to be able to test that out in space with NASA, with CSA, with ESA. We were all together for these innovative moments and conversations are happening. And this is just to give you an example of the way that we're connecting dots across silos, across sectors, and who knows, gardening in space for the future of rural development could be the next way that we collaborate together. But let's now kick off the panel and uh, get started. We have the pleasure of having with us today at the panel discussion, uh, Joy Puri. Joy Puri, I'm so used to calling you Joe. She's our Associate Vice President, Strategy and Knowledge Department uh, at EFAD, where she leads the organization's strategy work in EFAD's key areas, targeting agriculture, climate, gender, nutrition, youth, and social inclusion. And before joining EFAD, Joe was head and director of the Independent Evaluation Office of the Green Climate Fund. She was deputy executive director of the International Initiative of Impact Evaluation. So definitely she has a lot to bring to the table and she brings innovation into our work every single day. She's authored several books, uh, published widely on policy guidance, measuring impact and evaluation. And so to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Puri, Joe, we'd like to ask you, to kick it off, how can partnerships at EFAD be leveraged to scale up innovation? Thank you so much, Helen, and please just call me Joe. <laughs> so, you know, one of my favorite quotes is one from Emerson, and it goes something like this. Foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. 
So foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. And the reason I like to think about it is that one of the flip sides of belonging to a, any big organization is that very quickly you can get seduced by this idea that everything should be made into systems which are consistent and standardized across the entire organization. I'm proud to say that IFAD is not one of them. IFAD continues to be agile, to be innovative, and to be thinking about new ways so that we can find solutions to the problems that are clearly manifest and center field for us and for the world today. Why are partnerships important? I'm going to try and give very quickly three examples. Partnerships become important for us because obviously we need to stand on the shoulders of giants, and these are the giants that we all stand on the shoulders of, and we're very grateful to them. But importantly, their partnerships help to build our comparative advantage. My first example is really in the Sahel. In the Sahel, we are working with WFP, with FAO, where we are building new markets. And read my lips. I'm talking about new markets. We're not talking about, oh, let's put out, you know, products that are building on other products. These are completely new green credit lines. They are new financial products in areas, geographies, and countries that have not witnessed these before, but they have become pivotal for us because, as was also spoken about in the previous panel, climate change is a newly recognized clear and present danger for us. So in the Sahel, as part of our inclusive green financing multi-country project and program, we are creating new markets, almost like us discovering that, yes, there's a market for Apple phones. Before they came along, we didn't know that one market existed but now we do. So we are creating new markets for new financial products that are very, very low emission and climate resilient in markets that had not thought about their importance or their need. So that's one. Second, we are collaborating with our partners on evidence on what works, what doesn't, for whom, why, and how much. And why is that important? In East Africa, we were working early on with national governments, and obviously they're very important partners of us. In fact, they're critical. But early on, many governments and many agencies were working with governments to essentially take forward um, a method, a crop for production, which is essentially corn, because it had become the mainstay of production patterns in Eastern Southern Africa, and especially in Kenya. Very quickly with climate change, we've recognized that corn is actually a groundwater depleting crop. And it is against actually the traditional taste of the peoples that occupy many of the lands in Eastern and Southern Africa. We've collaborated then with national governments and sub-national governments, as well as with our partners, uh, the NGOs, as well as indigenous peoples organizations, to then see as to how over time we can change those production patterns away from corn back to what was a traditional crop, cassava. So that's the second. And then the third is really on building data and evidence. And, you know, we've got um, guests uh, from the European Space Agency, and we just signed a letter of intent with them. But it really signals EFAD's commitment to being data driven, to being knowledge informed in the policy advice that it provides to government. So while we are working on a whole lot of new technologies, blockchain, and we are working on carbon markets and carbon credits and um, what, you, what you might have it, it becomes really important that we work with the governments, with those initiatives on the ground to build additional evidence on what is working and what is not. So our impact assessment program works very closely with the governments, with our project management units to tell us where not just where we are succeeding, but where we are failing 
And the F word is really important because unless we recognize that that F word comes to play a very important role in our learning, we're never going to leap forward. So in our impact assessments, we're realizing that, for example, in the short run, we are able to make a huge contribution with respect to food insecurity experience scores. If I has been able to make a huge contribution, but we've not been able to make a huge contribution in the very short period that we have, and this is predicted, but it was important learning for us in the dietary diversity score. And again, this comes about because we collaborate with governments, we collaborate with data agencies, we work and uh, collaborate very closely with Rome based agencies, universities, and other think tanks. Thanks very much, Alan. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And, and that really, really shows the importance of partnerships and the capacity to connect the dots on different areas of expertise to be able to move forward together. Uh, and we have um, uh, the honor to have Pierre Francesco Torizzi, who's here as well with us, the founder and head of partnerships, Global Action Italy. That's an NGO with special consultative status with UN ECOSOC. That's uh, quite a mouthful. Pierre Francesco, at Global Action Italy, you deliver global knowledge to young leaders. And youth, uh, as, as, as Joe pointed out even earlier today, is extremely important in our capacity to drive new ideas, new thinking, new ways to connect the dots on all of this knowledge. So can you explain to us um, why it's so important to support youth-led innovation from your perspective and why we should continue to invest in together? First, first of all, thank you so much for inviting us. And when I, I honestly have to say that here I feel home because uh, for us today, and also when I see all the partners here today, uh, we had the opportunity uh, to work with the majority and we are also working in a project on uh, on space. This year was an, an amazing. Starting from today, we have 10 brilliant uh, university students cooperating today with you, and thank you for this honor. Uh, for us, it's a, a great and real tangible symbol that youth can work inside. Uh, of course, uh, give us the opportunity inside UN that already did, but for us that we are uh, an NGO is a very uh, good starting point. Uh, we made at WFP, uh, as last year we made here at IFAD, uh, the conference of the uh, Model UN. We are running a project with 70 embassies and mission in Rome with schools. We bring diplomacy to the school, especially in the school in, that are not in the city center. So uh, sometimes they even don't know what is a diplomat. They look like a, an ambassador, like an alien coming. And so for us, it's a, a giving opportunity to open to new culture. Uh, to new possibility. And last but not least, uh, we made uh, this conference in Jakarta, uh, the first conference, and actually the second, but the first in presence uh, conference among Italy and ASEAN. Uh, for the first time, we had the opportunity to have all the students coming from ASEAN at the ASEAN Secretary. First time they have 16 years old students discussing about uh, the challenge. So why is it important? We always think that as adults, let's say, uh, young people are like white paper and we have to give them all the solution to drive them uh, to give all the, uh, let's say, uh, the, the master way to achieve the idea. But this one simply doesn't work. And we see it in reality. When we think about today of the uh, system of sharing music or sharing moving, actually starting from a disruptive ideas from young people they want to have music uh, for free or move for free and then they create a new way because this is the impact the effect of this uh, idea so what we have to do is simply open and give more opportunity to youth leader i was shocked uh, two weeks ago when this uh, youth uh, leader go to the podium and stay in silence i think all of us uh, must stay and reflect about this. This is another alarm that we cannot uh, all the time stay there and facing this youth uh, without doing nothing. It's time to stop us, to be brave, to put our side apart 
and give the students the possibility to express themselves without our, let's say, knowledge of adult. This is very important if we really want to have new ideas and give the opportunity to youth to uh, be the real leader. The Generation Z, Generation Z and Generation Alpha, the new generation, are the most aware about this, how to tackle uh, climate change, global change, also food security. They're more aware, <laughs> of course, than me, for sure. And so what we can do, we, can, uh, we need to open, to remove the barriers. And today is the innovation day, so I, I want to propose a little idea, but probably it already is. As UN, let's hire 16 years old directly at the UN from all around the world, creating a group of 200 students, 16 years old, coming and working at the UN and give it the opportunity to discuss about ideas, leave them for free, give them some mentors supporting this idea. This can be a little opportunity, a real opportunity to answer to that silence. And this uh, can be uh, a new way maybe to face uh, this challenge. So we have to be brave and we will be brave. And I wanna finish my little speech with this quote of Mother Teresa that she was uh, an amazing uh, woman, inspirational woman for me about the partnership. And she say, I can do things you cannot. And you can do things I cannot, but together we can do great things. So thank you so much. And thank you so much also to Gladys and all the staff of IFAT for your welcoming and for this partnership. Thank you so much. Thank you and, and very inspiring and very, very true. The youth uh, do have a capacity today to come up with solutions that we probably don't. And, and here's a little um, tidbit of information. In my previous function, uh, I, I set up and I was in the, for Colombia, Ecuador and Venezuela and working with MUN, with Model United Nations, creating a new model to bring youth, not only from urban areas, but from rural areas to work together on global challenges and real solutions. And through that, there was a capacity for them to build models that they believed answered this SDGs. And the younger the kids were in terms of participating, and I'm talking about six and seven year olds, the quicker they were at understanding and coming up with ideas, right? And we are, it is very humbling and it is actually very true. So it's definitely um, something that we need to all keep working on uh, together. As our next speaker, um, I'm sure you'll have some insights on this as well. We have Benjamin uh, Coates, who's the head of Sustainable Initiatives Office, the European Space Agency, working over the last uh, 15 plus years extensively with the African Earth Observation Community. Uh, you've been acting also as focal point for Africa at the Earth Observation Directorates of ESA. Um, tell us a little bit about that. The, the Earth Observation Directorate works a lot as well on partnerships for the adoption of Earth Observation information and operations. What would you say is the most relevant impact um, from this? type of work from the enhanced partnerships with EFAD um, that we're moving full speed ahead on? And how do you think it could contribute to scale up innovations? Thank you. I think that works. Technology always fails in the right moment. No, thanks for, for that question. And thanks for the invitation here to, um, to contribute to this discussion. Really, um, the impact of these kind of cooperations and partnerships is uh, something which I also picked up from the last session is creating collaborative ecosystems. Eh? And here we're talking about something where we bring uh, two organizations, but actually also two communities together, which are coming really from different planets. Eh? And I'm using this uh, analogy in, on purpose because um, space is one very technical um, community behind it, uh, and while the EFAT uh, environment is more about development cooperation and has a completely different type of approach and, and working um, with their community. And that type of synergy is something where the real innovation and the real impact can lie. That point, uh, make, I would like to make that point in a more concrete way. So space has fancy satellites flying around Earth, and they are most, most of the time golden, glittery, and, and all this, but they are providing data 
data streams which are in itself not necessarily very um, valuable, but if you come with the right question and with the right application, the right decision making process behind it, it becomes very essential information which you can use in different types of um, contexts. But I, I wanted to bring come back to your comment saying we can create new markets. You mentioned carbon credits, and that is something which is currently being used to to um, um, yeah to bring carbon sequestration for example in the soil as a is one way of of um, reducing the the impact of climate uh, well, climate emissions um, greenhouse gases but you want to bring that part in at scale so that one if you go from one field to a national scale or even continental scale you need to have a, a, a independent and transparent very way how to measure that and being credible to certify these credits and that is where space can come into place and I, that is in in concrete terms uh, we could uh, observe with our sentinel missions and i'll come back to them in a minute to bring make sure that we see for example um, um no tillage pr um, agriculture practices um, being put in place or not and that kind of thing is something which we could then help to to cert be certified for giving carbon credits new market new innovations new way which didn't exist in the in, in the first place um coming back to effort and ESA, i mean we have looking back to a long-term cooperation already um that started more about uh, 10 years ago and uh, that is all about taking an uptake of earth observation in this development cooperation um, context and uh, actually we also do that with world food program um, and with fao we have a, a partnership on that it's in more in, in concrete terms there is um, I see Olivier sitting in the in the back. Uh, we, we we worked with him on uh, um, monitoring of pastures in Kyrgyzstan to be sure that the livestock there have the sustainable, let's say, fodder and uh, context, and, and also in the in facing the climate uh, um, change um, context. But um, and we also started uh, ten years ago with irrigation planning in Madagascar and everything in in between. In more general terms, it's all about using transparent, independent information from space to inform policymaker, but also farmers in bringing uh, a sustainable um, information into 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 the um, decision making part, and uh, that is all built on the sentinels, which I mentioned before. These are um, satellites uh, um, flying around the Earth, basically uh, acquiring data in every five days a 10 meter resolution and most importantly they are open and free for everybody so it's an open global free good for everybody to bring that into the into the decision making part in itself as i said this is information we have also programs uh, supporting bringing that from research all the way to mainstreaming and there i would like to mention the global development assistance program which is a dedicated program to make this possible to mainstream earth observation into international finance and institutions we have clear uh, long-term partnership here with the world bank and the asian development bank and also working with effort for quite some time already but now with this letter of intent being signed um, that is also being formalized uh, in a more um, you know, official way and we're looking forward there to use the um, use the information in um yeah in the operational activities of EFERT, from design and, and planning of uh, in development cooperation activities up to um, the assessment of the impact of these type of activities. And with that, we, we're looking really forward to, to cooperate over the next actually decades, because that's a process we started 10 years ago and we will keep on going. Thank you. You really, you really managed to connect the dots, right, in terms of this 360 degree approach uh, in terms of innovation and linking that to the way that space has been playing a role, right? It's not necessarily always open. It's not always discussed. But the more we move forward and we've been, this is Innovation Day, we've been talking about how innovation is integrated, that really showcases how innovation and space are now giving us the capacity not only to harvest the you know to have a, an eye over our 
our planet to be able to use that information, come up with new solutions when it comes to global challenges, and then scale that up. Being able to use this technology that enables us to scale up solutions that do work, which then will maximize in, in some ways the capacity for us to not replicate, duplicate, but actually come together uh, across countries, across borders, because that's the beauty of it as well. Right. Uh, although we're not going to get into the debate on whether space has borders, but the idea is that it does create a, a unified opportunity to to move the needle on these these important challenges. So, so thank you so much um, for for sharing that with us. We're now going to move on um, to um, another very interesting uh, new new area that a lot of UN agencies and other agencies have been working on in terms of the capacity to accelerate innovation with a more specific focus on how do we use innovation in all of our work that we're doing across the humanitarian development nexus because you know there's a lot of work that's done across the continents um, in terms of the the collaboration with local populations with local knowledge with making sure that we build together resilience and we feed off of each other's knowledge. But innovation, there has never been really a lot of time to figure out how do we use new and innovative technology to support our work. And World Food Program has definitely taken a, a step forward in this with its uh, World Food Program or WFP Innovation Accelerator. And so it, it's really my pleasure um, to have you here Hilla uh, Cohen to tell us a little bit more about this um, and tell us about what you're working on specifically and, and how this is moving forward, the overall capacity for humanitarian delivery to, to get into um, the 21st century and overcome some of the key challenges that, that we're facing. The World Food Program Innovation Accelerator um, we are function based in Munich, um, yet we have a global reach uh, through our activities and through our network of hubs that we have opened uh, beyond Munich in locations such as Bogota, Nairobi, Amman, uh, Dar es Salaam, and hopefully soon also um, in Egypt. And um, when WP set up its innovation function in 2015, um, we really try to set up something that fits the culture and the DNA of the organization and addresses our daily operations. So that's why we decided to set up an accelerator that will uh, source, support, and scale innovations that address hunger. And we've expanded now our focus to address other SDGs, our sustainable development goals as well, and support other organizations in their innovation journeys. Um, I think one thing about I think is very important to mention is that um, it, it takes time to set up what is the um, innovation identity of an organization um, and you need to know exactly which or try to understand which are the focus problems uh, you want to address and um, for a UN ent entity I think it's a similar challenge like you would have for any large corporate as well you are set in your ways of doing certain things and that's okay because that's what you excel in the, and then you need to maybe go a bit out of your comfort zone and see what do we want to change or what where do we want to have the greatest impact on and this you cannot do on your own as innovation function. Um, it has to be in constant conversation with your organization, you will have early adopters um, that will uh, be interested to work with you so, and uh, then there will be the people who come maybe in the second and third wave to work with you and uh, and that's what we did gradually we expanded our work. By running innovation challenges where startups can apply and also internal teams, um, we uh, run innovation boot camps, we give funding and we've decided made a decision to give them ticket sizes of $100,000 at least. And we also uh, give them mentorship, give them pitch events, an opportunity to pitch their innovations. And also in 2019 we set up a scale up enablement function because we realized that innovating in the realities where we operate is quite complicated, so what are those elements that you need to enable scaling. Now we're talking here today about partnerships. So I wanna to touch on that as well. Partnerships to me comes in different ways. First of all, we sometimes assume that partnerships is only with large organizations. I think we need to think about partnerships with different size of organizations. So though we don't, our work with startups is not 
let's say under the partnership title classically, I think that type of collaboration is important as mentioned the involvement of youth, um, the tech industry. Um, I think it's just, it's a way for us to partner because they're bringing new ideas for our operations. Um, the second thing is, and, and we have a great example of a scaling innovation um, in uh, South America called Nihilus. I think IFAD funded them as well. So I think it's a good example um, to mention. Um, and what they do is that they use digital platforms to connect between, uh, let's say, excess of food in capitals to food deserts um, that don't have access to healthy foods. Now, Nihilus was a startup that was functioning very well without us. What we helped them was to reach a new market, and that was in Peru. The, Nyla solved a, a problem for WFP in Peru, and we um, um, worked together with our country office to expand their work. And um, now there's actually interest from uh, an American NGO to work with Nyla through a connection that we, we enabled. So I think it's very interesting how you can create connections between different actors, and that's part of partnerships. The second type of uh, partnership I want to mention is our partnership with IFAD. Um, I think we're really as a Rome based agency in Rome, there's three uh, big food uh, agencies um, and with IFAD, we're really seeing and it started during COVID and in a virtual reality. And we were really able uh, to this understand how to create a continuum between our work, where are the complementary elements where we might find startups and hopefully IFAD will fund them. Uh, you know, we're still working on this, but I hope this will, you know, bear more active fruit. The last uh, example I just want to mention quickly is um, a partnership with a large company, and we've done this with Google and it's linked to a space imagery. We have um, co-developed a, a platform called Sky SKAI. It's open source, so you can Google SKAI and WFP, and it's really using satellite imagery uh, to assess uh, before and after disasters. WFP has put this into action in a number of realis realities, most recently um, after the Turkey and uh, Syria um, uh, um, earthquakes. And what that has brought is quicker response by WFP by using satellite imagery to assess damage. And, and, and so I think there's different ways of partnerships. And I think part of innovation is exploring what are new ways of partnerships. I think it's a perfect sentence um, to start wrapping wrapping the session up, which is the importance of partnership to explore new opportunities and innovation. So before we, we close the session, uh, we uh, do have a few questions that are coming our way. We are going to have the time only for, for two questions. Let's first take one from um, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs online with us uh, right now. So please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for this initiative. Uh, actually, I have no questions, but I would like to share with you some elements on what we do with and for Asia, ASEAN, also through the pressure support of some actors from the civil society, like Global Action, which is today represented by Mr. Torisi. Innovation aimed at facing the major global challenges is also at the core of the development partnership between Italy and ASEAN. Launched in September 2020 as a key step of our progressive engagement in the Indo-Pacific. So far, we have achieved excellent results carrying out and working on a wide range of capacity building activities in favor of the ASEAN countries, ranging from security, climate change, space, energy, food security, agricultural mechanization, and promotion of people-to-people -people contacts with a particular attention to youth. In this framework, through the financial contribution of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Global Action organized the second edition, as mentioned before, of the Youth Conference on ASEAN and Italy, which took place last May in Jakarta. The event brought together 33 high school students from Italy and ASEAN countries who discussed the themes of the Italy-ASEAN Development Partnership with a focus on digitalization, environmental issues, and youth empowerment. We will continue on this path of promoting innovation, prosperity, and sustainable development in Southeast Asia and, uh, and with ASEAN, also taking into account the centrality 
of ASEAN in the Indo-Pacific, which is at the core of the geopolitical and economic challenges the world is facing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for those insights. Um, and, and it really also helps move that, that thinking and conversation forward. I think we have uh, a time for one question coming from Please go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. I'm Federica Baglioni. I'm a journalist of an European magazine, Mediterranea. I have a question. And uh, this is how do the partnerships that you are announcing today uh, contribute to reducing poverty and eliminating hunger? Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I think for as a Rome based agency, I think our continued uh, joint work at the Rome level here in Italy, but also at the field level is going to be critical um, to address uh, hunger and poverty in rural areas. Um, I, th this work already exists, but now that we're going to put more focus on innovation in this aspect, I think we will find new ways of doing things more agile and complementary. So I think it i think we're going to bring potentially and hopefully more opportunities for um startups that um are interested um in these topics that understand local realities and pro and and solve problems at that uh local level so i think it's it's an amplification of of intent that already exists with more focus We must have like electric magnetic. Uh... <laughs> no. Next one. Go ahead. So perhaps I just do it without yeah. a microphone. Just uh, one example um, is if you use if you use this uh, satellite data on a global scale, you can actually give transparency to the global markets of uh, of you know, trading uh, crop uh, or grains. Let's say staple staple food. Huh? And, and that is something which we do together with FAO. There's the GeoGlam G20 initiative to give that uh, information in a transparent way to all the different. Um, I mean, it's actually being used by Bloomberg and uh, and, uh, and others. That helps us in a very short way um, to reduce the the speculation of these uh, essential food, um, which is reducing the overall prices, which we have. Uh, at least partly seen during the U Ukraine crisis recently, but also in 2011, which we want to reduce in terms of not having high fr food prices, and that is being then translated on the on the ground to to people who want to actually buy their own yeah, their daily food. Eh? So that is um, reducing poverty and also increasing the food security. Uh, just simply towards, of course, for us, uh, the quality of education and the poverty and the food security are extremely connected. In some part of the world, uh, WFP, IFA, all the UN give the possibility to many students to have the only meal per day. And in that context, they also have the possibility to study. As global action, thanks also to Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs, all the partners, we're going to fight to give quality education, especially for those who want, cannot afford the education. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And as you hear in the end, the, the objective is to make sure that no one is left behind. It's something that we tend to hear a little bit as a cliche, but it is really uh, important in terms of how uh, all of this work combined supports to, to to make sure that we are all working with our different strengths and capacities uh, in this ambition. So I'd like to thank our speakers today uh, and the teams at EFAD, uh, World Food Program, Innovation Accelerator, the European Space Agency, and Global Action Italy, who've made today's event possible. And with this, uh, I'd like to close today's event and look forward to racking up uh, this day with closing remarks from Gladys. Gladys, thank you so much for all of the work that you've done uh, to make sure innovation is at the center of our efforts every day. Thank you so much, Helen. Could I please invite our speakers for the closing session to approach uh, the stage, please? Thank you, Helen, thank you.
Thank you, uh, Pierre Francesco, Ben, Joe had to leave us, but uh, thank you everybody for being here with us. Gila, uh, do not leave without saying goodbye to me. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so I would like to invite Christina Kiriko if you want to be close to stage. And then uh, Mr. Gochi Wu, Associate Vice President of the Corporate so uh, Services Department of IFAD. Yes, please. Okay, so uh, without uh, we we are running late and we are between between this uh, session and the and the reception. So and, and I know that uh, people want to go and um, meet some of the innovators that we have at the marketplace. It has been a fantastic day. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. That we had excellent conversations with our partners. Everyone that you saw here on stage today and that joined us also online is, co is contributing to IFAD's mandate and IFAD's mission in different ways uh, and innovating in very different ways. One evidence uh, from today and one th main takeaway is that innovation is happening everywhere. And we really need to make a lot of effort to ensure that we are managing that all that information, the evidence and the experiences that we are um, collecting from, from these initiatives and making sure that we are uh, replicating, that we are sharing and that we are learning. So without much further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Cristina Chirico. Cristina is the head of international office of CIA Agricoltore Italiani, and she's going to be sharing with us how technology and innovation should be sustainable, accessible and affordable um, to smallholders. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. First of all, thank you for the invitation of uh, the Italian Farmers Organization, CIA Agriculture Italiani, that uh, today I represent. And uh, we are now concluding this, uh, this day, and I would like to congratulate to you and to all your staff and IFAD for the brilliant result of this Innovation Day. I found uh, many inspiration, many best practices that you share with us, but also concrete projects towards uh, a real strategic partnership in order to maximize the public and private effort for innovation and investment for rural areas, for farmers in the rural areas. So thank you uh, to putting farmers at the center at this, in this moment. So we represent uh, today the the needs of the people in the rural areas, but also I can say in Italy, this small country, but so important, important for the presence of different agricultures. I can say today also for our awareness of the importance of a new food diplomacy. Now we are approaching a very important event at the end of July, as all of you know, the UN Food System Summit 2 stock taking moment, so dif difficult to say, it will be for us, for all of us, uh, an important strategic moment to discuss about the future of the food systems. I would, would like to put together the aspect of innovation to the future of the food systems because we are linked in the same way how to find new solution to feed people in a sustainable way. Also in Italy, we are suffering the effects, for example, of the climate change. As you know, recently, all of you uh, knew about the effect of the recent floods, for example, in, in Emilia-Romagna region. It is our food district, the center of, of the food district in Italy, and now we have many problems for farmers to continue the activity of produ production, of uh, transformation of production. But before we had many problems, for example, for drought. And I can say to you that we need technology, we need innovation in order to give future for the family farmers, for the people that live uh, in the rural areas. So we are linked to the need of share information, share knowledge to people. 
as Itali Italian Farmers Confederation, we know that uh, we need a new approach towards innovation. We say every day, because we work to this aspect, that before the technology, there is the knowledge sharing. We had to include directly the farmers, directly the people that live in the rural areas in the possibility to know how to change the method of production, how to change the possibility to, to have products from, from the field. Our key message today are the following. The first is the relevance of training. Also in the rural areas, we work as the Italian Farmers Confederation to share not only the latest technology available, but moreover, the, 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 the knowledge sharing for, uh, for people, but also the economic sustainability of innovation. I would like to say to you today that the importance of uh, the affordability, the access to innovation is also important to, to know and to consider also to create a new project for, uh, for people in the rural areas. At the end, uh, we would like to say that in all our aspects of work, we put youth at the center. We say that we have to create knowledge ecosystems and we, uh, in Italy, we had the best practice in it to link the farmer organization, the public council for research in agriculture, and the possibility for the young farmers to create a future by more knowledge. Thank you very much. Christina, thank you so much. Um, when we met, you were also talking about uh, innovation and technology and how it was about affordability, about uh, making sure that there was adoption and use, um, but also making sure that technology is fit for purpose. So um, I really appreciate the, those insights. Joining us online, we have Ismahan Eluafi, she's the chief scientist at FAO. This is a position that was created by the new director general of uh, FAO. Ismahan, are you already with us? And yes, I have to say, Ismahan, thank you so much for being with us. I know it's a, it's a holiday for you and uh, you're joining us because this is uh, a theme that is very much close to your heart, the same as uh, Joe coming all the way from the hospital just to be with us in person today. Um, Ismahan, how does FAO's innovation strategy come into action to support ideas and uh, uh, scale up innovation? Thank you very much, Gladys, and really a pleasure to be with you. As you said, it's a uh, for me, but really uh, innovation is very close to my heart and it's at the heart of the science and innovation strategy. But let me first congratulate you, congratulate IFAD and partners for really successfully bringing this innovation day together. I'm um, really a pleasure to see RBAs coming around an agenda of innovation so that we get our agri-food system to become more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable. So you mentioned the science and innovation strategy, which is really a, a strategy to support our strategic framework that covers 10 years, 2022 to 31. And within that strategic framework, really the, the vision of leaving no one behind is very central to it. And we are doing it through really using science and innovation and technology towards a better production, better nutrition, better environments, and a better life for all of us. And that's where really the science, technology, and innovation, it's central for us as it is central for the Sustainable Development Global Agenda 2030 and to the UN system reform agenda. And I have to say, I was in New York a few months ago at the STS the Science Technology System Forum in New York, and you see it buzzing really with a lot of talks around science and innovation. So we are committed to harnessing the power of innovation to address the complex and interconnected challenges that are facing rural communities, especially small-scale producers, indigenous people, women, youth, and other underrepresented actors of the agri-food system. However, precisely because of the complexity of all these challenges, transformative partnership and coalition of development partners are key to accelerate impact to the scale needed to have impact. 
So while innovation is indeed very important, I would like to underscore that it's not limited only to technological innovation, like digital innovations, but really it has to cover institutional innovation, social innovation, financial innovation, business model innovation, if we are ready to achieve SDGs. For example, we have seen several practices from institutions in Ethiopia through the ATA, the Agricultural Transformation Agency, through Morocco, through the Green Plan, through Republic of Korea, and many others that really make the whole difference. Sometimes we undermine the governance and the institution, and they are crucial if we want to make things happen in a different way. Unfortunately, one of the biggest challenges to realize our vision is that data and assessment on science, technology, innovation are currently scattered, incomplete, and unintegrated. This is why during last year Science and Innovation Forum, our DG launched a new knowledge product that we call Athio, in the Agri-Food System Technologies and Innovation Outlook. And the objective of Athio is to create existing information on the current measurable state of STI and upcoming challenges or changes, sorry, upcoming changes, as well as their transformative potential to inform evidence-based policy dialogue and decision including investment, regulation, policies. The idea is really that ATIO will gather data and analyze it across distant stage of science, technology, and innovation, and will help both government to put the right investment for it, to attract the private sector, and to really put behind it the right regulation and policies to make it happen. And here, there are a number of initiatives that we have we have pushed forward, for example, on water management, which is, I think, one of the crucial areas that luckily the all UN system is interested in now, and it's going to be part of the COP28 as well. So what we put in place with Academia 2063, that is out of Rwanda, it's really pushing for a, a, a whole system to have the right small-scale irrigation system in Niger and Burkina. And the idea is that it's not only the technology that is needed, it's everything underlying it. It's again, the regulation, the policies, the SMEs, the connections, the maintenance, and so on and so forth. Another example in biotechnology in Papua, Papua, Papua New Guinea, we have the National Agricultural Research Institute of the country through the Benefit Sharing Fund project of the International Treaty of Plant Genetic Resources for that is supporting the introduction of new, new sweet potato varieties and innovative methods for planting, breeding, and conserving sweet potato, which is very critical for that highlands, in collaboration, of course, with the CG system, the SIP. In fisheries, for example, in collaboration with the World Bank, FAO has assisted the government of Peru in promoting the national program for innovation in fisheries and aquaculture. So when we talk here in all of these examples, we're going beyond the technological innovation to look to the other innovation, particularly institutional and policy as well and finance. Um, another example that we have really to, to, to make sure we, we cover, it's in involving young people. We have the idea Town model that is organized by FAO and UNDP in Grenada that aims to develop young agro entrepreneur on the island and get them excited about science and innovation. So Gladys, I think to sum it up, it's really nice to see IFAD, WFP and FAO coming together and sharing really their, their experience and looking for synergies to work together. So I applaud IFAD for putting the Innovation Day together. It's a great opportunity to showcase the progress, the opportunities and much more get people excited about it. I think we need really to come together, look at our interconnectedness and look at our synergies. And also there is no harm in having a little bit of duplication here and there, as far as we are all aware of it and that we are all working towards complementing each other. So it's really nice, I applaud you for that. We have heard today inspiring speakers and experts. I assisted to the last one, it was really nice to see some new ideas that's coming out of the box. And I think really as a chief scientist of FAO, that's what I am after. I'm after those ideas that comes out of the box 
those ideas that can make a huge impact in a very short time. And within that, I want to really close by saying that we stand ready to, to really support innovation in all agri-food systems. And we invite you, all of you, to join us in October to the Science and Innovation Forum 2023 that has the team Science and Innovation for Climate Action. So thank you very much for your attention and nice to be with you today. Thank you so much, Ismahan. Um, two points that I would like to highlight from, from your intervention, the importance of supporting innovation all throughout the value chain. Uh, and we already know from all the interventions that we heard today that one agency alone cannot do it. So the collaboration and the partnerships uh, among our agencies is fundamental so that we can achieve the not only the sustainable development goals, but beyond the sustainable development goals. Um, yes, the partnerships between FAO, the World Food Program, and IFAD are very, very important. But we also have another key partner, also based in Rome. And I have the honor to introduce to you Juan Lucas Restrepo, Global Director, Partnerships and Advocacy of the CGAR and Director General of the Alliance of Biodiversity International and SEAT. Your title is so long, Juan, Juan Lucas, that every time. <laughs> so what... I'm trying to, to remember it. <laughs> okay, Juan Lucas, over to you. Uh, thank you, Gladys. Uh, great, great to be here. Uh, and, I work, and before going into CG and how we can connect uh, ourselves into this important innovation space. I want to really congratulate and and, uh, and express you know how it, it impressing it is to see how this innovation day is bringing together uh, and bridging uh, these great ideas and efforts from entrepreneurs so just uh, listening uh, to these uh, new uh, communities uh, proposing ways to tackle uh, societal challenges is, is great uh, and we saw the uh, Avanzar Toolkit and the DG Climate Risk and Land Monitor Geoscanda. It's very impressive to see this in, in one space. It's also great to see how IFAD is evolving and it's tackling more systematically innovation. So it's not only something on the sideline because it sounds great, etc., but really mainstreaming it across its uh, practice. So when you just mentioned a collective action, it's collective action for real and ensuring that one organization with one mandate can only do so much, but by combining that with willing and ready uh, governments and other rome based agencies and uh, other accelerators and ourselves, of course, uh, you can do uh, a lot, a lot more. So that's, that's great. Uh, let me turn quickly. To, to CGIR, as, as you know, we've been there for a long time. It's a, a 12, a, or it should be 15, really. Let's hope it's, we're back to 15 soon. A, international research organizations that have been very successful through the Green Revolution and have, have really helped to, bring, uh, to bridge the food security challenges uh, from a few decades ago, but that, that are now tackling a new reality and, 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 I, and through our integration, I think we're doing a very nice job, better every day in tackling a food systems transformation in a climate a crisis, which is basically our mission at the moment. And in terms of principles, we also understand that we've been a bit away and disconnected from innovation ecosystems and, and maybe in terms of the culture, the hierarchies in the way we have uh, addressed our partnerships, uh, we've not been up to standard or at least up to what is needed uh, today. So we have a very nice uh, mandate in an engagement framework that says we are here to work with, for, and through partners. And that means a big cultural challenge uh, uh, also uh, in leveling uh, power imbalances that are not only north, south, but uh, sometimes, uh, you know, very important scientists that look down uh, into local partners in national institutes in key countries when everything should be done in a balanced manner and also acknowledging this south, south, a uh, very powerful uh, collaboration. 
And in our learning, we've, we've or, of course, and it's not a surprise, we've seen that uh, innovation ecosystems are, are clearly, we need to learn how to better embed ourselves in especially territorial innovation uh, ecosystems so we can uh, understand how our knowledge, how our technologies, how our, our capacities are uh, uh, work better to connect uh, to all to communities, to women, to youth, etc. So our knowledge can be upscaled, and our science uh, cannot be not only land through innovation, but also through the connections uh, of the of science uh, to to policy. One quick example, because I I have a, a minute, is how we have a, a some CGI efforts around uh, accelerators. We have an accelerate for impact platform where, uh, as an example, we are now uh, supporting an agri-tech for Uzbekistan uh, a call, an innovation challenge that is really following a country uh, a priorities uh, and see how we unlock solutions uh, that include digital agriculture, precision fa uh, farming, capacity building, water management, irrigation, and, and, uh, and really uh, empower innovators through training, tech assistance, financial support, uh, also boot camp uh, support, uh, blended learning. So, so it's a it's a living lab, uh, really uh, helping us bridge uh, this knowledge to use uh, and, and, and last mile uh, innovation. Uh, just to to finalize, uh, we have tools, and we're super proud. And I cannot live without saying this: we were awarded the Food Planet Prize. Uh, a month ago uh, for the agrobiodiversity index and that gives us additional resources to mainstream those indicators so food systems account for better use and mainstreaming of diversity genetic diversity in agriculture as a way to solve problems and of course we only do this or can do this if we connect those indicators with impact funds asset managers and also entrepreneurs. So we are absolutely ready and open for business. So we are around and uh, congratulations again for an amazing innovation day. Thank you, Juan Lucas. You would have noticed that we closed the day with representatives from agencies that are focusing, including IFAT, um, now we will hear uh, soon in the closing remarks, but focusing on evidence-based decision-making, on science, on partnerships, on building a systematic approach to innovation, and by systematic we mean fit for purpose and building agility, but also making sure that those innovations are delivering impact for poor rural people. Uh, I'm now going to introduce our um, if as Associate Vice President of the Corporate, uh, Corporate Services Department, Mr. Guo Chibu, he has the challenging task to summarize the day's proceedings uh, today. So, Mr. Wu, could I invite you to the lectern to, the, to deliver your closing remarks? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, ladies. Uh... Excellencies, distinguished guests, and dear friends, as we are coming to the end of the 2023 Effort Innovation Day, it is my great pleasure to represent Effort Senior Management to thank everyone who has helped make this event another great success. We would like to thank the governments of Colombia, Finland, France, Germany, and Norway the Fund for uh, Innovation in Development, Aliplo uh, Factory, the Asian Development Bank, our fellow RBA, the uh, FAO, and WFP, uh, particularly its uh, Innovation Accelerator, the European Space Agency, Global Action, our media partner, AD and Kronos, and last but not least, our speakers, our audience, and the IFA teams. Well done, colleagues. Warm congratulations to all of you.
Colleagues, as the UN Secretary General reminded us recently at this year's UN Behavioral Science Week, our institutions must evolve to remain effective. And he has encouraged UN entities to adopt innovative solutions to meet the challenges of a complex and dynamic world. EFED is proud to support the Secretary General's UN 2.0 Quintet of Change, which highlights the role of innovation, data, strategic foresight, behavioral science, and results. Innovation and EFED has a clear focus, which is addressing the needs and challenges of the rural poor that we serve. And in doing so, we value and incorporate learnings from smallholders and from indigenous peoples. This helps us develop tailor-made solutions that fit into the rural context and also inform our investments. Today, you have heard about some of the innovative approaches EFERD has adopted from the behavioral science to the adoption of frontier technologies such as artificial intelligence and geospatial information system to improve our analytical capacity and ability to enhance targeting, monitoring, and evaluation. But this is just the beginning. EFERD is committed to transform rural communities for the better. And this goes beyond developing technologies in the field. Also includes novel ways to reach the rural poor living in the remote areas. This morning, EFERD President Lario put forward his vision for innovation in this institution. And he stressed the importance of creating a safe and inclusive space to test ideas and to collect learnings and evidence that inform investment decisions to scale up innovations, which can deliver positive transformative results in the lives of the vulnerable rural poor and the small scale producers. Our speakers today ask how we can translate this vision into action? How can we scale up innovation so that it contributes to sustainable, equitable, and inclusive rural and agricultural development? I was extremely pleased to learn from Her Excellency, the Norwegian Minister for International Development, about the support of the Kingdom of Norway to EFA's mission by increasing their financial contributions. Not only during the previous EFERT 12 replenishment, but also during the ongoing EFERT 13 replenishment. And to hear her call for other member states to be ambitious in supporting our common goal, which is establishing a sustainable food system that leaves no one hungry. The need for innovative ways to mobilize resources was at the forefront of today's discussion. During the panel with FAO, WFP, Asian Development Bank, EFERD, and other partners, we looked at how different financing mechanisms are designed to be fit for purpose and address the needs and context of our project participants and partners. We also heard from the French Fund for Innovation in Development about how they are funding research-based and experimental solutions to deliver evidence and lessons and contribute to better decision-making and results on the ground. The second big topic today was the importance of leveraging partnership with both the private and public sectors and also the civil society. We learned from Colombia, Finland, Germany, Norway, and other speakers that they are supporting and scaling up the innovation. We also learned about three different approaches to manage innovation from Caliplo factory. We also looked at how to leverage data 
to achieve better development results for indigenous people. Please allow me to highlight three key messages that came out of the panel discussion and the event today. First, innovation is more than creating groundbreaking technologies. A lot of speakers have alluded to that. It is also about fostering an environment, a culture that encourages creative thinking, collaboration, and the freedom to experiment. Second, risk-taking is becoming an integral part of IFA's DNA. We aim to create safe space, such as the IFA Innovation Challenge, that incentivizes our colleagues, both in HQ and also in the field, to learn to explore and develop ideas freely. Not every idea will succeed. We all know that. But we can learn from setbacks and failures because they plant the seed for the future success. Finally, we believe in the power of partnerships. If we count on the stakeholders from the public and private sectors to help us generate innovative ideas, of course, together with the academia and the, uh, the, 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 the CSOs. We continue to develop collaboration and co-financing opportunities to scale up solutions so that we can maximize impact on the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, innovation by definition is a moving target. I'm deeply impressed by the discussions we have had today, and I hope they have also inspired you as well. Innovation is a driving force that can help all of us achieve greater impact in our mission. Thank you very much again for joining us today. And now that we are wrapping up the formal part of the Innovation Day, please join us for the reception in the foyer. Thank you. So that concludes the, um, all the sessions of the IFAT Innovation Day. Before we close uh, uh, completely the event, could we uh, show the thank you slide? I just want to make sure that we're thanking everybody that has contributed to today's event. To you, the audience here joining us at um, IFAD in person, to everybody that has joined us online, to all of our speakers, everybody that contributed, the IFAD teams, uh, we have had amazing, amazing support from our ICT team. Uh, you guys have been amazing waking up super, super early every every day and making sure that we deliver the, the best for IFAD. The, uh, the communications team, everybody that has contributed also in the strategy and knowledge department. Um, I won't mention everyone, but here you have the people that have contributed to the success of today's event. Thank you and see you at the innovation talks uh, already next week uh, with Google. Bye-bye.